Chapter Thirty of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. February and March were peaceful months on the surface. Washington was taking stock quietly of national resources and watching for Germany's next move. The winter impasse in Europe gave way to the first fighting of spring, raids and sorties mostly, since the ground was still too heavy for the advancement of artillery. On the high scenes the reign of terror was in full swing, and little tragic echoes of the world drama began again to come by cable across the Atlantic. Some of Graham's friends, like poor Chris, found the end of the path of glory. The tall young Canadian Highlander died before Peronne in March. Dennis Nolan's nephew was killed in the Irish Fusiliers. One day Clayton came home to find a white-faced Buckham taking his overcoat in the hall, and to learn that he had lost a young brother. Clayton was uncomfortable at dinner that night. He wondered what Buckham thought of them, sitting there around the opulent table in that luxurious room. Did he resent it? After dinner he asked him if he cared to take a few days off, but the old butler shook his head. "'I'm glad to have my work to keep me busy, sir,' he said. "'And anyhow, in England, it's considered best to go on, quite as though nothing had happened. It's better for the troops, sir.' There was a new softness and tolerance in Clayton that early spring. He had mellowed somehow, a mellowing that had nothing to do with his new prosperity. In past times he had wondered how he would stand financial success, if it ever came. He had felt fairly sure he could stand the other thing. But success? Now he found out that it only increased his sense of responsibility. He was, outside of the war situation, as nearly happy as he had been in years. Natalie's petulant moods, when they came, no longer annoyed him. He was supported, had he only known it, by the strong inner life he was living, a life that centered around his weekly meetings with Audrey. Audrey gave him courage to go on. He left their comradely hours together better and stronger. All the week centered about that one hour, out of seven days, when he stood on her hearth-rug, or lay back in a deep chair, listening or talking, such talk as Natalie might have heard without resentment. Sometimes he felt that that one hour was all he wanted. It carried so far, helped so greatly. He was so boyishly content in it and then she would make a gesture, or there would be, for a second, a deeper note in her voice, and the mad instinct to catch her to him was almost overwhelming. Sometimes he wondered if she were not very lonely, not knowing that she, too, lived for days on that one hour. She was not going out because of Chris's death, and he knew there were long hours when she sat alone, struggling determinedly with the socks she was knitting. Only once did they tread on dangerous ground, and that was on her birthday. He stopped in a jeweler's on his way uptown, and brought her a black pearl on a thin, almost invisible chain, only to have her refuse to take it. "'I can't, Clay.' "'Why not?' "'It's too valuable. I can't take valuable presents from men.' "'Its value hasn't anything to do with it.' "'I'm not wearing jewellery, anyhow.' Audrey, he said gravely, it isn't the pearl, it isn't the value. That's absurd. Don't you understand that I would like to think that you have something I have given you? When she sat still, thinking over what he had said, he slipped the chain around her neck and clasped it. Then he stooped down, very gravely, and kissed her. For my silent partner, he said. In all those weeks, that was the only time he had kissed her. He knew quite well the edge of the gulf they stood on, and he was determined not to put the burden of denial on her. He felt a real contempt for men who left the strength of refusal to a woman, who pleaded, knowing that the woman's strength would save them from themselves, and that if she weakened, the responsibility was hers. So he fed on the husks of love, and was, if not happy, happier. Graham, too, was getting on better. For one thing, Anna Klein had been ill. She lay in her boarding-house, frightened at every step on the stairs, and slowly recovered from a low fever. Graham had not seen her, but he sent her money for a doctor, for medicines, for her room-rent, 
enclosed in brief letters, purely friendly and interested. But she kept them under her pillow, and devoured them with feverish eyes. But something had gone out of life for Graham. Not Anna. Natalie, watching him closely, wondered what it was. He had been strange and distant with her ever since that tall boy in kilts had been here. He was studiously polite and attentive to her, rose when she entered a room, and remained standing unless she was seated, brought her the book she had forgotten, lighted her occasional cigarette, kissed her morning and evening. But he no longer came into her dressing-room for that hour before dinner, when Natalie, in dressing-gown and slippers, had closed the door to Clayton's room and had kept him for herself. She was jealous of Clayton those days. Sometimes she found the boy's eyes fixed on his father, with admiration and something more. She was jealous of the things they had in common, of the days at the mill, of the bits of discussion after dinner, when Clayton sat back with his cigar, and Graham voiced, as new discoveries, things about the work that Clayton had realized for years. He always listened gravely, with no hint of patronage. But Natalie would break in now and then, impatient of a conversation that excluded her. "'Your father knows all these things, Graham,' she said once. "'You talk as though you'd just discovered the mill, like Columbus discovering America.' "'Not at all,' Clayton said hastily. "'He has a new viewpoint. I am greatly interested. Go on, Graham.' But the boy's enthusiasm had died. He grew self-conscious, apologetic, and Clayton felt a resentment that was close to despair. The second of April fell on a Saturday. Congress, having ended the session the fourth of March, had been hastily reconvened, and on the evening of that day, Saturday, at half-past eight, the President went before the two houses in joint session. Much to Clayton's disgust, he found on returning home that they were dining out. "'Only at the Mackenzies. It's not a party,' Natalie said. As usual, she was before the dressing-table, and she spoke to his reflection in the mirror. "'I should think you could do that without looking like a thundercloud. Goodness knows we've been quiet enough this Lent.' "'You know Congress has been reconvened?' "'I don't know why that should interfere.' "'It's rather a serious time.' He tried very hard to speak pleasantly. Her engrossment in her own reflection irritated him, so he did not look at her. But of course I'll go. Every time is a serious time with you lately, she flung after him. Her tone was not disagreeable. She was merely restating an old grievance. A few moments later he heard her calling through the open door. I got some wonderful old rugs today, Clay. Yes? You'll scream when you pay for them. I've lost my voice screaming, my dear. You'll love these. They have the softest colors dead rose and faded blue, and old copper tones. I'm very glad you're pleased. She was in high good humor when they started. Clayton, trying to meet her conversational demands, found himself wondering if the significance of what was to happen in Washington that night had struck home to her. If it had, and she could still be cheerful, then it was because she had forced a promise from Graham. He made his decision then to force her to release the boy from any promise, to allow him his own choice. But he felt with increasing anxiety that some of Natalie's weakness of character had descended to Graham, that in him, as in Natalie, perhaps obstinacy was what he hoped was strength. He wondered, listening to her, what it would be to have beside him that night some strong and quiet woman, to whom he could carry his problems, his perplexities, someone to sit hand in his, and set him right as such a woman could on many things. And for a moment he pictured Audrey. Audrey, his wife, driving with him in their car, to whatever the evening might hold, and after it was all over, going back with her, away from all the chatter that meant so little, to the home that shut them in together. He was very gentle to Natalie that night. Natalie had been right. It was a small and informal group, gathered together hastily to discuss the emergency. Only Dennis Nolan, the Mackenzies, Clayton and Natalie, and Audrey. "'We brought her out of her shell,' said Terry genially, 
because the country is going to make history tonight. The sort of history Audrey has been shouting for for months. The little party was very grave. Yet of them all, only the Spencers would be directly affected. The Mackenzies had no children. Button, my secretary, Terry announced, is in Washington. He is to call me here when the message is finished. Is it possible, said Natalie, recalling a headline from the evening paper, that the house may cause an indefinite delay? And, as usual, Clayton wondered at the adroitness with which, in the talk that followed, she escaped detection. They sat long at the table, rather as though they clung together, and Nolan insisted on figuring the cost of the war in money. "'Queer thing,' he said. "'In ancient times the cost of war felt almost entirely on the poor. But it's the rich who will pay for this war. All taxation is directed primarily against the rich.' "'The poor pay in blood,' said Audrey rather sharply. "'They give their lives, and that is all they have.' "'Rich and poor are going to do that now,' old Terry broke in. "'Fight against it all you like, you members of the privileged class. The draft is coming. This is every man's war.' But Clayton Spencer was watching Natalie. She had paled and was fingering her liqueur glass absently. Behind her lowered eyelids he surmised that again she was planning. But what? Then it came to him, like a flash. Old Terry had said the draft would exempt married men. She meant to marry Graham to a girl she detested, to save him from danger. Through it all, however, and in spite of his anger and apprehension, he was sorry for her. Sorry for her craven spirit. Sorry even with an understanding that came from his own fears. Sorry for her that she had remained an essential child in a time that would tax the utmost maturity. She was a child. Even her selfishness was the selfishness of a spoiled child. She craved things, and the spirit, the essence of life, escaped her. And beside him was Audrey, valiant-eyed, courageous, honest. Natalie and Audrey. Sometime during the evening his thoughts took this form, that there were two sorts of people in the world, those who seized their own happiness at any cost, and those who saw the promised land from a far hill, and having seen it, turned back. End of chapter 30「Chapter 31 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Graham was waiting in Clayton's dressing-room when he went upstairs. Through the closed door they could hear Natalie's sleepy and rather fretful orders to her maid. Graham rose when he entered, and threw away his cigarette. "'I guess it has come, father.' "'It looks like it.' A great wave of tenderness for the boy flooded over him. That tall, straight body, cast in his own mould, but young, only ready to live, that was to be cast into the crucible of war, to come out, God alone knew how and not his boy only, but millions of other boys. Yet better to break the body than ruin the soul. How is mother taking it? Natalie's voice came through the door. She was insisting that the house be kept quiet the next morning. She wanted to sleep late. Clayton caught the boy's eyes on him, and a half-smile on his face. Does she know? Yes. She isn't taking it very hard, is she? Then his voice changed. I wish you'd talk to her, father. She's, well, she's got me. You see, I promised her not to go in without her consent. When did you do that? The night we broke with Germany in February. I was a fool, but she was crying, and I didn't know what else to do. And, there was a ring of desperation in his voice, she's holding me to it. I've been to her over and over again. And you want to go? Want to go? I've got to go. He broke out then in a wild appeal. He wanted to get away. He was making a mess of all sorts of things. He wasn't any good. He would try to make good in the army. Maybe it was only the adventure he wanted. He didn't know. He hadn't got into that. He hated the Germans. He wanted one chance at them anyhow. They were beasts. Clayton, listening, was amazed at the depth of feeling and anger in his voice. I'll talk to your mother, he agreed, when the boy's passion had spent itself. 
I think she will release you. But he was less certain than he pretended to be. He remembered Natalie's drooping eyelids that night at dinner. She might absolve him from the promise, but there were other ways of holding him back than promises. Perhaps we would better go into the situation thoroughly, he suggested. I have rather understood lately that you... What about Marion Hayden, Graham? I'm engaged to her. There was rather a long pause. Clayton's face was expressionless. Since when? Last fall, sir. Does your mother know? I told her, yes. He looked up quickly. I didn't tell you. I knew you disliked her, and mother said... He checked himself. Marion wanted to wait. She wanted to be welcome when she came into the family. I don't so much dislike her as I disapprove of her. That's rather worse, isn't it? Clayton was tired. His very spirit was tired. He sat down again in his big chair by the fire. She is older than you are, you know. I don't see what that has to do with it, father. In Clayton's defense was his own situation. He did not want the boy to repeat his mistakes, to marry the wrong woman, and then find, too late, the right one. During the impassioned appeal that followed, he was doggedly determined to prevent that. Perhaps he lost the urgency in the boy's voice. Perhaps in his new conviction that the passions of the forties were the only real ones, he took too little count of the urge of youth. He roused himself. You think you are really in love with her? I want her, I know that. That's different. That's, you are too young to know what you want. I ought to be married. It would settle me. I'm sick of batting around. You want to marry before you enter the army? Yes. Do you think for a moment that your wife will be willing to let you go? Graham straightened himself. She would have to let me go. And in sheer despair, Clayton played his last card. Played it and regretted it bitterly a moment later. We must get this straight, Graham. It's not a question of your entering the army or not doing it. It's a question of your happiness. Marriage is a matter of a lifetime. It's got to be based on something more than— He hesitated. And your mother? Please go on. You have just said that your mother does not want you to go into the army. Has it occurred to you that she would even see you married to a girl she detests to keep you at home? Graham's face hardened. So, he said heavily, Marion wants me for the money she thinks I'm going to have, and Mother wants me to marry to keep me safe. By God, it's a dirty world, isn't it? Suddenly he was gone, and Clayton, following uneasily to the doorway, heard a slam below. When, some hours later, Graham had not come back, he fell into the heavy sleep that follows anxiety and brings no rest. In the morning he found that Graham had gone back to the garage and taken his car, and that he had not returned. Afterward Clayton was to look back and to remember with surprise how completely the war crisis had found him absorbed in his own small group. But perhaps in the back of every man's mind war was always, first of all, a thing of his own human contacts. It was only when those were cleared up that he saw the bigger problem. The smaller questions loomed so close as to obscure the larger vision. He went out into the country the next day, a cold Sunday, going afoot, his head down against the wind, and he walked for miles. He looked haggard and tired when he came back, but his quiet face held a new resolve. War had come at last. He would put behind him the selfish craving for happiness, forget himself. He would not make money out of the nation's necessity. He would put Audrey out of his mind, if not out of his heart. He would try to rebuild his house of life along new and better lines. Perhaps he could bring Natalie to see things as he saw them, as they were, not as she wanted them to be. Sometimes it took great crises to bring out women. Childbearing did it often. Urgent need did it too. But after all, the real test was war. The big woman met it squarely, took her part of the burden. The small woman weakened, went down under it, found it a grievance rather than a grief. He did not notice Graham's car when it passed him, outside the city limits, or see Anna Klein's startled eyes as it flashed by. 
Graham did not come in until evening. At ten o'clock Clayton found the second man carrying upstairs a tray containing whiskey and soda, and before he slept he heard a tap at Graham's door across the hall, and surmised that he had rung for another. Later still he heard Natalie cross the hall, and rather loud and angry voices. He considered ironically that a day which had found a part of the nation on its knees found in his own house only dissension and bitterness. In the morning, at the office, Joey announced a soldier to see him, and added with his customary nonchalance, "'We'll be having a lot of them around now, I expect.' Clayton, glancing up from the visitor's slip in his hand, surprised something wistful in the boy's eyes. "'Want to go, do you?' "'Give my neck to go, sir.' He always added the sir when he remembered it, with the air of throwing a sop to a convention he despised. "'You may yet, you know. This thing is going to last a while. Send him in, Joey.' He had grown attached to this lad of the streets. He found in his loyalty a thing he could not buy. Jackson was his caller. Clayton, who had been rather more familiar with his back in its grey livery than with any other aspect of him, found him strange and impressive in khaki. "'I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner, Mr. Spencer,' he explained. "'I've been down on the border, Yuma. I just got a short leave and came back to see my family.' He stood very erect, a bronzed and military figure. Suddenly it seemed strange to Clayton Spencer that this man before him had only a few months before opened his automobile door for him and stood waiting with a rug to spread over his knees. He got up and shook hands. You look a different man, Jackson. Well, at least I feel like a man. Sit down, he said. And again it occurred to him that never before had he asked Jackson to sit down in his presence. It was wrong, somehow. The whole class system was absurd. Maybe war would change that, too. It was doing many queer things already. He had sent for Jackson, but he did not at once approach the reason. He sat back while Jackson talked of the border and Joey slipped in and pretended to sharpen lead pencils. Clayton's eyes wandered to the window. Outside in the yard were other men, now employees of his, who would soon be in khaki. Out of every group there, in a short time some would be gone, and of those who would go, a certain number would never come back. That was what war was. One day a group of men, laboring with their hands or their brains, that some little home might live, that they might go back at evening to that home and there rest for the next day's toil. And the next? Gone. Every man out there in the yard was loved by someone. To a certain number of them this day meant death or wounding. It meant separation and suffering and struggle. And all over the country there were such groups. The roar of the plant came in through the open window. A freight car was being loaded with finished shells. As fast as it was filled, another car was shunted along the spur to take its place. Over in Germany, in hundreds of similar plants, similar shells were being hurried to the battle line to be hurled against the new army that was soon to cross the seas. All those men, and back of every man, a woman. Jackson had stopped. Joey was regarding him with stealthy admiration, and holding his breastbone very high. Already in his mind, Joey was a soldier. "'You did not say in your note why you wanted to see me, Mr. Spencer.' He roused himself with a visible effort. "'I sent for you, yes,' he said. "'I sent—' "'I'll tell you why I sent for you, Jackson. I've been meaning to do it for several weeks. Now that this has come, I'm more than glad I did so. You can't keep your family on what you are getting, that's certain.' "'My wife is going to help me, sir. The boy will soon be weaned. Then she intends to get a position. She was a milliner when we were married. But great Scott, she ought not to leave a child as young as that. Jackson smiled. She's going to fix that all right. She wants to do it. And we're all right so far. I had saved a little. Then there were women like that. Women who would not only let their men go to war, but who would leave their homes and enter the struggle for bread to help them do it. She says it's the right thing, volunteered Jackson proudly. Women who felt that a man going into the service was a right thing. Women who saw war as a duty to be done, 
not as a wild adventure for the adventurous. "'You ought to be very proud of her,' he said slowly. "'There are not many like that.' "'Well,' Jackson said apologetically, "'they'll come round, sir. Some of them kind of hate the idea just at first. But I look to see a good many doing what my wife's doing.' Clayton wondered grimly what Jackson would think, if he knew that at that moment he was passionately envious of him, of his uniform, of the youth that permitted him to wear that uniform, of his bronzed skin, of his wife, of his pride in that wife. "'You're a lucky chap, Jackson,' he said. "'I sent for you because I wanted to say that, as long as you are in the National Service, I shall feel you are on vacation,' he smiled at the word, "'on pay.' Under those circumstances, I owe you quite a little money." Jackson was too overwhelmed to reply at once. "'As a matter of fact,' Clayton went on, "'it's a national move, in a way. You don't owe any gratitude. We need our babies, you see, more than we do hats. If this war goes on, we shall need a good many boy babies.' And his own words suddenly crystallized the terror that was in him. It was the boys who would go, boys who whistled in the morning, Boys who dreamed in the spring, long dreams of romance and love. Boys, not men like himself, with their hopes and dreams behind them, not men who had lived long enough to know that only their early dreams were real, not men who, having lived, knew the vast disillusion of living and were ready to die. It was only after Jackson had gone that he saw the fallacy of his own reasoning. If to live were disappointment, then to die, still dreaming the great dream, was not wholly evil. He found himself saying, To earn some honourable advancement for one's soul. Deep down in him, overlaid with years of worldliness, there was a belief in a life after death. He looked out the window at the little changing group. In each man out there, there was something that would live on, after he had shed that sweating, often dirty, always weary, sometimes malformed shell, that was the body, and then the thing that would count would not be how he had lived, but what he had done. This war was a big thing. It was the biggest thing in all the history of the world. There might be, perhaps, some special heaven for those who had given themselves to it, some particular honourable advancement for their souls. Already he saw Jackson as one apart, a man dedicated. Then he knew that all his thinking was really centred about his boy. He wanted Graham to go. But in giving him, he was giving him to the chance of death. Then he must hold to his belief in eternity. He must feel that, or the thing would be unbearable. For the first time in his life he gave conscious thought to Natalie's religious belief. She believed in those things. She must. She sat devoutly through the long service. She slipped with a little rustle of soft silk so easily to her knees. Perhaps if he went to her with that? End of chapter 31。Chapter 32 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For about a week after Anna's escape, Herman Klein had sat alone and brooded. Entirely alone now, for following a stormy scene on his discovery of Anna's disappearance, Katie had gone too. "'I don't know where she is,' she had said angrily, "'and if I didn't know I wouldn't tell you. If I was her, I'd have the law on you. Don't you look at that strap. You lay a hand on me and I'll kill you. If you think I'm afraid of you, you can think again.' "'She is my daughter, and not yet of age,' Hermann said heavily. "'You tell her for me that she comes back, or I go and bring her.' Yah! Katie jeered. You try it. She's got marks on her that'll jail you. And on his failure to reply, her courage mounted. This ain't Germany, you know. They know how to treat women over here. And you ask me, her voice rose, and I'll just say that there's queer comings and goings here with that Rudolph. I've heard him say some things that'll lock him up good and tight. For all his rage, Teutonic caution warned him not to lay hands on the girl but his anger against her almost strangled him. Indeed, when she came downstairs dragging her heavy suitcase, he took a step or two toward her with his fists clenched. She stopped, terrified. 
"'You old bully,' she said, between white lips, "'you touch me and I'll scream till I bring in every neighbour in the block. There's a good lamp-post outside that's just waiting for your sort of German.' He had refused to pay her for the last week also. But that, she knew well enough, was because he was out of money. As fast as Anna's salary had come in, he had taken out of it the small allowance that was to cover the week's expenses, and had banked the remainder. But Anna had carried her last pay envelope away with her, and added to his anger at her going was his fear that he would have to draw on his savings. With Katie gone, he set heavily about preparing his Sunday dinner. Long years of service done for him, however, had made him clumsy. He cooked a wretched meal, and then, leaving the dishes as they were, he sat by the fire and brooded. When Rudolph came in later, he found him there, in his stocking feet, a morose and untidy figure. Rudolph's reception of the news roused him, however. He looked up after the telling, to find the younger man standing over him and staring down at him with bloodshot eyes. "'You beat her,' he was saying. "'What with?' "'What does it matter? She had bought herself a watch.' "'What did you beat her with?' Rudolph was licking his lips. Receiving no reply, he called, "'Katie!' "'Katie has gone.' "'Maybe you beat her, too.' "'She wasn't my daughter.' "'No, by God, you wouldn't dare to touch her. She didn't belong to you. You—' "'Get out,' said Herman somberly. He stood up menacingly. "'You go now.' Rudolph hesitated. Then he laughed. "'All right, old top,' he said in a conciliatory tone. "'No offence meant. I lost my temper.' He picked up the empty coal scuttle, and went out into the shed where the coal was kept. He needed a minute to think. Besides, he always brought in coal when he was there. In the shed, however, he put down the scuttle and stood still. "'The old devil!' he muttered. But his rage for Anna was followed by rage against her. Where was she to-night? Did Graham Spencer know where she was? And if he did, what then? Were they at that moment somewhere together, hidden away, the two of them? The conviction that they were together grew on him, and with it a frenzy that was almost madness. He left the coal scuttle in the shed and went out into the air. For a half-hour he stood there, looking down toward the Spencer furnace, sending up now red, now violet bursts of flame. He was angry enough, jealous enough, but he was quick, too, to see that that particular lump of potter's clay, which was Herman Klein, was ready for the wheel. Even while he was cursing the girl, his cunning mind was already plotting, revenge for the Spencers, self-aggrandizement among his fellows for himself. His inordinate conceit, wounded by Anna's defection, found comfort in the early prospect of putting over a big thing. He carried the coal in to find Herman gloomily clearing his untidy table. For a moment they worked in silence, Rudolph at the stove, Herman at the sink. Then Rudolph washed his hands under the faucet and faced the older man. "'How do you know she bought herself that watch?' he demanded. Herman eyed him. "'Perhaps you gave it to her.' Something like suspicion of Rudolph crept into his eyes. "'Me? A hundred-dollar watch?' How do you know it cost a hundred dollars? I saw it. She tried that story on me, too, but I was too smart for her. I went to the store and asked. A hundred bucks. Herman's lips drew back over his teeth. You knew it, eh, and you did not tell me? It wasn't my funeral, said Rudolph coolly. If you wanted to believe that she bought it herself? If she bought it herself, Rudolph's shoulder was caught in an iron grip. You will tell me what you mean. Well, I ask you, do you think she'd spend that much on a watch? Anyhow, the installment story doesn't go. That place doesn't sell on installments. Who is there who would buy her such a watch? Herman's voice was thick. How about Graham Spencer? She's been pretty thick with him. How you mean, thick? Rudolph shrugged his shoulders. I don't mean anything, but he's taken her out in his car, and the Spencers think there's nothing can't be bought with money. Herman put down the dishcloth, and commenced to draw down his shirt-sleeves. "'Where are you going?' Rudolph demanded uneasily. "'I go to the Spencers.' "'Listen,' Rudolph said excitedly. "'Don't you do it. Not yet. You've got to get him first. We don't know anything. We don't even know he gave her that watch. We've got to find her, don't you see? 
and then we've got to learn if he's going there wherever she is i shall bring her back herman said stubbornly i shall bring her back and i shall kill her and get strung up yourself now listen he argued you leave this to me i'll find her i've got a friend the city detective and he'll help me see we'll get her back all right only you've got to keep your hands off her it's the spencers that have got to pay herman went back to the sink slowly that is right it is the spencers he muttered rudolph went out late in the evening he came back with the news that the search was on and knowing herman's pride he assured him that the hill need never learn of anna's flight and if any inquiries came he advised him to say the girl was sick in rudolph's twisted mind it was not so much anna's delinquency that enraged him the hill had its own ideas of morality but he was fiercely jealous with that class jealousy which was the fundamental actuating motive of his life he never for a moment doubted that she had gone to graham and sitting by the fire in the little house old herman's untidy head shrunk on his shoulders rudolph almost forgot anna in plotting to use this new pawn across the hearth from him in his game of destruction by the end of the week however there was no news of anna she had not returned to the mill rudolph's friend on the detective force had found no clue and old herman had advanced from brooding by the fire to long and furious wanderings about the city streets he felt no remorse only a growing and alarming fury he returned at night to his cold and unkempt house to cook himself a frugal and wretched meal his money had run very low and with true german stubbornness he refused to draw any from the savings bank rudolph was very busy there were meetings always and to the little inner circle that met behind gus's barroom one night later in march he divulged the plan for the destruction of the new spencer munition plant but will they take him back one of the men asked he was of better class than the rest with a military bearing and a heavy german accent for all his careful english will a dog snatch at a bone countered rudolph take him back they'll be crazy about it he has been there a long time he may at the last weaken but rudolph only laughed and drank more whiskey of the german agents providing he won't weaken he said give me a few days more to find the girl and all hell won't hold him on the sunday morning after the president had been before congress he found herman dressed for church but sitting by the fire all around him lay the sunday paper and he barely raised his head when rudolph entered well it's here said rudolph it has come yes wall street will be opening champagne to-day herman said nothing but later on he opened up the fountain of rage in his heart it was wrong all wrong we had no quarrel with germany it was the capitalists and politicians who had done it and above all england he went far he blamed america and americans for his loss of work for anna's disappearance he searched his mind for grievances and found them in the ore dust on the hill which killed his garden in the inefficiency of the police who could not find anna in the very attitude of clayton spencer towards his resignation and on this smouldering fire rudolph piled fuel not that he said a great deal he worked around the cottage washed dishes threw pails of water on the dirty porches swept the floor carried in coal and wood and gradually he began to play on the older man's vanity he had had great influence with the mill workers no one man had ever had so much old herman sat up and listened sourly but after a time he got up and pouring some water out of the kettle proceeded to shave himself and rudolph talked on if now he were to go back and it were to the advantage of the fatherland and of the workers of the world to hamper the industry who so able to do it as herman hamper how herman asked suspiciously holding his razor aloft he had a great fear of the law rudolph reassured him cunning eyes averted well a strike he suggested the men'll listen to you god knows they've got a right to strike i shall not go back said herman stolidly and finished his shaving but rudolph was satisfied he left herman sitting by the fire but his eyes were no longer brooding 
He was thinking, watching the smoke curl up from the china-bowled German pipe which he had brought from the fatherland, and which he used only on special occasions. End of chapter 32「Dangerous Days」by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The declaration of war found Graham desperately unhappy. Natalie held him rigidly to his promise, but it is doubtful if Natalie alone could have kept him out of the army. Marion was using her influence, too. She held him by alternating between almost agreeing to runaway marriage and threats of breaking the engagement if he went to war. She had tacitly agreed to play Natalie's game, and she was doing it. Graham did not analyze his own misery. What he said to himself was that he was making a mess of things. Life, which had seemed to be a simple thing, compounded of work and play, had become involved, difficult, and wretched. Sometimes he watched Clayton almost with envy. He seemed so sure of himself. He was so poised, so calm, so strong and he wondered if there had ever been a tumultuous youth behind the quiet of his maturity. He compared the even course of Clayton's days, his work, his club, the immaculate orderliness of his life, with his own disordered existence. He was hedged about with women. Wherever he turned they obtruded themselves. He made plans, and women brushed them aside. He tried to live his life, and women stepped in and lived it for him. His mother, Marion, Anna Klein, even delight with her friendship always overclouded with disapproval. Wherever he turned, a woman stood in the way. Yet he could not do without them. He needed them even while he resented them. Then gradually, into his self-engrossment, there penetrated a conviction that all was not well between his father and his mother. He had always taken them for granted much as he did the house and the servants. In his brief vacations during his college days, they had agreed or disagreed amicably enough. He had considered in those days that life was a very simple thing. People married and lived together. Marriage, he considered, was rather the end of things. But he was older now, and he knew that marriage was a beginning and not an end. It did not change people fundamentally. It only changed their habits. His discovery that his father and mother differed about the war was the first of other discoveries, that they differed about him that they differed about many matters, that, indeed, they had no common ground at all on which to meet. Between them, although Graham did not put it that way, was a no-man's land strewn with dead happiness, lost desires, and the wreckage of years of dissension. It was incredible to Graham that he should ever reach the forties, but he wondered sometimes if all of life was either looking forward or looking back. And it seemed to him rather tragic that for Clayton, who still looked like a boy, there should be nothing but his day at the mill, his silent evening at home, or some stodgy dinner-party where the women were all middle-aged, and the other men a trifle corpulent. For the first time he was beginning to think of Clayton as a man rather than a father. Not that all of this was coherently thought out. It was a series of impressions, outgrowth of his own beginning development, and of his own uneasiness. He wondered, too, about Rodney Page. He seemed to be always around, underfoot, suave, fastidious, bowing Natalie out of the room and in again. He had deplored the war until he found his attitude unfashionable, and then he began with great enthusiasm to arrange pageants for Red Cross funds, and even to make little speeches, graceful and artificial, patterned on his best after-dinner manner. Graham was certain that he supported his mother in trying to keep him at home, and he began to hate him with a healthy young hate. However, late in April he posed in one of the pageants, rather ungraciously, in a khaki uniform. It was not until the last minute that he knew that Delight Haverford was to be the nurse bending over his prostrate figure. He turned rather savage. "'Rotten nonsense,' he said to her, when they stood waiting to be posed. Oh, I don't know. They're rather pretty. Pretty? Do you suppose I wanted to be pretty? Well, I do, said Delight calmly. It's fake. That's what I hate. If you were really a nurse and was really in uniform. But this parading in somebody else's clothes was stuff hired for the occasion. It's sickening. 
Delight regarded him with clear, appraising eyes. "'Why don't you get a uniform of your own, then?' she inquired. She smiled a little. He never knew what the effort cost her. He was pale and angry, and his face in the tableau was so set that it brought a round of applause. With the ringing down of the curtain he confronted her, almost menacingly. "'What did you mean by that?' he demanded. "'We've hardly got into this thing yet.' "'We are in it, Graham. Just because I don't leap into the first recruiting office and beg them to take me, what right have you got to call me a slacker? But I heard—go on. It doesn't matter what I heard if you are going. Of course I'm going, he said truculently. He meant it, too. He would get Anna settled somewhere, she had begun to mend, and then he would have it out with Marion and his mother. But there was no hurry. The war would last a long time. And so it was that Graham Spencer joined the long line of those others who had bought a piece of ground, or five yoke of oxen, or had married a wife. It was the morning after the pageant that Clayton, going downtown with him in the car, voiced his expectation that the government would take over their foreign contracts, and his feeling that in that case it would be a mistake to profit by the nation's necessities. "'What do you mean, sir?' I mean we should take only a small profit, a banker's profit. Graham had been fairly stunned, and had sat quiet while Clayton explained his attitude. There were times when big profits were allowable. There was always the risk to invested capital to consider, but he did not want to grow fat on the nation's misfortunes. Italy was one thing. This was different. But we are just getting on our feet. Think it over, said Clayton. This is going to be a long war, and an expensive one. We don't particularly want a profit by it, do we?" Graham flushed. He felt rather small and cheap, but with that there was a growing admiration of his father. Suddenly he saw that this man beside him was a big man, one to be proud of, for already he knew the cost of the decision. He sat still, turning this new angle of war over in his mind. I'd like to see some of your directors when you put that up to them." Clayton nodded rather grimly. He did not anticipate a pleasant hour. "'How about Mother?' "'I think we may take it for granted that she feels as we do.' Graham pondered that, too. "'What about the new place?' "'It's too soon to discuss that. We are obligated to do a certain amount. Of course it would be wise to cut where we can.' Graham smiled. She'll raise the deuce of a row, was his comment. It had never occurred to him before to take sides between his father and his mother, but there was rising in him a new and ardent partisanship of his father, a feeling that they were, in a way, men together. He had, more than once, been tempted to go to him with the Anna Klein situation. He would have, probably, but a fellow felt an awful fool going to somebody and telling him that a girl was in love with him, and what the dickens was he to do about it? He wondered, too, if anybody would believe that his relationship with Anna was straight under the circumstances. For weeks now he had been sending her money, out of a sheer sense of responsibility, for her beating and her illness. He took no credit for altruism. He knew quite well the possibilities of the situation. He made no promises to himself. But such attraction as Anna had had for him had been of her prettiness, and their propinquity. Again, she was girl, and that was all. And the attraction was very faint now. He was only sorry for her. When she could get about, she took to calling him up daily from a drug store at a nearby corner, and once he met her after dark, and they walked a few blocks together. She was still weak but she was spiritualized, too. He liked her a great deal that night. "'Do you know you've loaned me over a hundred dollars, Graham?' she asked. "'That's not a loan. I owe you that.' "'I'll pay it back. I'm going to start tomorrow to look for work, and it won't cost me much to live.' "'If you send it back, I'll buy you another watch.' And tragic as the subject was, they both laughed. I'd have died if I hadn't had you to think about when I was sick, Graham. I wanted to die, except for you." He had kissed her then, rather because he knew she expected him to. When they got back to the house, she said, "'You wouldn't care to come up?' "'I don't think I had better, Anna.' "'The landlady doesn't object. There isn't any parlour. 
All the girls have their callers in their rooms. I have to go out tonight, he said evasively. I'll come some other time. As he started away, he glanced back at her. She was standing in the doorway, eyeing him wistfully, a lonely and depressed little figure. He was tempted to go back, but he did not. On the day when Clayton had broached the subject of offering the sitting across the desk, and it was difficult to make his responses non-committal, Graham? Uh, yes? Is anybody there? Can you talk? Not very well. Then listen, I'll talk. I want to see you. I'm busy all day. Sorry. Listen, Graham, I must see you. I've something to tell you. All right, go ahead. It's about Rudolph. I was out looking for a position yesterday, and I met him. Yes? He looked up. Miss Peterson was absently scribbling on the cover of her book and listening intently. He was terrible, Graham. He accused me of all sorts of things about you. He almost groaned aloud over the predicament he was in. It began to look serious. Suppose I pick you up and we have dinner somewhere. At the same corner? Yes. He was very irritable all morning. He felt as though a net was closing in around him, and his actual innocence made him the more miserable. Miss Peterson found him very difficult that day, and shed tears in her little room before she went to lunch. Anna herself was difficult that evening. Her landlady's son had given up a good job and enlisted. Everybody was going. She supposed Graham would go next, and she'd be left alone. I don't know. I'd like to. Oh, you'll go all right, and you'll forget I ever existed. She made an effort. You're right, of course. I'm only looking ahead. If anything happens to you, I'll kill myself. The idea interested her. She began to dramatize herself, a forlorn figure driven from home and deserted by her lover. She saw herself lying in the cottage, stately and mysterious, while the hill girls went in and out and whispered. "'I'll kill myself,' she repeated. "'Nothing will happen to me, Anna, dear. I don't know why I care so. I'm nothing to you. That's not so. If you cared, you'd have come up the other night. You left me alone in that lonesome hole. It's hell, that place. All smells and whispering and dirt. Now, listen to me, Anna. You're tired, or you wouldn't say that. You know I'm fond of you. But I've got you into trouble enough. I'm not... For God's sake, don't tempt me, Anna. She looked at him half scornfully. Tempt you? Then she gave a little scream. Graham, following her eyes, looked through the window near them. Rudolph, she whimpered, and began to weep out of pure terror. But Graham saw nobody. To soothe her, however, he went outside and looked about. There were half a dozen cars, a group of chauffeurs, but no Rudolph. He went back to her to find her sitting, pale and tense, her hands clenched together. "'They'll pay you out some way,' she said. "'I know them. They'll never believe the truth. That was Rudolph, all right. He'll think we're living together. He'd never believe anything else.' Do you think he followed you the other day? I gave him the shake in the crowd. Then I don't see why you're worrying. We're just where we were before, aren't we? You don't know them. I do. They'll be up to something. She was excited and anxious, and with the cocktail he ordered for her, she grew reckless. I'm just hung around your neck like a stone, she lamented. You don't care a rap for me. I know it. You're just sorry for me. Her eyes filled again and Graham rose with an impatient movement. "'Let's get out of this,' he said roughly. "'The whole place is staring at you.' But on the road the fact that she had been weeping for him made him relent. He put an arm around her and drew her to him. "'Don't cry, honey,' he said. "'It makes me unhappy to see you miserable.' He kissed her, and they clung together, finding a little comfort in the contact of warm young bodies. He went up to her room that night. He was more anxious as to Rudolph than he cared to admit, but he went up, treading softly on stairs that creaked with every step. He had no coherent thoughts. He wanted companionship rather than love. He was hungry for what she gave him, the touch of her hands about his neck, the sense of his manhood that shone from her faithful eyes, the admiration and unstinting love she offered him. But alone in the little room he had a reaction 
not the less keen because it was his fastidious rather than his moral sense that revolted. The room was untidy, close, sordid. Even Anna's youth did not redeem it. Again he had the sense, when he had closed the door, of being caught in a trap, and this time a dirty trap. When she had taken off her hat and held up her face to be kissed, he knew he would not stay. "'It's awful, isn't it?' she asked, following his eyes. "'It doesn't look like you, that's sure.' "'I hurried out. It's not so bad when it's tidy.' He threw up the window and stood there a moment. The spring air was cool and clean, and there was a sound of tramping feet below. He looked down. The railway station was nearby, and marching toward it, with the long swing of regulars, a company of soldiers was moving rapidly. The night, the absence of drums or music, the business-like rapidity of their progress held him there, looking down. He turned around. Anna had slipped off her coat, and had opened the collar of her blouse. Her neck gleamed white and young. She smiled at him. Uh, "'I guess I'll be going,' he stammered. "'Going?' "'I only wanted to see how you were fixed.' His eyes evaded hers. "'I'll see you again in a day or two. I—' He could not tell her the thoughts that were surging in him. The country was at war. Those fellows below there were already in it, of it. And here, in this sordid room, he had meant to take her, not because he loved her, but because she offered herself. It was cheap, it was terrible, it was dirty. Good night, he said, and tried to kiss her. But she turned her face away. She stood listening to his steps on the stairs as he went down, steps that mingled and were lost in the steady tramp of the soldiers' feet in the street below. End of chapter 33「Chapter thirty four of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. With his many new problems following the declaration of war, Clayton Spencer found a certain peace. It was good to work hard. It was good to fill every working hour, and to drop into sleep at night too weary for consecutive thought. Yet had he been frank with himself, he would have acknowledged that Audrey was never really out of his mind. Back of his every decision lay his desire for her approval. He did not make them with her consciously in his mind, but he wanted her to know and understand, in his determination, for instance, to offer his shells to the government at a nominal profit, there was no desire to win her approbation. It was rather that he felt her behind him in the decision. He shrank from telling Natalie. Indeed, until he had returned from Washington, he did not broach the subject and then he was tired and rather discouraged, and as a result almost brutally abrupt. Coming on top of a hard fight with the new directorate, a fight which he had finally won, Washington was disheartening. Planning enormously for the future, it seemed to have no vision for the things of the present. He was met vaguely, put off, questioned. He waited hours as patiently as he could, to find that no man seemed to have power to act or to know what powers he had. He found something else, too, a suspicion of him, of his motives. Who offered something for nothing must be actuated by some deep and hidden motive. He found his plain proposition probed and searched for some ulterior purpose behind it. "'It's the old distrust, Mr. Spencer,' said Hutchinson, who had gone with him to furnish figures and various data. "'The Democrats are opposed to capital. They're afraid of it. And the Army thinks all civilians are on the make which is pretty nearly true. He saw the Secretary of War, finally, and came away feeling better. He had found there an understanding that a man may, even should, make sacrifices for his country during war. But although he carried away with him the conviction that his offer would ultimately be accepted, there was nothing actually accomplished. He sent Hutchinson back, and waited for a day or two, convinced that his very sincerity must bring a concrete result, and soon. Then, lunching alone one day in the Shoreham, he saw Audrey Valentine at another table. He had not seen her for weeks, and he had an odd moment of breathlessness when his eyes fell on her. She was pale and thin, and her eyes looked very tired. His first impulse was to go to her. 
The second, on which he acted, was to watch her for a little, to fill his eyes for the long months of emptiness ahead. She was with a man in uniform, a young man, gay and smiling. He was paying her evident court, in a debonair fashion, bending toward her across the table. Suddenly Clayton was jealous, fiercely jealous. The jealousy of the young is sad enough, but it is an ephemeral thing. Life calls from many directions. There is always the future, and the things of the future, and behind it there is the buoyancy and easy forgetfulness of youth. But the jealousy of later years knows no such relief. It sees time flying, and happiness evading it. It has not the easy self-confidence of the twenties. It has learned, too, that happiness is a rare, elusive thing, to be held and nursed and clung to, and that even love must be won and held. It has learned that love must be free, but its instinct is to hold it with chains. He suffered acutely, and was ashamed of his suffering. After all, Audrey was still young. Life had not been kind to her, and she should be allowed to have such happiness as she could. He could offer her nothing. He would give her up. He had already given her up. She knew it. Then she saw him, and his determination died under the light that came into her eyes. Give her up! How could he give her up when she was everything he had in the world? With a shock he recognized in the thought Natalie's constant repetition as to Graham. So he had come to that. He felt Audrey's eyes on him, but he did not go to her. He signed his check and went out. He fully meant to go away without seeing her. But outside he hesitated. That would hurt her, and it was cowardly. When, a few moments later, she came out, followed by the officer, it was to find him there obviously waiting. "'I wondered if you would dare to run away,' she said. "'This is Captain Sloan, Clay, and he knows a lot about you.' Close inspection showed Sloan handsome, bronzed, and with a soft southern voice, somewhat like Audrey's. And it developed that he came from her home, and was on his way to one of the early camps. He obviously intended to hold on to Audrey, and Clayton left them there with the feeling that Audrey's eyes were following him, wistful and full of trouble. He had not even asked her where she was stopping. He took a long walk that afternoon, and remade his noon-hour resolution. He would keep away from her. It might hurt her at first, but she was young, she would forget, and he must not stand in her way. Having done which, he returned to the Shoreham, and spent an hour in a telephone booth, calling hotels systematically, and inquiring for her. When he finally located her, his voice over the wire startled her. "'Good heavens, Clay,' she said, "'are you angry about anything?' "'Of course not. I just wanted to—' "'I am leaving tonight, and I'm saying good-bye. "'That's all.' "'Oh,' she waited. "'Have you had a pleasant afternoon? "'Aren't you going to see me before you go?' "'I don't think so. "'Don't you want to know what I am doing in Washington?' "'That's fairly clear, isn't it?' "'You are being rather cruel, Clay.' He hesitated. He was amazed at his own attitude. Then, "'Will you dine with me tonight?' "'I kept this evening for you.' But when he saw her, his sense of discomfort only increased. Their dining together was natural enough. It was not even faintly clandestine. But the new restraint he put on himself made him reserved and unhappy. He could not act a part. And after a time Audrey left off acting, too and he found her watching him. On the surface he talked, but underneath it he saw her unhappiness and her understanding of his. "'I'm going back, too,' she said. "'I came down to see what I could do, but there is nothing for the untrained woman. She's a cumberer of the earth. I'll go home and knit. I dare say I ought to be able to learn to do that well, anyhow.' "'Have you forgiven me for this afternoon?' I wasn't angry. I understood. That was it, in a nutshell. Audrey understood. She was that sort. She never held small resentments. He rather thought she never felt them. Don't talk about me, she said. Tell me about you and why you are here. It's the war, of course. So rather reluctantly, he told her. He shrank from seeming to want her approval, but at the same time he wanted it. 
His faith in himself had been shaken. He needed it restored. And some of the exaltation which had led him to make his profit at the government came back when he saw how she flushed over it. "'It's very big,' she said softly. "'It's like you, Clay. And that's the best thing I can say. I am very proud of you.' "'I would rather have you proud of me than anything in the world,' he said unsteadily. They drifted somehow to talking of happiness. And always, carefully veiled, it was their own happiness they discussed. "'I don't think,' she said, glancing away from him, "'that one finds it by looking for it. That is selfish, and the selfish are never happy. It comes, oh, in queer ways, when you're trying to give it to somebody else, mostly. There is happiness of a sort in work.' Their eyes met. That was what they had to face, she dedicated to service, he to labour. It's never found by making other people unhappy, Clay. No, and yet if the other people are already unhappy? Never, she said, and the answer was to the unspoken question in both their hearts. It was not until they were in the taxicab that Clayton forced the personal note, and then it came as a cry out of the very depths of him. She had slipped her hand into his, and the comfort of even that small touch broke down the barriers he had so carefully erected. "'I need you so,' he said, and he held her hand to his face. She made no movement to withdraw it. "'I need you, too,' she replied. "'I never get over needing you. But we are going to play the game, Clay. We may have our weak hours, and this is one of them. But always, please God, will play the game." The curious humility he felt with her was in his voice. "'I'll need your help even in that.' And that touch of boyishness almost broke down her reserve of strength. She wanted to draw his head down on her shoulder and comfort him. She wanted to smooth back his heavy hair, and put her arms around him and hold him. There was a great tenderness in her for him. There were times when she would have given the world to have gone into his arms, and let him hold her there, protected and shielded. But that night she was the stronger, and she knew it. "'I love you, Audrey. I love you terribly.' And that was the word for it. It was terrible. She knew it. "'To have gone through all the world,' he said brokenly, "'and then to find the woman when it is too late, forever too late.' He turned toward her. "'You know it, don't you, that you are my woman?' "'I know it,' she answered steadily. "'But I know, too. Let me say it just once, then never again. I'll bury it, but you will know it is there. You are my woman. I would go through all of life alone to find you at the end. And if I could look forward, dear, to going through the rest of it with you beside me, so I could touch you like this, I know.' If I could only protect you and shield you, oh, how tenderly I would care for you, my dear, my dear!" The strength passed to him then. Audrey had a clear picture of what life with him might mean, of his protection, his tenderness. She had never known it. Suddenly every bit of her called out for his care, his quiet strength. "'Don't make me sorry for myself!' There were tears in her eyes. Will you kiss me, Clay? We might have that to remember. But they were not to have even that, for the taxicab drew up before her hotel. It was one of the absurd anticlimaxes of life that they should part with a hand clasp and her formal, Thank you for a lovely evening. Audrey was the better actor of the two. She went in as casually as though she had not put the only happiness of her life away from her. But Clayton Spencer stood on the pavement, watching her in, and all the tragedy of the empty years ahead was in his eyes. End of chapter 34、chapter、thirty five of Dangerous Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Left alone in her untidy room after Graham's abrupt departure, Anna Klein was dazed. She stood where he left her, staring ahead. What had happened meant only one thing to her, 
that Graham no longer cared about her, and, if that was true, she did not care to live. It never occurred to her that he had done rather a fine thing, or that he had protected her against herself. She felt no particular shame, save the shame of rejection. In her small world of the hill, if a man gave a girl valuable gifts or money, there was generally a quid pro quo. If the girl was unwilling, she did not accept such gifts. If the man wanted nothing, he did not make them. And men who made love to girls either wanted to marry them, or desired some other relationship with them. She listened to his retreating footsteps, and then began automatically to unbutton her thin white blouse. But with the sound of the engine of his car below, she ran to the window. She leaned out, elbows on the sill, and watched him go, without a look up at her window. So that was the end of that. Then all at once she was fiercely angry. He had got her into this scrape, and now he had left her. He had pretended to love her, and all the time he had meant to do just this, to let her offer herself so that he might reject her. He had been playing with her. She had lost her home because of him, had been beaten almost insensible, had been ill for weeks, and now he had driven away without even looking back. She jerked her blouse off, still standing by the window, and when the sleeve caught on her watch she jerked that off too. She stood for a moment with it in her hand, her face twisted with shame and anger. Then recklessly and furiously she flung it through the open window. In the stillness of the street, far below, she heard it strike and rebound. That for him, she muttered. Almost immediately she wanted it again. He had given it to her. It was all she had left now, and in a curious way it had, through long wearing, come to mean Graham to her. She leaned out of the window. She thought she saw it gleaming in the gutter, and already, attracted by the crash, a man was crossing the street to where it lay. "'You let that alone!' she called down desperately. The figure was already stooping over it. Entirely reckless now, she ran, bare-armed and bare-bosomed, down the stairs and out into the street. She had thought to see its finder escaping, but he was still standing where he had picked it up. "'It's mine,' she began. "'I dropped it out of the window. I—' "'You threw it out of the window. I saw you.' It was Rudolph. You, he snarled and stood with menacing eyes fixed on her bare neck. Rudolph, get into the house, he said roughly. You're half naked. Give me my watch. I'll give it to you all right. What's left of it when we get in? He followed her into the hall, but when she turned there and held out her hand, he only snarled again. We'll talk upstairs. I can't take you up. The landlady don't allow it. She don't, eh? You had that Spencer skunk up there. His face frightened her, and she lied vehemently. That's not so, and you know it, Rudolph Klein. He came inside just like this, and we stood and talked. Then he went away. He wasn't inside ten minutes. Her voice rose hysterically, but Rudolph caught her by the arm, and pushing her ahead of him, forced her up the stairs. "'We're going to have this out,' he muttered viciously. Halfway up she stopped him. "'You're hurting my arm.' "'You be glad I'm not breaking it for you.' He climbed in a mounting fury. He almost threw her into her room, and closing the door he turned the key in it. His face reminded her of her father's the night he had beaten her, and her instinct of self-preservation made her put the little table between them. "'You lay a hand on me,' she panted, "'and I'll yell out the window. The police would be glad enough to have something on you, Rudolph Klein, and you know it.' "'They arrest women like you, too.' "'Don't you dare say that.' And, as he took a step or two toward her, she retreated to the window. "'You stay there, or I'll jump out of the window.' She looked desperate enough to do it, and Rudolph hesitated. "'He was up here. I saw him at the window. I've been trailing you all evening. Keep off that window sill, you little fool. I'm not going to kill you, but I'm going to get him all right, and don't you forget it." His milder tone and the threat frightened her more than ever. He would get Graham. He was like that. Get him in some cruel, helpless way, 
That was the German blood in him. She began to play for time, with instinctive cunning. "'Listen, Rudolph,' she said. "'I'll tell you all about it. He did come up, but he left right away. We quarrelled. He threw me over, Rudolph. That's what he did.' Her own words reminded her of her humiliation, and tears came into her eyes. "'He threw me over. Honest he did. That's why I threw his watch out of the window. That's straight, Rudolph. That's straight goods. I'm not lying now.' God, said Rudolph, the dirty pup. Then, then you're through with him, eh? I'm through, all right. Her tone carried conviction. Rudolph's face relaxed, and seeing that, she remembered her half-dressed condition. Throw me that waist, she said. Come around and get it. Oh, Rudolph, throw it, please. Getting modest all at once, he jeered, but he picked it up and advanced to the table with it. As she held out her hand for it, he caught her and drew her forward toward him across the table. "'You little devil,' he said, and kissed her. She submitted because she must, but she shivered. If she was to save Graham, she must play the game. And so far she was winning. She was feminine enough to know that already the thing he thought she had done was to be forgiven her. More than that, she saw a half-reluctant admiration in Rudolph's eyes, as though she had gained value, if she had lost virtue, by the fact that young Spencer had fancied her. And Rudolph's morals were the morals of many of his kind. He admired chastity in a girl, but he did not expect it. But she was watchful for the next move he might make. That it was not what she expected did not make it the less terrifying. You get your hat and coat on. I'll not do anything of the kind. Do you think I'm going to leave you here when he can come back whenever he wants to? You think again. Where are you going to take me? I'm going to take you home. When pleading made no impression on him, and when he refused to move without her, she threw her small wardrobe into the suitcase and put her hat and coat on. She was past thinking, quite hopeless. She would go back and her father would kill her, which would be the best thing anyhow. She didn't care to live. Rudolph had relapsed into moody silence. Down the stairs and on the street he preceded her, contemptuously letting her trail behind. He carried her suitcase, however, and once, being insecurely fastened, it opened and bits of untidy apparel littered the pavement. He dropped the suitcase and stood by while she filled it again. The softness of that movement when, lured by her bare arms he had kissed her, was gone. The night car jolted and swayed. After a time he dozed, and Anna, watching him, made an attempt at flight. He caught her on the rear platform, however, with a clutch that sickened her. The conductor eyed them with the scant curiosity of two o'clock in the morning, when all the waking world is awry. At last they were climbing the hill to the cottage, while behind and below them the Spencer furnaces sent out their orange and violet flames, and the roar of the blast sounded like the coming of a mighty wind. The cottage was dark. Rudolph put down the suitcase, and called Herman softly through his hands. Above they could hear him moving, and his angry voice came through the open window. "'What you want?' "'Come down. It's Rudolph.' But when he turned, Anna was lying in a dead faint on the garden path, a crumpled little heap of blissful forgetfulness. When Herman came down, it was to find Rudolph standing over her, the suitcase still in his hand, and an ugly scowl on his face. "'Well, I got her,' he said. "'She's scared, that's all.' He prodded her with his foot, but she did not move, and Herman bent down with his candle. He straightened. "'Bring her in,' he said, and led the way into the house. When Rudolph staggered in with Anna in his arms, he found Herman waiting and fingering the leather strap. End of chapter 35「
No? All right, I'll be good. But she had carried the idea home with her, and had proceeded with her customary decision to act on it. Then, one day in May, she was surprised by a visit from Delight Haverford. She had come home, tired and rather depressed, to find the Haverford car at the door, and Delight waiting for her in her sitting-room. Audrey's acquaintance with Delight had been rather fragmentary, but it had covered a long stretch of time. So, if she was surprised, it was not greatly when Delight suddenly kissed her. She saw then that the girl had brought her some spring flowers, and the little tribute touched her. "'What a nice child you are,' she said, and standing before the mirror proceeded to take off her hat. Before her she could see the reflection of Delight's face and her own tired, slightly haggard eyes. "'And how unutterably old you make me look!' she added, smiling. "'You are too lovely for words, Mrs. Valentine.' Audrey patted her hair into order, and continued her smiling inspection of the girl's face. "'And now we have exchanged compliments,' she said. "'We will have some tea, and then you shall tell me what you are so excited about.' "'I am excited. I—' Let's have the tea first. Audrey's housekeeping was still rather casual. Tidiness of Natalie's meticulous order would always be beyond her, but after certain frantic searches for what she needed, she made some delicious tea. Order was left out of me somehow, she complained, or else things move about when I'm away. I'm sure it is that, because I certainly never put the sugar behind my best hat. Now, let's have it. Delight was only playing with her tea. She flushed delicately and put the cup down. "'I was in the crowd this morning,' she said. "'In the crowd? Oh, my crowd!' "'Yes.' "'I see,' said Audrey thoughtfully. "'I make a dreadful speech, you know. I thought you were wonderful, and when those men promised to enlist I cried. I was horribly ashamed. But you were splendid.' "'I wonder.' said Audrey, growing grave. Delight was astonished to see that there were tears in her eyes. I do it because it is all I can do, and of course they must go. But sometimes at night, you see, my dear, some of them are going to be killed. I am urging them to go, but the better the day I have had, the less I sleep at night. There was a little pause. Delight was thinking desperately of something to say. But you didn't come to talk about me, did you? Partly, and partly about myself. I want to do something, Mrs. Valentine. I can drive a car, but not very well. I don't know a thing about the engine. And I can nurse a little. I like nursing." Audrey studied her face. It seemed to her sad beyond words that this young girl, who should have had only happiness, was facing the horrors of what would probably be a long war. It was the young who paid the price of war, in death, in empty years. Already the careless gaiety of their lives was gone. For the dream futures they had planned, they had now to substitute long waitings. For happiness, service. The Red Cross is going to send canteen workers to France. You might do that. If only I could, but I can't leave Mother, not entirely. Father is going. He wants to go and fight, but I'm afraid they won't take him. He'll go as a chaplain, anyhow. But he's perfectly helpless, you know. Mother says she is going to tie his overshoes around his neck. I'll see if I can think of something for you, Delight. There's one thing in my mind. There are to be little houses built in all the new training camps for officers, and they are to be managed by women. They are to serve food, sandwiches and coffee, I think. They may be even more pretentious. I don't know, but I'll find out. I'll do anything, said Delight, and got up. It was then that Audrey realized that there was something more to the visit than had appeared, for Delight, ready to go, hesitated. "'There is something else, Mrs. Valentine,' she said rather slowly. "'What would you do if a young man wanted to go into the service and somebody held him back?' "'His own people?' "'His mother, and a girl.' "'I would think the army is well off without him.' Delight flushed painfully. Perhaps, she admitted, but is it right just to let it go at that? If you like people, it seems wrong just to stand by and let others ruin their lives for them. Only very weak men let women ruin their lives. 
but already she had begun to understand the situation. There's a weakness that is only a sort of habit. It may come from not wanting to hurt somebody. Delight was pulling nervously at her gloves. And there is this to be said, too. If there is what you call weakness, wouldn't the army be good for it? It makes men sometimes, doesn't it? For a sickening moment Audrey thought of Chris. War had made Chris, but it had killed him, too. "'Have you thought of one thing?' she asked. "'That in trying to make this young man, whoever it is, he may be hurt or even worse?' "'He would have to take his chance like the rest.' She went a little pale, however. Audrey impulsively put an arm around her. "'And this woman is the little long-legged girl who used to give signals to her father when the sermon was too long? Now, what can I do about this youth who can't make up his own mind?' You can talk to his mother. If I know his mother, and I think I do, it won't do the slightest good. Then his father. You are great friends, aren't you? Even this indirect mention of Clayton made Audrey's hands tremble. She put them behind her. We are very good friends, she said. But Delight was too engrossed to notice the deeper note in her voice. I'll see what I can do, but don't count on me too much. You spoke of a girl. I suppose I know who it is. Probably. It is Marion Hayden. He is engaged to her. And again Audrey marveled at her poise, for Delight's little tragedy was clear by that time. Clear and very sad. I can't imagine his really being in love with her. But he must be. They are engaged. Audrey smiled at the simple philosophy of nineteen, smiled and was extremely touched. How brave the child was! Audrey's own courageous heart rather swelled in admiration. But after Delight had gone, she felt depressed again, and very tired. How badly these things were handled! How strange it was that love so often brought suffering! Great loves were almost always great tragedies. Perhaps it was because love was never truly great until the element of sacrifice entered into it. Her own high courage failed her somewhat. During these recent days, when, struggling against very real stage fright, she made her husky, wholly earnest, but rather nervous little appeals to the crowds before the enlisting stations, she got along bravely enough during the day, but the night found her sad, unutterably depressed. At these times she was haunted by a fear that persisted against all her arguments. In Washington, Clayton had not looked well. He had been very tired and white, and some of his natural buoyancy seemed to have deserted him. He needed caring for, she would reflect bitterly. There should be someone to look after him. He was tired and anxious, but it took the eyes of love to see it. Natalie would never notice, and would consider it a grievance if she did. The fiercely maternal tenderness of the childless woman for the man she loves, kept her awake at night, staring into the darkness and visualizing terrible things. Clayton ill, and she unable to go to him. Ill, and wanting her, and unable to ask for her. She was, she knew, not quite normal, but the fear gripped her and held her. These big strong men, no one ever looked after them. They spent their lives caring for others, and were never cared for. There were times when a sort of exaltation of sacrifice kept her head high, when the things she was forced to give up seemed trifling compared with the men and boys who, some determinedly, some sheepishly, left the crowd around the borrowed car from which she spoke, and went into the recruiting station. There was sacrifice and sacrifice, and there was some comfort in the thought that both she and Clayton were putting the happiness of others above their own. They had both somehow, somewhere, missed the path, but they must never go back and try to find it. Delight's visit left her thoughtful. There must be some way to save Graham. She wondered how much of Clayton's weariness was due to Graham. And she wondered, too, if he knew of the talk about Natalie and Rodney Page. There was a great deal of talk. Somehow such talk cheapened his sacrifice and hers. Not that she believed it or much of it. She knew how little such gossip actually meant. Practically every woman she knew, herself included, 
had at one time or another laid herself open to such invidious comment. They had all been idle, and they sought amusement in such spurious affairs as this, harmless in the main, but taking on the appearance of evil. That was part of the game, to appear worse than one really was. The older the woman, the more eager she was often, in her clutch, at the vanishing romance of youth. Only, it was part of the game, too, to avoid scandal. A fierce pride for Clayton's name sent the colour to her face. On the evening after Delight's visit she had promised to speak at a recruiting station far downtown in a crowded tenement district, and tired as she was she took a bus and went down at seven o'clock. She was uneasy and nervous. She had not spoken in the evening before, and in all her sheltered life she had never seen the milling of a night crowd in a slum district. There was a wagon drawn up at the curb, and an earnest-eyed young clergyman was speaking. The crowd was attentive, mildly curious. The clergyman was emphatic, without being convincing. Audrey watched the faces about her, standing in the crowd herself, and a sense of the futility of it all gripped her. All these men, and only a feeble cheer, as a boy still in his teens, agreed to volunteer. All this effort for such scant result, and over on the other side such dire need. But one thing cheered her. Beside her, in the crowd, a portly elderly Jew was standing with his hat in his hand, and when a man near him made some jeering comment, the Jew brought his hand down on his shoulder. "'Be still and listen,' he said, "'or else go away and allow others to listen. This is our country which calls.' "'It's amusing, isn't it?' Audrey heard a woman's voice near her, carefully inflected, slightly affected. It's rather stunning, in a way. It's decorative, the white faces, and that chap in the wagon, and the gasoline torch. I'd enjoy it more if I'd had my dinner. The man laughed. You are a most brazen combination of the mundane and the spiritual, Natalie. You are all soul, after you are fed. Come on, it's near here. Audrey's hands were very cold. By the movement of the crowd behind her, she knew that Natalie and Rodney were making their escape toward food and a quiet talk in some obscure restaurant in the neighborhood. Fierce anger shook her. For this she and Clayton were giving up the only hope they had of happiness, that Natalie might carry on a cheap and stealthy flirtation. She made a magnificent appeal that night, and a very successful one. The lethargic crowd waked up and pressed forward. There were occasional cheers, and now and then the greater tribute of convinced silence and on a box in the wagon the young clergyman eyed her almost wistfully. What a woman she was! With such a woman a man could live up to the best in him. Then he remembered his salary in a mission church of twelve hundred a year, and sighed. He gained courage later on, and asked Audrey if she would have some coffee with him or something to eat. She looked tired. Tired, said Audrey. I am only tired these days when I am not working. You must not use yourself up. You are too valuable to the country. She was very grateful. After all, what else really mattered? In a little glow she accepted his invitation. Only coffee, she said. I have had dinner. Is there any place near? He piloted her through the crowd, now rapidly dispersing. Here and there some man, often in halting English, thanked her for what she had said. A woman slightly the worse for drink, but with friendly, rather humorous eyes, put a hand on her arm. "'You're all right, my dear,' she said. "'You're the stuff. Give it to them. I wish to God I could talk. I'd tell them something.' The clergyman drew her on hastily. In a small Italian restaurant, almost deserted, they found a table, and the clergyman ordered eggs and coffee. He was a trifle uneasy. In the wagon, Audrey's plain dark clothes had deceived him but the single pearl on her finger was very valuable. He fell to apologizing for the place. "'I often come here,' he explained. "'The food is good if you like Italian cooking, and it's near my work I—' But Audrey was not listening. At a corner, far back, Natalie and Rodney were sitting, engrossed in each other. Natalie's back was carefully turned to the room, but there was no mistaking her. 
Audrey wanted madly to get away, but the coffee had come and the young clergyman was talking gentle platitudes in a rather sweet but monotonous voice. Then Rodney saw her and bowed. Almost immediately afterward she heard the soft rustle that was Natalie, and found them both beside her. "'Can we run you uptown?' Natalie asked. "'That is, unless—' She glanced at the clergyman. "'Thank you, no, Natalie. I'm going to have some supper first. Natalie was uneasy. Audrey made no move to present the clergyman, whose name she did not know. Rodney was looking slightly bored. "'Odd little place, isn't it?' Natalie offered, after a second silence. "'Rather quaint, I think.' Natalie made a desperate effort to smooth over an awkward situation. She turned to the clergyman. "'We heard you speaking. It was quite thrilling.' He smiled a little. "'Not so thrilling as this lady. She carried the crowd absolutely.' Natalie turned and stared at Audrey, who was flushed with annoyance. "'You,' she said, "'do you mean to say you have been talking from that wagon? "'I haven't said it, but I have.' "'For heaven's sake!' Then she laughed and glanced at Rodney. "'Well, if you won't tell on me, I'll not tell on you.' And then, seeing Audrey straighten, "'I don't mean that, of course. Clay's at a meeting tonight, so I am having a holiday.' She moved on, always with the soft rustle, leaving behind her a delicate whiff of violets and a wide-eyed clergyman who stared after her admiringly. "'What a beautiful woman!' he said. There was a faint regret in his voice that Audrey had not presented him, and he did not see that her coffee-cup trembled as she lifted it to her lips. At ten o'clock the next morning Natalie called her on the phone. Natalie's morning voice was always languid, but there was a trace of pleading in it now. "'It's a lovely day,' she said. "'What are you doing?' "'I've been darning.' "'You? Darning?' "'I rather like it.' "'Heavens, how you've changed!' I suppose you wouldn't do anything so frivolous as to go out with me to the new house." Audrey hesitated. Evidently Natalie wanted to talk, to try to justify herself. But the feeling that she was the last woman in the world to be Natalie's father confessor was strong in her. On the other hand, there was the question of Graham. On that, before long, she and Natalie would have, in one of her own occasional lapses into slang, to go to the mat. I'll come, of course, if that's an invitation. I'll be around in an hour, then." Natalie was unusually prompt. She was nervous and excited, and was even more carefully dressed than usual. Over her dark blue velvet dress she wore a loose motorcoat, with a great chinchilla collar, but above it Audrey, who would have given a great deal to be able to hate her, found her rather pathetic, a little droop to her mouth dark circles which no veil could hide under her eyes. The car was in its customary resplendent condition. There were orchids in the flower-holder, and the footman, light rug over his arm, stood rigidly waiting at the door. "'What a tone you and your outfit do give my little street,' Audrey said, as they started. "'We have more milk-wagons than limousines, you know.' "'I don't see how you can bear it,' Audrey smiled. It's really rather nice, she said. For one thing, I haven't any bills. I never lived on a cash basis before. It's a sort of emancipation. Oh, bills, said Natalie, and waved her hands despairingly. If you could see my desk, and the way I watch the mail so Clay won't see them first. They really ought to send bills in black envelopes. But you have to give them to him eventually, don't you? I can choose my moment and it is never in the morning. He's rather awful in the morning." "'Awful? Oh, not ugly, just quiet. I hate a man who doesn't talk in the mornings. But then for months he hasn't really talked at all. That's why—' She was rather breathless. That's why I went out with Rodney last night. "'I don't think Clayton would mind if you told him first. It's your own affair, of course. But it doesn't seem quite fair to him.' "'Oh, of course you'd side with him. Women always side with the husband. I don't side with anyone, Audrey protested, but I am sure if he realized that you were lonely. Suddenly she realized that Natalie was crying. Not much, but enough to force her to dab her eyes carefully through her veil. 
"'I'm awfully unhappy, Audrey,' she said. "'Everything's wrong, and I don't know why. What have I done? I try and try, and things just get worse.' Audrey was very uncomfortable. She had a guilty feeling that the whole situation, with Natalie pouring out her woes beside her, was indelicate, unbearable. "'But if Clay,' she began, "'Clay! He's absolutely ungrateful. He takes me for granted, and the house for granted, everything. And if he knows I want a thing, he disapproves at once. I think sometimes he takes a vicious pleasure in thwarting me.' But as she did not go on, Audrey said nothing. Natalie had raised her veil, and from a gold vanity case was repairing the damages around her eyes. "'Why don't you find something to do, something to interest you?' Audrey suggested finally. But Natalie poured out a list of duties that lasted for the last three miles of the trip, ending with the new house. "'Even that has ceased to be a satisfaction,' she finished. "'Clayton wants to stop work on it and cut down all the estimates. It's too awful. First he told me to get anything I liked, and now he says to cut down to nothing. I could just shriek about it.' "'Perhaps that's because we are in the war now.' "'War or no war, we have to live, don't we?' and he thinks I ought to do without the extra man for the car, and the second man in the house, and heaven alone knows what. I'm at the end of my patience." Audrey made a resolution. After all, what mattered was that things should be more tolerable for Clayton. She turned to Natalie. "'Why don't you try to do what he wants, Natalie? He must have a reason for asking you, and it would please him a lot. If I start making concessions, I can just keep it up. He's like that. He's so awfully fine, Natalie. He's, well, he's rather big. And sometimes I think, if you just tried, he wouldn't be so hard to please. He probably wants peace and happiness." Happiness? Natalie's voice was high. That sounds like clay. Happiness? Don't you suppose I want to be happy? Not enough to work for it, said Audrey evenly. Natalie turned and stared at her. I believe you're half in love with clay yourself. Perhaps I am. But she smiled frankly into Natalie's eyes. I know if I were married to him, I'd try to do what he wanted. You'd try it for a year, then you'd give it up. It's one thing to admire a man. It's quite different being married to him and having to put up with all sorts of things. Her voice trailed off before the dark vision of her domestic unhappiness. And again, as with Graham and his father, it was what she did not say that counted. Audrey came close to hating her just then. So far the conversation had not touched on Graham, and now they were turning in the new drive. Already the lawns were showing green, and extensive plantings of shrubbery were putting out their pale new buds. Audrey, bending forward in the car, found it very lovely, and because it belonged to Clay, was to be his home, it thrilled her, just as the towering furnaces of his mill thrilled her the lines of men leaving at nightfall. It was his, therefore it was significant. The house amazed her. Even Natalie's enthusiasm had not promised anything so stately or so vast. Moving behind her through great empty rooms, to the sound of incessant hammering, over which Natalie's voice was raised shrilly, she was forced to confess that between them Natalie and Rodney had made a lovely thing. She felt no jealousy when she contrasted it with her own small apartment. She even felt that it was the sort of house Clayton should have. For although it had been designed as a setting for Natalie, although every colour scheme, almost every chair, had been bought with a view to forming a background for her, it was too big, too massive. It dwarfed her. Out of doors, Audrey lost that feeling. In the formal garden, Natalie was charmingly framed. It was like her, beautifully exact, carefully planned, already with its spring borders faintly glowing. Natalie cheered in her approval. "'You're so comforting,' she said. "'Clay thinks it isn't homelike. He says it's a show-place, which it ought to be. It costs enough, and he hates show-places. He really ought to have a cottage. Now let's see the swimming-pool.' But at the pool she lost her gaiety. The cement basin, still empty, gleamed white in the sun, and Natalie, suddenly brooding, stood beside it, glaring absently into it. "'It was for Graham,' she said at last. "'We were going to have weekend parties and all sorts of young people, but now—' 
What about now? Natalie raised her tragic eyes. He's probably going into the army. He'd never have thought of it, but Clayton shows in every possible way that he thinks he ought to go. What is the boy to do? His father driving him to what may be his death? I don't think he'd do that, Natalie. Natalie laughed, her little mirthless laugh. Much you know what his father would do. I'll tell you this, Audrey. If Graham goes and anything happens to him, I'll never forgive Clay. Never. Audrey had not suspected such depths of feeling as Natalie's eyes showed under their penciled brows. They were desperate, vindictive eyes. Suddenly Natalie was pleading with her. You'll talk to Clay, won't you? He'll listen to you. He has a lot of respect for your opinion. I want you to go to him, Audrey. I brought you here to ask you. I'm almost out of my mind. Why do you suppose I play around with Rodney? I've got to forget, that's all. And I've tried everything I know and failed. He'll go, and I'll lose him, and if I do, it will kill me. It doesn't follow that because he goes, he won't come back. He'll be in danger. I shall be worrying about him every moment. She threw out her hands in what was as unrestrained a gesture as she ever made. "'Look at me!' she cried. "'I'm getting old under it. I have lines about my eyes already. I hate to look at myself in the morning, and I'm not old. I ought to be at my best now.' Natalie's anxiety was for Graham, but her pity was for herself. Audrey's heart hardened. "'I'm sorry,' she said. "'I can't go to Clay. I feel as I think he does.' If Graham wants to go, he should be free to do it. You're only hurting him, and your influence on him by holding him back. You've never had a child. If I had and he wanted to go, I should be terrified, but I should be proud. You and Clay, you even talk alike. It's all a pose, this exalted attitude. Even this war is a pose. It's a national attitude we've struck, a great nation going to rescue humanity, while the rest of the world looks on and applauds. It makes me ill. She turned and went back to the house, leaving Audrey by the swimming pool. She sat on the edge of one of the stone benches, feeling utterly dreary and sad. To make a sacrifice for a worthy object was one thing. To throw away a life's happiness for a spoiled, petulant woman was another. It was too high a price to pay. Mingled with her depression was pity for Clayton, for all the years that he had lived with this woman, and pride in him that he had never betrayed his disillusion. After a time she saw the car waiting, and she went slowly back to the house. Natalie was already inside, and she made no apologies whatever. The drive back was difficult. Natalie openly sulked, replied in monosyllables, made no effort herself until they were in the city again. Then she said, I'm sorry I asked you to speak to Clay. Of course you needn't do it. Not if it is to do what you said. But I wish you wouldn't misunderstand me, Natalie. I'm awfully sorry. We just think differently. We certainly do, said Natalie briefly, and that was her good-bye. End of chapter 36。Chapter 37 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When Clayton had returned from Washington, one of the first problems put up to him had been Herman Klein's application to be taken on again. He found Hutchinson in favor of it. He doesn't say much, he said. Never did, but I gather things are changed. Now we are in the war ourselves. I suppose we need him. You bet we need him. For the problem of skilled labor was already a grave one. Clayton was doubtful. If he could have conferred with Dunbar, he would have felt more comfortable, but Dunbar was away on some mysterious errand connected with the military intelligence department. He sat considering tapping on his desk with the handle of his pen. Of course things were different now. A good many Germans whose sympathies had, as between the Fatherland and the Allies, been with Germany, were now driven to a decision between the land they had left and the land they had adopted. And behind Hermann there were thirty years of good record. Where's the daughter? I don't know. She left some weeks ago. It's talk around the plant that he beat her up and she got out. Those Germans don't know the first thing about how to treat women. Then she is not in Weaver's office? 
There was more talk in the offices than Hutchinson repeated. Graham's fondness for Anna, her slavish devotion to him, had been pretty well recognized. He wondered if Clayton knew anything about it, or the further gossip that Graham knew where Anna Klein had been hiding. What about Rudolph Klein? He was a nephew, wasn't he? Fired, said Hutchinson laconically. Got the spreading the brotherhood of the world idea. Sweat brothers, he calls them. But he was mighty careful never to get in a perspiration himself. We might try Herman again, but I'd keep an eye on him. So Herman was taken on at the new munition plant. He was a citizen, he owned property, he had a record of long service behind him. And at first he was minded to preserve that record intact. While he had by now added to his range against the fatherland's enemies a vast and sullen fury against invested capital, his German caution still remained. He would sit through fiery denunciations of wealth, nodding his head slowly in agreement. He was perfectly aware that in Gus's little back room dark plots were hatched. Indeed, on a certain April night Rudolph had come up and called him onto the porch. "'In about fifteen minutes,' he said, consulting his watch in the doorway, "'I'm going to show you something pretty.' And in fifteen minutes to the dot the great railroad warehouses near the city wharf had burst into flames. Herman had watched without comment, while Rudolph talked incessantly, boasting of his share in the enterprise. "'About a million dollars' worth of fireworks there,' he said, as the glare dyed their faces red. "'All stuff for the Allies,' and he boasted. "'When the cat sits on the pick-handle, brass buttons must go.' By that time Herman knew that the cat meant sabotage. He had nodded slowly. But it is dangerous, was his later comment. Sometimes they will learn, and then? His caution had exasperated Rudolph almost to frenzy. And as time went on, and one man after another of the organization was ferreted out at the new plant and dismissed, the sole remaining hope of the organization was Herman. With his reinstatement their hopes had risen again, but to every suggestion so far he had been deaf. He would listen approvingly, but at the end, when he found the talk veering his way, and a circle of intent faces watching him, he would say, "'It is too dangerous, and it is a young man's work. I am not young.' Then he would pay his score, but never by any chance Rudolph's or the others, and go home to his empty house. But recently the plant had gone on double turn, and Herman was soon to go on at night. Here was the gang's opportunity. Everything was ready but Herman himself. He continued interested, but impersonal. For the sake of the fatherland, he was willing to have the plant go and to lose his work. He was not at all daunted by the thought of the deaths that would follow. That was war. Anything that killed and destroyed was fair in war. But he did not care to place himself in danger. Let those young hotheads do the work. Rudolph, watching him, bided his time. The ground was ploughed and harrowed, ready for the seed, and Rudolph had only to find the seed. The night he had carried Anna into the cottage on the hill, he had found it. Herman had not beaten Anna. Rudolph had carried her up to her bed, and Herman, following slowly, strap in hand, had been confronted by the younger man in the doorway of the room where Anna lay, conscious but unmoving on the bed. "'You can use that thing later,' Rudolph said. "'She's sick now. Better let her alone.' "'I will teach her to run away,' Herman muttered thickly. "'She left me, her father, and threw away a good job. I—' "'You come downstairs. I've something to say to you.' And after a time Herman had followed him down, but he still clung doggedly to the strap. Rudolph led the way outside, and here in the darkness he told Anna's story— twisted and distorted through his own warped mind, but convincing and partially true. Herman's silence began to alarm him, however, and when at last he rose and made for the door, Rudolph was before him. "'What are you going to do?' Herman said nothing, but he raised the strap and held it menacingly. "'Get out of my way.' "'Don't be a fool,' Rudolph entreated. "'You can beat her to death, and what do you get out of it? She'll run away again if you touch her.' Put that strap down. I'm not afraid of you." Their voices, raised and angry, 
penetrated through Anna's haze of fright and faintness. She sat up in the bed, ready to spring to the window if she heard steps on the stairs. When none came but the voices, lowered now, went on endlessly below, she slipped out of her bed and crept to the doorway. Sounds travelled clearly up the narrow enclosed stairway. She stood there, swaying slightly, until at last her legs would no longer support her. She crouched on the floor, a hand clutching her throat lest she scream, and listened. She did not sleep at all. The night had been too full of horrors, and she was too ill to attempt a second flight. Besides, where could she go? Katie was not there. She could see her empty little room across, with its cot bed and tawdry dresser. Before, too, she had had Graham's protection to count on. Now she had nothing. And the voices went on. When she went back to bed it was almost dawn. She heard Herman come up, heard the heavy thump of his shoes on the floor, and the creak immediately following that showed he had lain down without undressing. By the absence of his resonant snoring she knew he was not sleeping either. She pictured him lying there, his eyes on the door, in almost unwinking espionage. At half-past six she got up and went downstairs. Almost immediately she heard his stockinged feet behind her. She turned and looked up at him. "'What are you going to do?' "'Going to make myself some coffee.' He came down and sat down in the sitting-room. From where he sat he could survey the kitchen, and she knew his eyes were on her. His very quiet terrified her, but although the strap lay on the table he made no move toward it. She built a fire and put on the kettle, and after a time she brought him some coffee and some bread. He took it without a word. Sick as she was, she fell to cleaning up the dirty kitchen. She went outside for a pail, to find him behind her in the doorway. Then she knew what he intended to do. He was afraid, for some reason, to beat her again, but he was going to watch her lest again she make her escape. The silence, under his heavy gaze, was intolerable. All day she worked, and only once did Herman lose sight of her. That was when he took a ladder, and outside the house nailed all the upper windows shut. He did it with German thoroughness, hammering deliberately, placing his nails carefully. After that he went to the corner grocery, but before he went he spoke the first words of the day. "'You will go to your room.' She went, and he locked her in. She knew then that she was a prisoner. When he was at the mill at night, while he slept during the day, she was to be locked up in her stuffy, airless room. When he was about, she would do the housework, always under his silent, contemptuous gaze. She made one appeal to him, and only one, and that was to his cupidity. "'I've been sick, but I'm able to work now, father.' He paid no attention to her. "'If you lock me up and don't let me work,' she persisted, You'll only be cutting off your nose to spite your face. I make good money, and you know it." She thought he was going to speak, but he did not. She put his food on the table, and he ate gluttonously, as he always did. She did not sit down. She drank a little coffee, standing at the stove, and watched the back of his head with hate in her eyes. He could eat like that, when he stood committed to a terrible thing? It was not until late in the day that it began to dawn on her how she was responsible. She was getting stronger then, and more able to think. She followed as best she could the events of the last months, and she saw that as surely as though a malevolent power had arranged it, the thing was the result of her infatuation for Graham. She was in despair, and she began to plan how to get word to Graham of what was impending. She scrawled a note to Graham, telling him where she was, and to try to get in touch with her somehow. If he would come around four o'clock, Herman was generally up and off to the grocer's, or to Gus's saloon for his afternoon beer. "'I'll break a window and talk to you,' she wrote. "'I'm locked in when he's out. My window is on the north side. Don't lose any time. There's something terrible going to happen.' But several days went by, and the postman did not appear. Herman had put a padlock in the outside of her bedroom door and her hope of finding a second key to fit the door-lock died then. It had become a silent, bitter contest between the two of them, with two advantages in favour of the girl. 
She was more intelligent than Herman, and she knew the thing he was planning to do. She made a careful survey of her room, and she saw that with a screwdriver she could unfasten the hinge of her bedroom door. Herman, however, always kept his tools locked up. She managed, apparently by accident, to break the point off a knife, and when she went up to her room one afternoon to be locked in, while Herman went to Gus's saloon, she carried the knife in her stocking. It was a sorry tool, however. Driven by her shaking hand, there was a time when she almost despaired, and time was flying. The postman, when he came, came at five, and she heard the kitchen clock strike five before the first screw fell out into her hand. She got them all out finally, and the door hung crazily, held only by the padlock. She ran to the window. The postman was coming along the street, and she hammered madly at the glass. When he saw her, he turned in at the gate, and she got her letter and ran down the stairs. She heard his step on the porch outside and called to him. "'Is that you, Briggs?' The postman was Briggs to the hill. "'Yes.' If I slide a letter out under the door, will you take it to the post office for me? It's important. All right. Slide. She had put it partially under the door when a doubt crept into her mind. That was not Briggs's voice. She made a frantic effort to draw the letter back, but stronger fingers than hers had it beyond the door. She clutched, held tight. Then she heard a chuckle, and found herself with a corner of the envelope in her hand. There were voices outside, Briggs's and Rudolph's. "'Guess that's for me.' "'Like hell it is.' She ran madly up the stairs again, and tried with shaking fingers to screw the door hinges into place again. She fully expected that they would kill her. She heard Briggs go out, and after a time she heard Rudolph trying to kick in the house door. Then, when the last screw was back in place, she heard Herman's heavy step outside, and Rudolph's voice, high, furious, and insistent. Had Herman not been obsessed with the thing he was to do, he might have beaten her to death that night. But he did not. She remained in her room without food or water. She had made up her mind to kill herself with the knife if they came up after her, but the only sounds she heard were of high voices growing lower and more sinister. After that, for days she was a prisoner. Herman moved his bed downstairs and slept in the sitting-room, the five or six hours of daylight sleep which were all he required. And at night, while he was at the mill, Rudolph sat and dozed and kept watch below. Twice a day some meagre provisions were left at the top of the stairs, and her door was unlocked. She would creep out and get them, not because she was hungry, but because she meant to keep up her strength. Let their vigilance slip but once, and she meant to be ready. She learned to interpret every sound below. There were times when the fumes from burning food came up the staircase and almost smothered her. And there were times, she fancied, when Herman weakened and Rudolph talked for hours, inciting and inflaming him again. She gathered, too, that Gus's place was under surveillance, and more than once in the middle of the night stealthy figures came in by the garden gate and conferred with Rudolph downstairs. Then, one evening, in the dusk of the May twilight, she saw three of them come, one rather tall and military of figure, and one of them carried, very carefully, a cheap suitcase. She knew what was in that suitcase. End of chapter 37「Chapter 38 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One morning, in his mail, Clayton Spencer received a clipping. It had been cut from a so-called society journal, and it was clamped to the prospectus of a firm of private detectives who gave information for divorce cases as their specialty. First curiously, then with mounting anger, Clayton read that the wife of a prominent munition manufacturer was being seen constantly in out-of-the-way places with the young architect who was building a palace for her out of the profiteer's new wealth. It is quite probable, ended the notice, that the episode will end in an explosion louder than the best shell the husband in the case ever turned out. Clayton did not believe the thing for a moment. 
He was infuriated, but mostly with the journal, and with the insulting inference of the prospectus. He had a momentary clear vision, however, of Natalie, of her idle days, of perhaps a futile last clutch at youth. He had no more doubt of her essential integrity than of his own, but he had a very distinct feeling that she had exposed his name to cheap scandal, and that for nothing. Had there been anything real behind it, he might have understood, in his new humility, in his new knowledge of impulses stronger than any restraints of society, he would quite certainly have made every allowance, but for a whim, an indulgence of her incorrigible vanity. To get along, to save Natalie herself, he was stifling the best that was in him, while Natalie— That was one view of it. The other was that Natalie was as starved as he was. If he got nothing from her, he gave her nothing. How was he to blame her? She was straying along dangerous paths, but he himself had stood at the edge of the precipice and looked down. Suddenly it occurred to him that perhaps for once Natalie was in earnest. Perhaps Rodney was, too. Perhaps each of them had at last found something that loomed larger than themselves. In that case? But everything he knew of Natalie contradicted that. She was not a woman to count anything well lost for love. She was playing with his honour, with Rodney, with her own vanity. Going up town that night he pondered the question of how to take up the matter with her. It would be absurd, under the circumstances, to take any virtuous attitude. He was still undetermined when he reached the house. He found Marion Hayden there for dinner, and Graham, and a spirited three-cornered discussion going on which ceased when he stood in the doorway. Natalie looked irritated, Graham determined, and Marion was slightly insolent and unusually handsome. "'Hurry and change, Clay,' Natalie said. "'Dinner is waiting.' As he went away, he had again the feeling of being shut out of something which concerned Graham. Dinner was difficult. Natalie was obviously sulking, and Graham was rather taciturn. It was Marion who kept the conversation going, and he surmised in her a repressed excitement, a certain triumph. At last Natalie roused herself. The meal was almost over, and the servants had withdrawn. "'I wish you would talk sense to Graham, Clay.' she said fretfully, I think he has gone mad. I don't call it going mad to want to enlist, father. I do, with your father needing you, and with all the men there are who can go. I don't understand. If he wants to enter the army, that's up to him, isn't it? There was a brief silence. Clayton found Natalie's eyes on him, uneasy, resentful. That's just it. I promised mother not to unless she gives her consent, and she won't give it. I certainly will not. Clayton saw her appealing glance at Marion, but that young lady was lighting a cigarette, her eyelids lowered. He felt as though he were watching a play in which he was the audience. It's rather a family affair, isn't it? he asked. Suppose we wait until we are alone. After all, there is no hurry. Marion looked at him, and he caught a resentment in her glance. The two glances struck fire. "'Say something, Marion,' Natalie implored her. "'I don't think my opinion is of any particular importance. As Mr. Spencer says, it is really a family matter.' Her insolence was gone. Marion was easy. She knew Natalie's game. It was like her own. But this big, square-jawed man at the head of the table frightened her. And he hated her. He hardly troubled to hide it for all his civility. Even that civility was contemptuous.' In the drawing-room things were a little better. Natalie had counted on Marion's cooperation, and she had failed her. She pleaded a headache and went upstairs, leaving Clayton to play the host as best he could. Marion wandered into the music-room with its bare polished floor, its lovely painted piano, and played a little, gay, charming little things, clever and artful. Except when visitors came, the piano was never touched but now and then Clayton had visualized Audrey there, singing in her husky sweet voice her little French songs. Graham moved restlessly about the room, and Clayton felt that he had altered lately. He looked older and not happy. He knew the boy wanted to talk about Natalie's opposition, but was hoping that he would broach the subject. And Clayton rather grimly refused to do it. 
Those next weeks would show how much of the man there was in Graham, but the struggle must be between his mother and himself. He paused finally. Marion was singing. Give me your love for a day, a night, an hour. If the wages of sin are death, I'm willing to pay. She sang it in her clear, passionless voice. Brave words, Clayton thought, but there were few who would pay such wages. This girl at the piano, what did she know about the thing she sang about? What did any of the young know? They always construed love in terms of passion. But passion was ephemeral. Love lived on. Passion took, but love gave. He roused himself. Have you told Marion about the new arrangement? I didn't know whether you cared to have it told. Don't you think she ought to know? If she intends to enter the family, she has a right to know that she is not marrying into great wealth. I don't suggest, he added, as Graham colored hotly, that it will make any difference. I merely feel she ought to know your circumstances. He was called to the telephone, and when he came back he found them in earnest conversation. The girl turned toward him, smiling. Graham has just told me. You are splendid, Mr. Spencer and afterward Clayton was forced to admit an element of sincerity in her voice. She had had a disappointment, but she was very game. Her admiration surprised him. He was nearer to liking her than he had ever been. Even her succeeding words did not quite kill his admiration for her. And I have told Graham that he must not let you make all the sacrifices. Of course he is going to enlist. She had turned her defeat into a triumph against Natalie. Clayton knew then that she would never marry Graham. As she went out, he followed her with a faint smile of tribute. The smile died as he turned to go up the stairs. Natalie was in her dressing-room. She had not undressed, but was standing by a window. She made no sign that she heard him enter, and he hesitated. Why try to talk things out with her? Why hurt her? Why not let things drift along? There was no hope of bettering them. One of two things he must do either tear open the situation between them, or ignore it. "'Can I get anything for your head, my dear?' "'I haven't any headache.' "'Then I think I'll go to bed. I didn't sleep much last night.' He was going out when she spoke again. "'I came upstairs because I saw how things were going. Do you really want to go into that to-night?' "'Why not to-night? We'll have to go into it soon enough.' Yet when she turned to him, he saw the real distress in her face, and his anger died. "'I didn't want to hurt you, Natalie. I honestly tried. But you know how I feel about that girl.' "'Even the servants know it. It is quite evident.' "'We parted quite amiably.' "'I dare say. You were relieved that she was going. If you would only be ordinarily civil to her. Oh, don't you see? She could keep Graham from going into this idiotic war. You can't. I can't. I've tried everything I know, and she knows she can. She's hateful about it. And you would marry him to that sort of a girl? I'd keep him from being blinded or mutilated or being killed. You can kill his soul. His soul? She burst into hysterical laughter. You to talk about souls. That's, that's funny. Natalie, dear. He was very grave, very gentle. Has it occurred to you that we are hitting it off rather badly lately? She looked at him quickly. How? Because I don't think as you do. We got on well enough before this war came along. Do you think it is only that? If it's the house, just remember you gave me carte blanche there. He made a little gesture of despair. I just thought perhaps you are not as happy as you might be. Happiness again! Did you come upstairs tonight with this thing hanging over us to talk about happiness? That's funny, too. But her eyes were suddenly suspicious. There was something strange in his voice. Let's forget that for a moment. Graham will make his own decision. But before we leave that, let me tell you that I love him as much as you do. His going means exactly as much. It's only— Another point we differ on, she finished for him. Go on. You are suddenly concerned about my happiness. I'm touched, Clay. You have left me all winter to go out alone, or with anybody who might be sorry enough for me to pick me up, and now—" Suddenly her eyes sharpened, and she drew her breath quickly. 
You've seen that scandalous thing in the paper. It was sent to me. Who sent it? A firm of private detectives. She was frightened, and the terror in her face brought him to her quickly. Natalie, don't look like that. I don't believe it. Of course, it's stupid. I wasn't going to tell you. You don't think I believe it, do you? She let him put an arm around her and hold her, as he would a scared child. There was no love for her in it, but a great pity, an acute remorse that he could hold her so, and care for her so little. Oh, Clay, she gasped, I've been perfectly sick about it. His conviction of his own failure to her made him very tender. He talked to her, as she stood with her face buried in the shoulder of his coat, of the absurdity of her fear, of his own understanding, and when she was calmer he made a futile effort to make his position clear. "'I'm not angry,' he said, "'and I'm not fudging you in any way. But you know how things are between us. We have been drifting apart for rather a long time. It's not your fault. Perhaps it is mine. Probably it is. I know I don't make you happy. And sometimes I think things have either got to be better or worse. If I'm willing to go along as we are, I think you should be. Then let's try to get a little happiness out of it all, Natalie. Oh, happiness! You are always raving about happiness. There isn't any such thing. Peace, then. Let's have peace, Natalie. She drew back, regarding him. What did you mean by things having to be better or worse? When he found no immediate answer, she was uneasy. The prospect of any change in their relationship frightened her. Like all weak women, she was afraid of change. Her life suited her. Even her misery she loved and fed on. She had pitied herself, always. Not love, but fear of change, lay behind her shallow, anxious eyes. Yet he could not hurt her. She had been foolish, but she had not been wicked. In his new humility he found her infinitely better than himself. I spoke without thinking. Then it must have been in your mind. Let me see the clipping, Clay. I've tried to forget what it said. She took it, still pinned to the prospectus, and bent over them both. When she had examined them, she continued to stand with lowered eyelids, turning and crumpling them. Then she looked up. So that is what you meant. It was a, well, a sort of a threat. I had no intention of threatening you, my dear. You ought to know me better. That clipping was sent me attached to the slip. The only reason I let you see it was because I think you ought to know how the most innocent things are misconstrued. You couldn't divorce me if you wanted to. Then her defiance faded in a weak terror. She began to cry, shameless, frightened tears that rolled down her cheeks. She reminded him that she was the mother of his child, that she had sacrificed her life to both of them, and that now they would both leave her and turn her adrift. She had served her purpose, now let her go. Utter hopelessness kept him dumb. He knew of old that she would cry until she was ready to stop, or until she had gained her point, and he knew, too, that she expected him to put his arms around her again, in token of his complete surrender. The very fact hardened him. He did not want to put his arms around her. He wanted, indeed, to get out into the open air and walk off his exasperation. The scent in the room stifled him. When he made no move toward her, she gradually stopped crying, and gave way to the rage that was often behind her tears. Just try to divorce me and see. Good God, I haven't even mentioned divorce. I only said we must try to get along better, to agree. Which means, I dare say, that I am to agree with you. But she had one weapon still. Suddenly she smiled a little wistfully, and made the apparently complete surrender that always disarmed him. I'll be good from now on, Clay. I'll be very, very good. Only don't be always criticizing me. She held up her lips, and after a second's hesitation he kissed her. He knew he was precisely where he had been when he started, and he had a hopeless sense of the futility of the effort he had made. Natalie had got by with a bad half-hour, and would proceed to forget it as quickly as she always forgot anything disagreeable. Still, she was in a more receptive mood than usual, 
and he wondered if that would not be as good a time as any to speak about his new plan as to the mill. He took an uneasy turn or two about the room, feeling her eyes on him. "'There is something else, Natalie.' She had relaxed like a kitten in her big chair, and was lighting one of the small, gilt-tipped cigarettes she affected. "'About Graham?' "'It affects Graham. It affects us all.' "'Yes?' He hesitated. To talk to Natalie about business meant reducing it to its most elemental form. "'Have you ever thought that this war of ours means more than merely raising armies?' I haven't thought about this war at all. It's too absurd. A lot of politicians. She shrugged her shoulders. It means a great deal of money. Well, the country is rich, isn't it? The country? That means the people. I knew we'd get down to money sooner or later, she observed, resignedly. All right. We'll be taxed, so we'll cut down on the country house. Go on. I can say it before you do. But don't say we'll have to do without the greenhouses, because we can't. We may have to go without more than greenhouses. His tone made her sit bolt upright. Then she laughed a little. Poor old Clay, she said, with the caressing tone she used when she meant to make no concession. I do spend money, don't I? But I do make you comfortable, you know. And what is what I spend, compared with what you are making? It's just that. I don't think I can consistently go on making a profit on this war now that we are in it." He explained then what he meant, and watched her face into the hard lines he knew so well. But she listened to the end, and when he had finished she said nothing. "'Well?' he said. "'I don't think you have the remotest idea of doing it. You like to play at the heroic. You can see yourself doing it, and everyone pointing to you as the man who threw away a fortune. But you are humbugging yourself. You'll never do it. I give you credit for too much sense." He went rather white. She knew the weakness in his armour, his hatred of anything theatrical, and with unfailing accuracy she always pierced it. "'Suppose I tell you I have already offered the plant to the government, at a nominal profit.' Suddenly she got up, and every vestige of softness was gone. "'I don't think you would be such a fool.' "'I have done it. Then you are insane. There is no other possible explanation." She passed him, moving swiftly, and went into her bedroom. He heard her lock the door behind her. End of chapter 38「Chapter 39 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Audrey had made a resolution and with characteristic energy had proceeded to carry it out. She was no longer needed at the recruiting stations. After a month's debate the conscription law was about to be passed, made certain by the frank statement of the British Commission under Balfour as to the urgency of the need of a vast new army in France. For the first time the Allies laid their cards face up on the table, and America realized to what she was committed. Almost overnight a potential army of hundreds of thousands was changing to one of millions. The situation was desperate. Germany had more men than the Allies, and had vast eastern resources to draw on for still more. To the Allies only the untapped resources of America remained. In private conference with the President, Mr. Balfour had urged haste, and yet more haste. Audrey, reading her newspapers faithfully, felt with her exaltation a little stirring of regret. Her occupation, such as it was, was gone. For the thin stream of men flowing toward the recruiting stations, there was now to be a vast movement of the young manhood of the nation, and she could have no place in it. Almost immediately she set to work to find herself a new place. At first there seemed to be none. She went to a hospital and offered her strong body and her two willing hands for training. I could learn quickly, she pleaded, and surely there will not be enough nurses for such an army as we are to have. Our regular course is three years. But a special course, surely I may have that. There are so many things one won't need in France. The head of the training school smiled rather wistfully. They came to her so often now, these intelligent, untrained women, 
all eagerness to help, to forget and unlive, if they could, their wasted lives. You want to go to France, of course? If I can, my husband was killed over there. But she did not intend to make capital of Chris's death. Of course that has nothing to do with my going. I simply want to work. It's hard work, not romantic. I am not looking for romance. In the end, however, she had to give it up. In some hospitals they were already training nurses' helpers, but they were to relieve trained women for France. She went home to think it over. She had felt that by leaving the country she would solve Clayton's problem and her own. To stay on, seeing him now and then, was torture for them both. But there was something else. She had begun that afternoon to doubt whether she was fitted for nursing after all. The quiet of the hospital, the all-pervading odour of drugs, the subdued voice and quiet eyes of the head of the training school, as of one who had looked on life and found it infinitely sad, depressed her. She had walked home, impatient with herself, disappointed in her own failure. She thought dismally, I am of no earthly use. I've played all my life, and now I'm paying for it. I ought to. And she ran over her pitiful accomplishments. Golf, bridge, ride, shoot, swim, sing, a little, dance, tennis, some French. What a sickening list! She was glad that day to find Claire Gould waiting for her. As usual, the girl had brought her tribute, this time some early strawberries. Audrey found her in the pantry arranging their leaves in a shallow dish. Claire, she said, aren't you working? I've gone on night turn now. The girl's admiration salved her wounded pride in herself. Then she saw on a table an envelope with her name on it. Claire's eyes followed hers. That's the rest of the money, Mrs. Valentine. She colored, but Audrey only smiled at her. Fine, she said. Are you sure you can spare it? I couldn't rest until it was all paid up, and I'm getting along fine. I make a lot, really. Tell me about the night work. We've gone on double turn. I rather like it at night. It's, well, it's like something on the stage. The sparks fly from the lathes, and they look like fireworks, and when they hammer on hot metal it's lovely. She talked on, incoherent but glowing. She liked her big turret lathe. It gave her a sense of power. She liked to see the rough metal growing smooth and shining like silver under her hands. She was naively pleased that she was doing a man's work and doing it well. Audrey leaned back in her chair and listened. All this that Claire was talking about was Clayton's doing. He, at least, had dreamed true. He was doing a man's part, too, in the war. Even this girl, whose hand Natalie Spencer would not have touched, this girl was dreaming true. Claire was still talking. The draft would be hard on the plant. They were short-handed now. There was talk of taking in more girls to replace the men who would be called. Do you think I could operate a lathe, Claire? You? Why, Mrs. Valentine, it's not work for a lady. Look at my hands. But Audrey made an impatient gesture. I don't care about my hands. The question is, could I do it? I don't seem to be able to do anything else. Why, yes, Claire was reluctant. I can, and you're a lot cleverer than I am. But it's hard, it's rough, and some of the talk— Oh, I hope you don't mean it, Mrs. Valentine. Audrey, however, was meaning it. It seemed to her all at once the way out. Here was work, needed work, work that she could do. For the first time in months she blessed the golf and riding that had kept her fit. Mr. Spencer is a friend of yours. He'll never let you do it. He is not to know, Claire, Audrey said briskly. You are quite right. He would probably be very mannish about it. So we won't tell him. And now, how shall I go about getting in? Will they teach me? Or shall I have to just learn? And whatever shall I wear? Claire explained while, for she was determined not to lose a minute, Audrey changed into her plainest clothes. They would be in time if they hurried before the employment department closed. There were women in charge there. They card-indexed you, and then you were investigated by the Secret Service, and if you were all right, well, that was all. "'Mercy, it's enough,' said Audrey impatiently. "'Do you mean to say they'll come here?' She glanced around her rooms, 
littered with photographs of people well known to the public through the society journals, with its high bright silver vases, its odd gifts of porcelain, its grand piano taking up more than its share of the room. If they come here, she deliberated, they won't take me, Claire. They'll be thinking I'm living on German money. So, in the end, she did not go to the munition works. She went room hunting instead, with Claire beside her, very uncomfortable on the street for fear Audrey would be compromised by walking with her. And at six o'clock that evening, a young woman with a softly inflected voice and an air of almost humorous enjoyment of something the landlady failed to grasp, was the tenant, for one month's rent in advance, of a room on South Perry Street. Claire was almost in tears. "'I can't bear to think of your sleeping in that bed, Mrs. Valentine,' she protested. "'It dips down so. I shan't have much time to sleep anyhow, and when I do I shall be so tired. What is the name I gave her, Claire?' "'Thompson. Mary Thompson. She surprised me, or I'd have thought of a prettier one.' She was absurdly high-spirited, although the next day's ordeal rather worried her when she thought about it. She had, oddly enough, no trepidation about the work itself. It was passing the detectives in the employment department that worried her. As a matter of fact, however, there was no ordeal. Her card was carried to the desk in the corner, where the two men sat, on whose decisions might so easily rest the safety of the entire plant, and they surveyed her carefully. Audrey looked ahead and waited. They would come over and question her, and the whole fabric she had built would be destroyed. But nothing happened. She was told she would be notified in a day or two if she would be taken on, and with that she was forced to be content. She had a bad moment, however, for Graham came through the office on his way out, and stopped for a moment directly in front of her. Her heart almost stopped beating, and she dropped her glove and stooped to pick it up. When she sat erect again, he was moving on, but even her brief glance had showed her that the boy looked tired and depressed. She went to her rented room at once, for she must be prepared for inquiries about her. During the interval she arranged for the closing of her apartment and the storing of her furniture. With their going would depart the last reminders of the old life, and she felt a curious sense of relief. They had little happiness to remind her of, and much suffering. The world had changed since she had gathered them together, and she had changed with it. She was older and sadder. But she would not have gone back. Not for anything would she have gone back. She had one thing to do, however, before she disappeared. She had promised to try to find something for delight, and she did it with her usual thoroughness and dispatch. She sent for her that last day in the apartment when in the morning she had found at the Perry Street room a card telling her to report the following night. When Delight came in, she found the little apartment rather bare and rather dreary, but Audrey was cheerful, almost gay. "'Going away for a little while,' she explained. "'I've stored a lot of stuff. And now, my dear, do you really want to work? I just must do something.' "'All right, that's settled.' I've got the thing I spoke about in one of the officers' training camps. But remember, Delight, this is not going to be a romantic adventure. It's to be work. I don't want a romantic adventure, Mrs. Valentine. Poor little thing, Audrey reflected to herself, and aloud. Good. Of course I know you're sincere about working. I, I understand awfully well. Delight was pleased, but Audrey saw that she was not happy. Even when the details had been arranged, she still sat in her straight chair, and made no move to go. And Audrey felt that the next move was up to her. "'What's the news about Graham Spencer?' she inquired. "'He'll be drafted, I suppose.' "'Not if they claim exemption. He's making shells, you know.' She lifted rather heavy eyes to Audrey's. "'His mother is trying that now,' she said, ever since his engagement was broken. "'Oh, it was broken, was it?' Yes, I don't know why, but it's off. Anyhow, Mrs. Spencer is telling everybody he can't be spared. And his father? I don't know. He doesn't talk about it, I think. Perhaps he wants him to make his own decision. Delight rose and drew down her veil with hands that Audrey saw were trembling a little. How could he make his own decision? she asked, 
He may think it's his own, but it's hers, Mrs. Spencer's. She's always talking, always. And she's plausible. She can make him think black is white if she wants to. Why don't you talk to him? I? He'd think I'd lost my mind. Besides, that isn't it. If you like a man, you want him to do the right thing because he wants to, not because a girl asks him to. I wonder, Audrey said slowly, if he's worth it, Delight. Worth what? She was startled. Worth your, worth our worrying about him. But she did not need Delight's hasty and flushed championship of Graham to tell her what she already knew. After she had gone, Audrey sat alone in her empty rooms and faced a great temptation. She was taking herself out of Clayton's life. She knew that she would be as lost to him among the thousands of workers in the munition plant as she would have been in Russia. According to Clare, he rarely went into the shops themselves, and never at night. Of course, out of his life was a phrase. They would meet again. But not now, not until they had had time to become resigned to what they had already accepted. The war would not last for ever. And then she thought of their love, which had been born and had grown, always with war at its background. They had gone along well enough until this winter, and then everything had changed. Chris, Natalie, Clayton, herself, none of them were quite what they had been. Was that one of the gains of war, that sham fell away, and people revealed either the best or the worst in them? War destroyed, but it also revealed. The temptation was to hear Clayton's voice again. She went to the telephone, and stood with the instrument in her hands, thinking. Would it comfort him, or would it only bring her close for a moment, to emphasize her coming silence. She put it down and turned away. When, some time later, the taxicab came to take her to Perry Street, she was lying on her bed in the dusk, face down and arms outstretched, a lonely and pathetic figure, all her courage dead for the moment, dead but for the desire to hear Clayton's voice again before the silence closed down. She got up and pinned on her hat for the last time, before the mirror of the little inlaid dressing-table. And she smiled rather forlornly at her reflection in the glass. "'Well, I've got the present, anyhow,' she considered. "'I'm not going either to wallow in the past or peer into the future. I'm going to work.' The prospect cheered her. After all, work was the great solution. It was the great healer, too. That was why men bore their griefs better than women. They could work.' She took a final glance around her stripped and cheerless rooms. How really little things mattered! All her life she had been burdened with things. Now at last she was free of them. The shabby room on Perry Street called her. Work called, beckoned to her, with calloused, useful hands. She closed and locked the door, and went quietly down the stairs. End of chapter 39 Chapter Forty of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One day late in May, Clayton, walking uptown in lieu of the golf he had been forced to abandon, met Dr. Haverford on the street and found his way barred by that rather worried looking gentleman. I was just going to see you, Clayton, he said, about two things. I'll walk back a few blocks with you. He was excited, rather exalted. I'm going in, he announced. Regimental chaplain. I've got a year's leave of absence. I'm rather vague about what a chaplain does, but I rather fancy he can be useful. You'll get over, of course. You're lucky, and you'll find plenty to do. I've been rather anxious, Dr. Haverford confided. I've been a clergyman so long that I don't know just how I'll measure up as a man. You know what I mean. I'm making no reflection on the church, but I've been sheltered and, well, I've been looked after. I don't think I am physically brave. It would be a fine thing, he said wryly, if the chaplain were to turn and run under fire. Oh, I shouldn't worry about that. My salary is to go on, but I don't like that either. If I hadn't a family, I wouldn't accept it. Delight thinks I shouldn't anyhow. As a matter of fact, there ought to be no halfway measures about our giving ourselves. If I had a son to give, it would be different. Clayton looked straight ahead. 
He knew that the rector had, for the moment, forgotten that he had a son to give, and that he had not yet given. "'Why don't you accept a small allowance?' he inquired quietly. "'Or better still, why don't you let me know how much it will take, and let me do it? I'd like to feel that I was represented at France, by you,' he added. And suddenly the rector remembered. He was most uncomfortable and very flushed. "'Thanks. I can't let you do that, of course.' Why not? Because, hang it all, Clayton, I'm not a parasite. I took the car because it enabled me to do my parish work better, but I'm not going to run off to war and let you keep my family. Clayton glanced at him, at his fine, erect old figure, his warmly flushed face. War did strange things. There was a new light in the rector's once worldly, if kindly, eyes. He had the strained look of a man who sees great things, as yet far away, and who would hasten toward them. Insensibly, he quickened his pace. "'But I can't go myself, so why can't I send a proxy?' Clayton asked, smiling. "'I've an idea I'd be well represented.' "'That's a fine way to look at it, but I can't do it. I've saved something, not much, but it will do for a year or two. I'm glad you made the offer, though. It was like you, and it showed me the way. I can't let any man or any group of men finance my going.' And he stuck to it. Clayton, having in mind those careful canvases of the congregation of St. Luke's, which had every few years resulted in raising the rector's salary, was surprised and touched. After all, war was like any other grief. It brought out the best or the worst in us. It roused or it crushed us. The rector had been thinking. "'I'm a very fortunate man,' he said suddenly. "'They're standing squarely behind me at home. It's the women behind the army that will make it count, Clayton." Clayton said nothing. "'Which reminds me,' went on the rector, "'that I find Mrs. Valentine has gone away. I called on her to-day, and she has given up her apartment. Do you happen to know where she is? She has left no address.' "'Gone away?' Clayton repeated. "'Why, no. I hadn't heard of it.' There, in the busy street, he felt a strange sense of loneliness. Always, although he did not see her, he felt her presence. She walked the same streets. For the calling, if his extremity became too great, he could hear her voice over the telephone. There was always the hope, too, of meeting her. Not by design, she had forbidden that. But sometimes, perhaps, God would be good to them both, if they earned it, and they could touch hands for a moment. But gone? You are certain she left no address? Quite certain. She has stored her furniture, I believe. There was a sense of hurt then, too. She had made this decision without telling him. It seemed incredible. A dozen decisions a day he made, and when they were vital there was always in his mind the question as to whether she would approve or not. He could not go to her with them, but mentally he was always consulting with her, earning her approbation, and she had gone without a word. "'Do you think she has gone to France?' He knew his voice sounded stiff and constrained. I hope not. She was being so useful here. Of course, the draft law. Amazing thing, the draft law. Never thought we'd come to it. But it threw her out in a way, of course. What has the draft law to do with Mrs. Valentine? Why, you know what she was doing, don't you? I haven't seen her recently. The rector half stopped. Well, he said, let me tell you, Clayton, that that girl has been recruiting men night after night and day after day. She's done wonders. Standing in a wagon, mind you, in the slums or anywhere. I heard her one night. By George, I went home and tore up a sermon I had been working on for days. Why hadn't he known? Why hadn't he realized that that was exactly the sort of thing she would do? There was bitterness in his heart, too. He might easily have stood unseen in the crowd, and have watched and listened, and been proud of her. Then, these last weeks when he had been working or dining out, or sitting dreary and bored in a theatre, she had been out in the streets. Ah, she lived, did Audrey. Others worked and played, but she lived. Audrey, Audrey. In the rain, the rector was saying, but she didn't mind it. I remember her saying to the crowd, it's raining over here, and maybe it's raining on the fellows in the trenches. But I tell you, I'd rather be over there up to my waist in mud and water than scurrying for a doorway here. They had started to run out of the shower, 
but at that they grinned and stopped. She was wonderful, Clayton. In the rain. And after it was over, she would go home, in some crowded bus or car, to her lonely rooms, while he rolled about the city in a limousine. It was cruel of her not to have told him, not to have allowed him at least to see that she was warm and dry. "'I've been very busy. I hadn't heard,' he said slowly. "'Is it... was it generally known?' Had Natalie known and kept it from him? I think not. Delight saw her and spoke to her, I believe. And you have no idea where she is now? None whatever. He learned that night that Natalie had known, and he surprised a little uneasiness in her face. I heard about it, she said. I can't imagine her making a speech. She's not a bit oratorical. We might have sent out one of the cars for her if I'd known. Oh, she was looked after well enough. Looked after? Natalie had made an error and knew it. I heard that a young clergyman was taking her round, she said, and changed the subject. But he knew that she was either lying or keeping something from him. In those days of tension he found her half-truths more irritating than her rather childish falsehoods. In spite of himself, however, the thought of the young clergyman rankled. That night, stretched in the low chair in his dressing-room, under the reading light, he thought over things carefully. If he loved her, as he thought he did, he ought to want her to be happy. Things between them were hopeless and wretched. If this clergyman, or Sloane, or any other man loved her, and he groaned as he thought how lovable she was, then why not want for her such happiness as she could find? He slept badly that night and for some reason Audrey wove herself into his dreams of the new plant. The roar of the machinery took on the soft huskiness of her voice, the deeper note he watched for and loved. End of chapter 40「Chapter 41 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anna Klein stood in her small room and covered her mouth with her hands, lest she shriek aloud. She knew quite well that the bomb in the suitcase would not suffice to blow up the whole great plant, but she knew what the result of its explosion would be. The shells were not loaded at the Spencer plant. They were shipped away for that. But the fuses were loaded there, and in the small brick house at the end of the fuse building there were stored masses of explosive enough to destroy a town. It was there, of course, that Herman was to place the bomb. She knew how he would do it, carefully, methodically, and with what a lumbering, awkward gait he would make his escape. Her whole mind was bent on giving the alarm, on escaping first and then on arousing the plant. But when the voices below continued, long after Herman had gone, she was entirely desperate. Herman had not carried out the suitcase. He had looked, indeed, much as usual as he walked out the garden path and closed the gate behind him. He had walked rather slowly, but then he always walked slowly. She seemed to see, however, a new caution in his gait, as of one who dreaded to stumble. She dressed herself with shaking fingers and pinned on her hat. The voices still went on below, monotonous, endless, the rasping of Rudolph's throat, irritated by cheap cigarettes the sound of glasses on the table, once a laugh, guttural and mirthless. It was ten o'clock when she knew, by the pushing back of their chairs, that they were preparing to depart. Ten o'clock! She was about to commence again the feverish unscrewing of the door-hinges, when she heard Rudolph's step on the stairs. She had only time to get to the back of her room, beside the bed, when she heard him try the knob. Anna? She let him call her again. Anna! What is it? You in bed? Yes, go away and let me alone. I've got a right to sleep, anyhow. I'm going out, but I'll be back in ten minutes. You try any tricks and I'll get you, see? You make me sick, she retorted. She heard him turn and run lightly down the stairs. Only when she heard the click of the gate did she dare to begin again at the door. She got downstairs easily, but she was still a prisoner. However, she found the high little window into the coal-shed open, and crawled through it to stand listening. The street was quiet. 
Once outside the yard, she started to run. They would let her telephone from the drug store even without money. She had no money. But the drug store was closed and dark, and the threat of Rudolph's return terrified her. She must get off the hill somehow. There were still paths down the steep hillside, dangerous things that hugged the edge of small rocky precipices, or sloped steeply to sudden turns. But she had played over the hill all her young life. She plunged down, slipping and falling a dozen times, and muttering sometimes an oath, sometimes a prayer. Oh, God, let me be in time. Oh, God, hold him up a while while I— Then a slip. If I fall now— Only when she was down in the mill district did she try to make any plan. It was almost eleven then, and her ears were tense with listening for the sound she dreaded. She faced her situation then. She could not telephone from a private house either to the mill or to the Spencer house what she feared, and the pay-booths of the telephone company demanded cash in advance. She was incapable of clear thought, or she would have found some way out undoubtedly. What she did in the end was to board an uptown car and throw herself on the mercy of the conductor. "'I've got to get uptown,' she panted. "'I'll not go in, see? I'll stand here and you take me as far as you can. Look at me. I don't look as though I'm just bumming a ride, do I?' The conductor hesitated. He had very little faith in human nature, but Anna's eyes were both truthful and desperate. He gave the signal to go on. "'What's up?' he said. "'Police after you?' Yes, Anna replied briefly. There is, in certain ranks, a tacit conspiracy against the police. The conductor hated them. They rode free on his car, and sometimes kept an eye on him in the rush hours. They had a way, too, of letting him settle his own disputes with inebriated gentlemen who refused to pay their fares. Looks as though they'd come pretty close to grabbing you, he opened by way of conversation. But ten of them aren't a match for one smart girl. They can't run. All got flat feet." Anna nodded. She was faint and dizzy, and the car seemed to creep along. It was twenty minutes after eleven when she got out. The conductor leaned down after her, hanging onto the handrail. "'Good luck to you,' he said. "'And you'd better get a better face on you than that. It's enough to send you up on suspicion.' She hardly heard him. She began to run, and again she said over and over again her little inarticulate prayer. She knew the Spencer house. More than once she had walked past it on Sunday afternoons for the sheer pleasure of seeing Graham's home. Well, all that was over now. Everything was over unless— The Spencer house was dark, save for a low light in the hall. A new terror seized her. Suppose Graham saw her. He might not believe her story. He might think it a ruse to see his father. But as it happened, Clayton had sent the butler to bed and himself answered the bell from the library. He recognized her at once, and because he saw the distress on her face, he brought her in at once. In the brief moment that it required to turn on the lights, he had jumped to a sickening conviction that Graham was at the bottom of her visit, and her appearance in full light confirmed this. "'Come into the library,' he said. "'We can talk in there.' He led the way and drew up a chair for her. But she did not sit down. She steadied herself by its back instead. "'You think it's about Graham,' she began. "'It isn't—not directly, that is. And my coming is terrible, because it's my own father. They're going to blow up the munition plant, Mr. Spencer.' "'When?' "'Tonight, I think. I came as fast as I could. I was locked in.' "'Locked in?' He was studying her face. "'Yes, don't bother about that now. I'm not crazy or hysterical.' I tell you I heard them. I've been a prisoner, or I'd have come sooner. Today they brought something, dynamite or a bomb in a suitcase, and it's gone tonight. He took it. My father." He was already at the telephone as she spoke. He called the mill first and got the night superintendent. Then he called a number Anna supposed was the police station, and at the same time he was ringing the garage signal steadily for his car. By the time he had explained the situation to the police, his car was rolling under the porte cochere beside the house. He was starting out, forgetful of the girl, when she caught him by the arm. "'You mustn't go,' she cried. "'You'll be killed, too. It will all go. All of it. You can't be spared, Mr. Spencer. You can build another mill, but—' He shook her off gently. "'Of course I'm going,' he said. "'We'll get it in time. Don't you worry. You sit down here and rest, and when it's all straightened out, I'll come back.' 
I suppose you can't go home after this? No, she said dully. He ran out, hatless, and a moment later she heard the car rush out into the night. Five minutes passed. Ten. Anna Klein stood staring ahead of her. When nothing happened, she moved around and sank down in the chair. She was frightfully tired. She leaned her head back and tried to think of something to calm her shaking nerves. That this was Graham's home, that he sometimes sat in that very chair. But she found that Graham meant nothing to her. Nothing mattered, except that her warning had been in time. So intent was she on the thing she was listening for, that smaller, nearby sounds escaped her. So she did not hear a door open upstairs, and the soft rustle of a woman's negligee as it swept from stair to stair. But at the footsteps outside the door she stood up quickly and looked back over her shoulder. Natalie stood framed in the doorway, staring at her. "'Well?' she said, and on receiving no answer from the frightened girl, "'What are you doing here?' The ugly suspicion in her voice left Anna speechless for a moment. "'Don't move, please,' said Natalie's cold voice. "'Stay just where you are.' She reached behind the curtain at the doorway, and Anna heard the faraway ringing of a bell, insistent and prolonged. The girl roused herself with an effort. "'I came to see Mr. Spencer.' "'That is a likely story. Who let you in?' "'Mr. Spencer.' Mr. Spencer is not in. But he did. I'm telling you the truth. Indeed I am. I rang the bell and he came to the door. I had something to tell him. What could you possibly have to tell my husband at this hour? But Anna Klein did not answer. From far away there came a dull report, followed almost immediately by a second one. The windows rattled, and the house seemed to rock rather gently on its foundation. Then silence. Anna Klein picked up her empty pocket-book from the table and looked at it. "'I was too late,' she said dully, and the next moment she was lying at Natalie's feet. End of chapter 41「Chapter 42 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was not until dawn that the full extent of the disaster was revealed. All night, by the flames from the sheds in the yard, which were of wood and still burning, rescue parties had worked frantically. Two of the long buildings, nearest to the fuse department, had collapsed entirely. Above the piles of fallen masonry might be seen, here and there, the black mass of some machine or lathe, and it was there the search parties were labouring. Luckily, the fuse department had not gone double turn, and the night shift in the machine shop was not a full one. The fuse department was a roaring furnace, and repeated calls had brought in most of the fire companies of the city. Running back and forth at the light of the flames were the firemen and such volunteer rescuers as had been allowed through the police cordon. Outside that line of ropes and men were gathered a tragic crowd begging, imploring to be allowed to search for some beloved body. Now and then a fresh explosion made the mob recoil, only to press close again, importuning, tragic, hopeless. The casualty list ran high. All night long ambulances stood in a row along the street, backed up to the curb and waiting, and ever so often a silent group in broken step carried out some quiet covered thing that would never move again. With the dawn Graham found his father. He had thrown off his coat and in his shirt-sleeves was, with other rescuers, digging in the ruins. Graham himself had been working. He was nauseated, weary, and unutterably wretched, for he had seen the night superintendent and had heard of his father's message. Klein, he said, you don't mean Herman Klein. That was what he said. I was to find him and hold him until he got here. But I couldn't find him. He may have got out. There's no way of telling now. Waves of fresh nausea swept over Graham. He sat down on a pile of bricks and wiped his forehead, clammy with sweat. I hope to God he was burned alive, muttered the other man, surveying the scene. His eyes were reddened with smoke from the fire, his clothing torn. I was knocked down myself, he said. I was out in the yard looking for Klein, and I guess I lay there quite a while. 
If I hadn't gone out... He shrugged his shoulders. How many women were on the night shift? Not a lot. Twenty, perhaps. If I had my way, I'd take every German in the country and boil him in oil. I didn't want Klein back, but he was a good workman. Well, he's done a good job now. It was after that that Graham saw his father, a strange, wild-eyed Clayton, who drove his pick with a sort of mad strength, and at the same time gave orders in an unfamiliar voice. Graham, himself a disordered figure, watched him for a moment. He was divided between fear and resolution. Some place in that debacle there lay his own responsibility. He was still bewildered, but the fact that Anna's father had done the thing was ominous. The urge to confession was stronger than his fears. Somehow during the night he had become a man, but now he only felt that somehow during the night he had become a murderer. Clayton looked up, and he moved toward him. Yes? I've had some coffee made at a house down the street. Won't you come and have it? Clayton straightened. He was very tired, and the yard was full of volunteers now, each provided at the gate with a pick or shovel. A look at the boy's face decided him. I'll come, he said, and turned his pick over to the man beside him. He joined Graham, and for a moment he looked into the boy's eyes. Then he put a hand on his shoulder, and together they walked out past the line of ambulances into a street where the scattered houses showed not a single unshattered window, and the pavements were littered with glass. His father's touch comforted the boy, but it made even harder the thing he had to do, for he could not go through life with this thing on his soul. There had been a moment, after he learned of Herman's implication, when he felt the best thing would be to kill himself, but he had put that aside. It was too easy. If Herman Klein had done this because of Anna and himself, then he was a murderer. If he had done it because he was a German, then he, Graham, had no right to die. He would live to make as many Germans as possible pay for this night's work. "'I've got something to tell you, father,' he said, as they paused before the house where the coffee was ready. Clayton nodded, and together they went inside. Even this house was partially destroyed. A piece of masonry had gone through the kitchen, and standing on fallen bricks and plaster, a cheerful old woman was cooking over a stove, which had somehow escaped destruction. "'It's bad,' she said to Graham, as she poured the coffee into cups. "'But it might have been worse, Mr. Spencer. We're all alive. And I guess I'll understand what my boy's writing home about now. They've sure brought the war here this night.' Graham carried the coffee into the little parlour, where Clayton sat dropped on a low chair, his hands between his knees. He was a strange, dishevelled figure, grey of face and weary, and the hand he held out for the cup was blistered and blackened. Graham did not touch his coffee. He put it on the mantel and stood waiting while Clayton finished his. "'Shall I tell you now, sir?' Clayton drew a long breath. It was Herman Klein who did it? Probably. I had a warning last night, but it was too late. I should have known, of course, but somehow I didn't. He'd been with us a long time. I'd have sworn he was loyal. For the first time in his life Graham saw his father weaken, the pitiful, ashamed weakness of a strong man. His voice broke, his face twitched. The boy drew himself up. They couldn't both go to pieces. He could not know that Clayton had worked all that night in that hell with the conviction that in some way his own son was responsible, that he knew already what Graham was about to tell him. If Herman Klein did it, father, it was because he was the tool of a gang, and the reason he was the tool was because he thought I was living with Anna. I wasn't. I don't know why I wasn't. There was every chance. I suppose I meant to sometime. Anyhow, he thought I was. If he had expected any outbreak from Clayton, he met none. Clayton sat looking ahead and listening. Inside of the broken windows the curtains were stirring in the fresh breeze of early morning, and in the kitchen the old woman was piling the fallen bricks noisily. I had been flirting with her a little. It wasn't much more than that, and I gave her a watch at Christmas. He found it out and he beat her. Awfully. She ran away and sent for me and I met her. She had to hide for days. Her face was all bruised. Then she got sick from it. She was sick for weeks. Did he know where she was? 
I think not, or he'd have gone to get her. But Rudolf Klein knew something. I took her out to dinner to a roadhouse a few days ago, and she said she saw him there. I didn't. All that time, weeks, I'd never, I'd never gone to her room. That night I did. I don't know why I... Go on. Well, I went, but I didn't stay. I couldn't. I guess she thought I was crazy. I went away, that's all. And the next day I felt that she might be feeling as though I'd turned her down or something. And I felt responsible. Maybe you won't understand. I don't quite myself. Anyhow, I went back, to let her know I wasn't quite a brute, even if— But she was gone. I'm not trying to excuse myself. It's a rotten story, for I was engaged to Marion then. Suddenly he sat down beside Clayton, and buried his face in his hands. For some reason or other, Clayton found himself back in the hospital, that night when Joey lay still and quiet, and Graham was sobbing like a child, prostrate on the white covering of the bed. With the incredible rapidity of thought in a mental crisis, he saw the last months, the boy's desire to go to France thwarted, his attempt to interest himself in the business, the tool Marion Hayden had made of him, Anna's dog-like devotion, all leading inevitably to catastrophe. And through it all he saw Natalie, holding Graham back from war, providing him with extra money, excusing him, using his confidences for her own ends, insidiously sapping the boy's confidence in his father and himself. "'We'll have to stand up to this together, Graham.' The boy looked up. "'Then you're not going to throw me over altogether?' "'No. But all this?' If Herman Klein had not done it, there were others who would, probably. It looks as though you had provided them with a the tool, but I suppose we were vulnerable in a dozen ways. He rose, and they stood, eyes level, father and son, in the early morning sunlight. And suddenly Graham's arms were around his shoulders, and something tight around Clayton's heart relaxed. Once again, and now for good, he had found his boy, the little boy who had not so long ago stood on a chair for this very embrace. Only now the boy was a man. "'I'm going to France, father,' he said. "'I'm going to pay them back for this, and out of every two shots I fire, one will be for you.' Perhaps he had found his boy only to lose him, but that would have to be as God willed. At ten o'clock he went up to the house to change his wet and draggled clothing. The ruins were being guarded by soldiers, and the work of rescue was still going on, more slowly now, since there was little or no hope of finding any still living thing in that flame-swept wreckage. He found Natalie in bed with Madeleine in attendance, and he learned that her physician had just gone. He felt that he could not talk to her just then. She had a morbid interest in horrors, and with the sights of that night fresh in his mind, he could not discuss them. He stopped, however, in her doorway. "'I'm glad you are resting,' he said. "'Better stay in bed today. It's been a shock.' "'Resting? I've been frightfully ill.' "'I'm sorry, my dear. I'll come in again on my way out.' "'Clay!' He turned in the doorway. "'Is it all gone? Everything?' "'Practically, yes. But you were insured.' "'I'll tell you about that later.' I haven't given it much thought yet. I don't know just how we stand. I shall never let Graham go back to it again. I warn you, I've been lying here for hours, thinking that it might have happened as easily as not while he was there. He hardly listened. He had just remembered Anna. I left a girl here last night, Natalie, he said. Do you happen to know what became of her? Natalie stirred on her pillows. I should think I do. She fainted or pretended to faint. The servants looked after her. Has she gone? I hope so. It is almost noon. Oh, by the way, she called, as he moved off, there is a message for you. A woman named Gould from the Central Hospital. She wants to see you at once. They have kept the telephone ringing all the morning. Claire Gould. That was odd. He had seen her taken out, a bruised and moaning creature, her masses of fair hair over her shoulders, her eyes shut. The surgeons had said she was not badly hurt. She might be worse than they thought. The mention of her name brought Audrey before him. He hoped, wherever she was, 
she would know that he was all right. As soon as he had changed, he called the hospital. The message came back promptly and clearly. We have a woman named Gould here. She is not badly hurt, but she is hysterical. She wants to see you, but if you can't come at once, I am to give you a message. Wait a moment. She has written it, but it's hardly legible. Clayton waited. It's about somebody you know, who had gone on night turn recently at your plant. I can't read the name. It looks like Ballantyne. It isn't Valentine, is it? Perhaps it is. It's just a scrawl. But the first name is clear enough. Audrey. Afterward, he did not remember hanging up the receiver or getting out of the house. He seemed to come to himself somewhat at the hospital, and at the door to Clare's ward his brain suddenly cleared. He did not need Clare's story. It seemed that he knew it all, had known it long ages before. Her very words sounded like infinite repetitions of something he had heard over and over. She was right beside me, and I was showing her about the lathe. They told me I could teach her. She was picking it up fast, too, and she liked it. She liked it. The fact that Audrey had liked it broke down his scanty reserve of restraint. Clayton found himself looking down at her from a great distance. She was very remote. Claire pulled herself together. When the first explosion came, it didn't touch us. But I guess she knew it meant more. She said something about the telephone and getting help, and there'd be more, and she started to run. I stood there, watching her run, and waiting. And then the second one came, and— Suddenly Claire seemed to disappear altogether. He felt something catch his arm, and the nurse's voice, very calm and quiet. Sit down. I'll get you something. Then he was swallowing a fluid that burned his throat, and Claire was crying with the sheet drawn to her mouth, and somewhere Audrey— He got up, and the nurse followed him out. "'You might look for the person here,' she suggested. "'We have had several brought in.' He was still dazed, but he followed her docilely. Audrey was not there. He seemed to have known that, too, that there would be a long search and hours of agony, and at the end— the one thing he did not know was what was to be at the end. All that afternoon he searched, going from hospital to hospital, and at each one as he stopped that curious feeling of inner knowledge told him she was not there. But the same instinct told him she was not dead. He would have known it if she was dead. There was no reasoning in it. He could not reason. But he knew, somehow. Then, late in the afternoon, he found her. He knew that he had found her. It was as though, at the entrance of the hospital, some sixth sense had told him this was right at last. He was quite steady, all at once. She was here, waiting for him to come. And now he had come, and it would be all right. Yet for a time it seemed all wrong. She was not conscious, had not roused since she was brought in. There were white screens around her bed, and behind them she lay alone. They had braided her hair in two long dark braids, and there was a bandage on one of her arms. She looked very young and very tired, but quite peaceful. His arrival had caused a small stir of excitement, his own prominence, the disaster with which the country was ringing. But for a few minutes before the doctors arrived, he was alone with her behind the screen. It was like being alone with his dead. Bent over her, his face pressed to one of her quiet hands, he whispered to her all the little tendernesses, the aching want of her that so long he had buried in his heart. Things he could not have told her, waking, he told her then. It seemed, too, that she must rouse to them, that she must feel him there beside her, calling her back. But she did not move. It was then, for the first time, that he wondered what he would do if she should die. The doctors, coming behind the screen, found him sitting erect and still, staring ahead of him with a strange expression on his face. He had just decided that he could not, under any circumstances, live if she died. It was rather a good thing for Clayton's sanity that they gave him hope. He was completely unnerved, tired and desperate. Indeed, when they came in, he had been picturing Audrey and himself wandering hand in hand, very quietly and contentedly, in some strange world which was his rather hazy idea of the beyond. 
It seemed to him quite sane and extraordinarily happy. The effort of meeting the staff roused him, and with hope came a return to normality. There was much to be done, special nurses, a private room, and rather reluctantly, friends and relatives to be notified. Only for a few minutes, out of all of life, had she been his. He must give her up now. Life had become one long renunciation. He did not go home at all that night. He divided his time between the plant and the hospital, going back and forward. Each time he found the report good. She was still strong. No internal injuries had manifested themselves, and the concussion would probably wear off before long. He wanted to be there when she first opened her eyes. He was afraid she might be frightened, and there would be a bad minute when she remembered, if she did remember. At midnight, going into the room, he found Mrs. Haverford beside Audrey's bed, knitting placidly. She seemed to accept his being there as perfectly natural, and she had no sick-room affectations. She did not whisper, for one thing. "'The nurse thinks she is coming round, Clayton,' she said. "'I waited because I thought she ought to see a familiar face when she does.' Mrs. Haverford was eminently good for him. Her cheerful matter-of-factness, her competent sanity, restored his belief in a world that had seemed only chaos and death. How much, he wondered later, had Mrs. Haverford suspected? He had not been in any condition to act a part. But whatever she suspected, he knew was locked up in her kindly breast. Audrey moved slightly, and he went over to her. When he glanced up again, Mrs. Haverford had gone out. So it was that Audrey came back to him, and to him alone. She asked no questions. She only lay quite still on her white pillows, and looked at him. Even when he knelt beside her, and drew her toward him, she said nothing. But she lifted her uninjured hand, and softly caressed his bent head. Clayton never knew whether Mrs. Haverford had come back and seen that or not. He did not care for that matter. It seemed to him just then that all the world must know what was so vitally important, so transcendentally wonderful. Not until Audrey's eyes closed again, and he saw that she was sleeping, did he loosen his arms from around her. When at last he went out to the stiffly furnished hospital parlour, he found Mrs. Haverford sitting there alone, still knitting. But he rather thought she had been crying. There was an undeniably moist handkerchief on her knee. She roused a little while ago, he said, trying to speak quietly, and as though Audrey's rousing were not the wonder that it was. She seemed very comfortable, and now she's sleeping. The dear child, said Mrs. Haverford, if she had died after everything, her plump face quivered. Things have never been very happy for her, Clayton. I'm afraid not. He went to a window and stood looking out. The city was not quiet but its mighty roar of the day was lowered to a monotonous, drowsy humming. From the east, reflected against low-hanging clouds, was the dull red of his own steel mills, looking like the reflection of a vast conflagration. "'Not very happy,' he repeated. "'Sometimes,' Mrs. Haverford was saying, "'I wonder about things. People go along missing the best things in life, and—' I suppose there is a reason for it, but sometimes I wonder if he ever meant us to go on crucifying our own souls. So she did know. What would you have us do? I don't know. I suppose there isn't any answer. Afterward Clayton found that that bit of conversation with Mrs. Haverford took on the unreality of the rest of that twenty-four hours. But one part of it stood out real and hopelessly true. There wasn't any answer. End of chapter 42「Chapter 43 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anna Klein had gone home at three o'clock that terrible morning, a trembling, white-faced girl. She had done her best, and she had failed. Unlike Graham, she had no feeling of personal responsibility, but she felt she could never again face her father with the thing that she knew between them. There were other reasons, too. Herman would be arrested, and she would be called to testify. 
She had known that. She had warned Mr. Spencer. The gang, Rudolph's gang, would get her for that. She knew where they were now. They would be at Gus's in the back room, drinking to the success of their scheme. And Gus, who was a German, too, would be with them, offering a round of drinks on the house now and then as his share of the night's rejoicing. Gus, who was already arranging to help draft dodgers by sending them over the Mexican border. She would have to go back, to get in and out again if she could, before Herman came back. She had no clothes, except what she stood up in, and those in her haste that night were only her print house-dress with a long coat. She would have to find a new position, and she would have to have her clothing to get about in. She dragged along, singularly unmolested. Once or twice a man eyed her, but her white face and vacant eyes were unattractive, almost sodden. She was barely able to climb the hill, and as she neared the house her trepidation increased. What if Herman had come back? If he suspected her, he would kill her. He must have been half mad to have done the thing anyhow. He would surely be half mad now. And because she was young and strong, and life was still a mystery to be solved, she did not want to die. Strangely enough, face to face with the danger, there was still, in the back of her head, an exultant thrill in her very determination to live. She would start over again, and she would work hard and make good. You bet I'll make good, she resolved. Just give me a chance, and I'll work my fool head off. Which was by way of being a prayer. It was the darkest hour before the dawn when she reached the cottage. It was black and very still, and outside the gate she stooped and slipped off her shoes. The window into the shed by which she had escaped was still open, and she crouched outside, listening. When the stillness remained unbroken, she climbed in, tense for a movement or a blow. Once inside, however, she drew a long breath. The doors were still locked and the keys gone, so Herman had not returned. But as she stood there, hurried, stealthy footsteps came along the street and turned in at the gate. In a panic she flew up the stairs and into her room, where the door still hung crazily on its hinges. She stood there, listening, her heart pounding in her ears, and below she distinctly heard a key in the kitchen door. She did the only thing she could think of. She lifted the door into place, and stood against it, bracing it with her body. Whoever it was was in the kitchen now, moving, however, more swiftly than Herman. She heard matches striking, then, sst. She knew that it was Rudolph, and she braced herself mentally. Rudolph was keener than Herman. If he found her door in that condition, and she herself dressed, working silently and still holding the door in place, she flung off her coat. She even unpinned her hair and unfastened her dress. When his signal remained unanswered a second time, he called her by name, and she heard him coming up. Anna, he repeated. Yes? He was startled to hear her voice so close to the door. In the dark she heard him fumbling for the knob. He happened on the padlock instead, and he laughed a little. By that she knew that he was not quite sober. Locked you in, has he? What do you want? Has Herman come home yet? He doesn't get home until seven. Hasn't he been back at all tonight? She hesitated. How do I know? I've been asleep. Some sleep, he said, and suddenly lurched against the door. In spite of her it yielded, and although she braced herself with all her strength, his weight against it caused it to give way. It was a suspicious, crafty Rudolph who picked himself up and made a clutch at her in the dark. You little liar, he said thickly, and struck a match. She cowered away from him. I was going to run away, Rudolph, she cried. He hasn't any business locking me in. I won't stand for it. You've been out. No. Out, after him. Honest to God, Rudolph, no. I hate him. I don't ever want to see him again. He put a hand out into the darkness, and finding her, tried to draw her to him. She struggled, and he released her. All at once she knew that he was weak with fright. The bravado had died out of him. The face she had touched was covered with a clammy sweat. I wish to God Herman would come. What do you want with him? Have you got any whiskey? You've had enough of that stuff. 
Someone was walking along the street outside. She felt that he was listening, crouched, ready to run, but the steps went on. "'Look here, Anna,' he said, when he had pulled himself together again. "'I'm going to get out of this. I'm going away.' "'All right. You can go for all of me.' "'Do you mean to say you've been asleep all night? You didn't hear anything?' "'Hear what?' He laughed. "'You'll know soon enough.' Then he told her, hurriedly, that he was going away. He came back to get her to promise to follow him. He wasn't going to stay here, and—' "'And what?' and be drafted, he finished, rather lamely. Gus has a friend in a town on the Mexican border, he said. He's got maps of the country to Mexico City, and the Germans there fix you up all right. I'll get rich down there, and some day I'll send for you. What's that? He darted to the window, faintly outlined by a distant street lamp. Three men were standing quietly outside the gate, and a fourth was already in the garden, silently moving toward the house. She felt Rudolph brush by her, and the trembling hand he laid on her arm. "'Now lie,' he whispered fiercely. "'You haven't seen me. I haven't been here to-night.' Then he was gone. She ran to the window. The other three men were coming in, moving watchfully and slowly, and Rudolph was at Katie's window, cursing. If she was a prisoner, so was Rudolph. He realized that instantly, and she heard him breaking out the sash with a chair. At the sound, the three figures broke into a run, and she heard the sash give way. Almost instantly there was firing. The first shot was close, and she knew it was Rudolph firing from the window. Some wild design of braining him from behind with a chair flashed into her desperate mind, but when she had felt her way into Katie's room, he had gone. The garden below was quiet, but there was yelling and the crackling of underbrush from the hillside. Then a scattering of shots again, and silence. The yard was empty. The hill paid but moderate attention to shots. They were usually merely pyrotechnic, and indicated rejoicing rather than death. But here and there she heard a window raised, and then lowered again. The hill had gone back to bed. Anna went into her room and dressed. For the first time it had occurred to her that she might be held by the police, and the thought was unbearable. It was when she was making her escape that she found a prostrate figure in the yard, and knew that one of Rudolph's shots had gone home. She could not go away and leave that, not unless— A terrible hatred of Herman and Rudolph, and all their kind, suddenly swept over her. She would not run away. She would stay and tell all the terrible truth. It was her big moment, and she rose to it. She would see it through. What was her own safety to letting this band of murderers escape? And all that in the few seconds it took to reach the fallen figure. It was only when she was very close that she saw it was moving. "'Tell Dunbar he went to the left,' a voice was saying. "'The left! They'll lose him yet!' "'Joey!' "'Hello,' said Joey's voice. He considered that he was speaking very loud, but it was hardly more than a whisper. "'That wasn't your father, was it?' The old boy couldn't jump and run like that. Are you hurt? He coughed a little, a gurgling cough that rather startled himself, but he was determined to be a man. No, I just lay down here for a nap. Who was it that jumped? My cousin Rudolph. Do you think I can help you into the house? I'll walk there myself in a minute. Unless your cousin Rudolph— His head dropped back on her arm. I feel sort of all in. His voice trailed off. Joey! Let me alone, he muttered. I'm the first casualty in the American army. I— He made a desperate effort to speak in a man's voice, but the higher boyish notes of sixteen conquered. They certainly gave us hell tonight, but we're going to build again, me and Clayton spent— All at once he was very still. Anna spoke to him, and that failing gave him a frantic little shake. But Joey had gone to another partnership beyond the stars. End of chapter 43《Chapter 44 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The immediate outstanding result of the Holocaust at the munitions works was the end of Natalie's dominion over Graham. 
she never quite forgave him the violence with which he threw off her shackles. "'If I'd been half a man, I'd have been over there long ago,' he said, standing before her, tall and young and flushed. "'I'd have learned my job by now, and I'd be worth something now I'm needed. "'And broken my heart. "'Hearts don't break that way, mother. "'Well, you say you are going now. I should think you'd be satisfied. "'There's plenty of time for you to get the glory you want.' glory i don't want any glory and as for plenty of time that's exactly what there isn't during the next few days she preserved an obstinate silence on the subject she knew he had been admitted to one of the officers training camps and that he was making rather helpless and puzzled purchases going into his room she would find a dressing case of khaki leather perhaps or flannel shirts of the same indeterminate hue she would shed futile tears over them and order them put out of sight, but she never offered to assist him. Graham was older in many ways. He no longer ran up and down stairs whistling, and he sought every opportunity to be with his father. They spent long hours together in the library, when after a crowded day, filled with the thousand problems of reconstructions, Clayton smoked a great deal, talked a little, rather shamefacedly, after the manner of men, of personal responsibility in the war, and quietly watched the man who was Graham. Out of those quiet hours, with Natalie at the theatre or reading upstairs in bed, Clayton got the greatest comfort of his life. He would neither look back nor peer anxiously ahead. The past, with its tragedy, was gone. The future might hold even worse things. But just now he would live each day as it came, working to the utmost, and giving his evenings to his boy. The nights were the worst. He was not sleeping well, and in those long hours of quiet he tried to rebuild his life along stronger, sterner lines. Love could have no place in it, but there was work left. He was strong, and he was still young. The country should have every ounce of energy in him. He would rebuild the plant on bigger lines than before and when that was done he would build again. The best he could do was not enough. He scarcely noticed Natalie's withdrawal from Graham and himself. When she was around he was his old punctilious self, gravely kind, more than ever considerate. Beside his failure to her, her own failure to him faded into insignificance. She was as she was, and through no fault of hers, but he was what he had made himself. Once or twice he had felt an overwhelming remorse toward her, and on one such occasion he had made a useless effort to break down the barrier of her long silence. "'Don't go upstairs, Natalie,' he had begged. "'I'm not very amusing, I know, but I'll try my best. I'll promise not to touch on anything disagreeable.' He had been standing in the hall, looking up at her on the staircase, and he smiled. There was pleading behind the smile, an inarticulate feeling that between them there might at least be friendship. "'You are never disagreeable,' she had said, looking down with hostile eyes. "'You are quite perfect.' "'Then won't you wait?' "'Perfection bores me to tears,' she said, and went on up the stairs. On the morning of Graham's departure, however, he found her prepared to go to the railway station. She was red-eyed and pale and he was very sorry for her. "'Do you think it is wise?' he asked. "'I shall see him off, of course. I may never see him again.' And his own tautened nerves almost gave way. "'Don't say that!' he cried. "'Don't even think that. And for God's sake, Natalie, send him off with a smile. That's the least we can do.' "'I can't take it as casually as you do.' He gave up then, in despair. He saw that Graham watched her uneasily during the early breakfast, and he surmised that the boy's own grip on his self-control was weakened by the tears that dropped into her coffee-cup. He reflected bitterly that all over the country strong women, good women, were sending their boys away to war, giving them with prayer and exaltation. What was wrong with Natalie? What was wrong with his whole life? When Graham was upstairs he turned to her. Why do you persist in going, Natalie? I intend to go. That's enough. Don't you think you've made him unhappy enough? He has made me unhappy enough. You. It is always yourself, Natalie. Why don't you ever think of him? He went to the door. 
"'Countermand the order for the limousine,' he said to the butler, "'and order the small car for Mr. Graham and myself.' "'How dare you do that?' "'I am not going to let you ruin the biggest day in his life.' She saw that he meant it. She was incredulous, reckless, angry, and thwarted for the first time in her self-indulgent life. "'I hate you,' she said slowly. "'I hate you.' She turned and went slowly up the stairs. Graham, knocking at her door a few minutes later, heard the sound of hysterical sobbing within, but received no reply. "'Good-bye, mother,' he called. "'Good-bye. Don't worry. I'll be all right.' When he saw she did not mean to open the door or to reply, he went rather heavily down the stairs. "'I wish she wouldn't,' he said. "'It makes me darned unhappy.' But Clayton surmised a relief behind his regret and in the train the boy's eyes were happier than they had been for months. "'I don't know how I'll come out, Dad,' he said, "'but if I don't get through it, it won't be because I didn't try.' And he did try. The enormous interest of the thing gripped him from the start. There was romance in it, too. He wore his first uniform, too small for him as it was, with immense pride. He rolled out in the morning at Reveille, with the feeling that he had just gone to bed, ate hugely at breakfast, learned how to make his own cot-bed, and lined up on a vast dusty parade-ground for endless evolutions in a boiling sun. It was rather amusing to find himself being ordered about in a stentorian voice by Jackson, and when, in off moments, that capable ex-chauffeur condescended to a few moments of talk and relaxation, the boy was highly gratified. "'Do you think I've got anything in me?' he would inquire anxiously and Jackson always said heartily, "'Sure you have!' There were times when Graham doubted himself, however. There was one dreadful hour when Graham, in the late afternoon, and under the eyes of his commanding officer and a group of ladies, conducting the highly formal and complicated ceremony of changing the guard, tied a lot of grinning men up in a knot which required the captain of the company and two sergeants to untangle. I'm no earthly good, he confided to Jackson that night, sitting on the steps of his barracks. I know it like ABC, and then I get up and try it, and all at once I'm just a plain damned fool. Don't give up like that, son, Jackson said. I've seen him march a platoon right into the CO's porch before now, and once I just saved a baby buggy and a pair of twins. Clayton wrote him daily, and now and then there came a letter from Natalie cheerful on the surface, but its cheerfulness obviously forced. And once, to his great surprise, Marion Hayden wrote him. "'I just want you to know,' she said, "'that I am still interested in you, even if it isn't going to be anything else, and that I am ridiculously proud of you. Isn't it queer to look back on last winter and think what a lot of careless idiots we were? I suppose war doesn't really change us, but it does make us wonder what we've got in us.' I am surprised to find that I am a great deal better than I ever thought I was." There was comfort in the letter, but no thrill. He was far away from all that now, like one on the first stage of a long journey, with his eyes ahead. Then one day he saw a familiar but yet strange figure striding along the country road. Graham was map-sketching that day, and the strange but familiar figure was almost on him when he looked up. It was extremely military, and looked like a general at least. Also, it was very red in the face, and was clutching doggedly in its teeth an old briar pipe. But what had appeared from the front to be an ultra-military figure, on closer inspection, turned out to be a procession. Pulling back hard on a rope behind was the company goat, Eleanor. The ultra-military figure paused by Graham's sketching-stool, and said, "'Young man, do you know where this creature belongs? I found her trying to commit suicide on the rifle range. Why, Graham!" It was Dr. Haverford. He grew a trifle less military then, and borrowed some pipe tobacco. He looked oddly younger, Graham thought, and rather self-conscious of his uniform. "'Every inch a soldier, Graham,' he chuckled. "'Still have to use a hook and eye at the bottom of the coat. Blouse,' he corrected himself. "'But I'm getting my waistline again. How's the whoa? he called, as Eleanor wrapped the rope around his carefully putted legs. Infernal animal, he grumbled, 
I just paid a quarter to have these puttees shined. How's the family? Mother's gone to Lindale. The house is finished. Have you been here long, sir? Two weeks. Hang it all, Graham. I wish I'd let this creature commit suicide. She's... Do you know Delight is here? Here? Why, no. At the hostess house, said the chaplain proudly. Doing her bit, too. Mrs. Haverford wanted to come, too, and sew buttons on or something. But I told her two out of three was a fair percentage. I hear that Washington has sent for your father. I hadn't heard. He's a big man, Graham. We're going to hear from him. Only, I thought he looked tired when I saw him last. Somebody ought to look after him a bit. He was patiently untangling himself from Eleanor's rope. You know, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who look after themselves, and those who look after others. That's your father. The last. Graham's face clouded. How true that was! He knew now, as he had not known before. He was thinking clearly those days. Hard work and nothing to drink had clarified his mind, and he saw things at home as they really were. Clayton's infinite patience, his strength, and his gentleness. But he only said, "'He has had a hard year.' He raised his eyes and looked at the chaplain. "'I didn't help him any, you know, sir.' "'Well, well, that's all over now. We've just one thing to think of, and that's to beat those German devils back to Berlin. And then burn Berlin,' he added militarily. The last Graham saw of him, he was dragging Eleanor down the road, and a faint throaty humming came back, which sounded suspiciously like, "'Where do we go from here, boys? Where do we go from here?' Candidate Spencer took great pains with his toilet that afternoon. He polished his shoes and shaved, and he spent a half hour on some ten sadly neglected fingernails. At retreat he stood at attention in the long line, and watched the flag moving slowly and majestically to the stirring bugle notes. Something swelled almost to bursting in his throat. That was his flag. He was going to fight for it. And after that was done he was going to find some girl, some nice girl, the sort, for instance, that would leave her home to work in a hostess house. And having found her, he would marry her, and love and cherish her all his life. Unless, of course, she wouldn't have him. He was inclined to think she wouldn't. He ate very little supper that night, little being a comparative term, of course. And then he went to discover delight. It appeared, however, that she had been already discovered. She was entirely surrounded by uniforms and Graham furiously counted a colonel, two majors, and a captain. "'Pulling rank, of course,' he muttered, and retired to a corner where he had at least the mild gratification of seeing that even the colonel could not keep delight from her work. "'Silly asses,' said Graham again. And then she saw him. There was no question about her being pleased. She was quite flushed with it, but a little uncomfortable, too, at Graham's attitude. He was oddly humble, yet he had a look of determination that was almost grim. She filled in a rather disquieting silence by trying to let him know, without revealing that she had ever been anything else, how proud she was of him. Then she realized that he was not listening, and that he was looking at her with an almost painful intensity. "'When can you get away, Delight?' he asked abruptly. "'From here?' She cast an appraising glance over the room. Right away, I think. Why? Because I want to talk to you, and I can't talk to you here. She brought a bright-colored sweater, and he helped her into it, still with his mouth set and his eyes a trifle sunken. All about there were laughing groups of men in uniform. Outside the parade glowed faintly in the dusk, and from the low barrack windows there came the glow of lights, the movement of young figures, voices, the thin metallic notes of a mandolin. "'How strange it all is,' Delight said. "'Here we are, you and father and myself, and even Jackson. I saw him to-day. All here, living different lives, doing different things, even thinking different thoughts. It's as though we had all moved into a different world.' He walked on beside her, absorbed in his own thoughts, which were yet only of her. "'I didn't know you were here,' he brought out finally. That's because you've been burying yourself. I knew you were here. Why didn't you send me some word?" She stiffened somewhat in the darkness. 
I didn't think you would be greatly interested, Graham. And again, struggling with his new humility, he was silent. It was not until they had crossed the parade ground and were beyond the noises of the barracks that he spoke again. You mind if I talk to you, Delight? I mean, about myself? I, since you're here, we're likely to see each other now and then, if you are willing. And I'd like to start straight. Do you really want to tell me? No, but I've got to. That's all. He told her. He made no case for himself. Indeed, some of it Delight understood far better than he did himself. He said nothing against Marion. On the contrary, he blamed himself rather severely. And behind his honest, halting sentences, Delight read his own lack of understanding. She felt infinitely older than this tall, honest-eyed boy in his stained uniform, older and more sophisticated. But if she had understood the Marion Hayden situation, she was totally at a loss as to Anna. "'But I don't understand,' she cried. "'How could you make love to her if you didn't love her?' "'I don't know. Fellows do those things. It's just mischief, some sort of a devil in them, I suppose.' When he reached the beating in Anna's flight, however, she understood a little better. "'Of course you had to stand by her,' she agreed. "'You haven't heard it all,' he said quietly. "'When I'm through, if you get up and leave me, I'll understand, Delight.' and I won't blame you." He told her the rest of the story in a voice strained with anxiety. It was as though he had come to a tribunal for judgment. He spared her nothing. The dinner at the roadhouse with Rudolph at the window, his visit to Anna's room, and her subsequent disappearance. She told the Department of Justice people that Rudolph found her that night and took her home. She was a prisoner then, poor little kid but she overheard her father and Rudolph plotting to blow up the mill. That's where I came in, Delight. He was crazy at me. He was a German, of course, and he might have done it anyhow. But Rudolph told him a lot of lies about me, and he did it. When I think about it all, and about Joey, I'm crazy." She slipped her hand over his. "'Of course they would have done it anyhow,' she said softly. "'You aren't going to get up and go away?' "'Why should I?' she asked. "'I only feel—oh, Graham, how wretched you must have been!' Something in her voice made him sit up straighter. He knew now that it had always been delight, always. Only she had been too good for him. She had set a standard he had not hoped to reach. But now things were different. He hadn't amounted to much in other things, but he was a soldier now. He meant to be a mighty good soldier. And when he got his commission, you won't mind, then, if I come in to see you now and then? Mine? Why, Graham! And you don't think I'm quite hopeless, do you? There were tears in her eyes, but she answered bravely. I believe in you every minute, but then I think I always have. Like fun you have! But although he laughed, it was a shaky laugh. Suddenly he stood up and shook himself. He felt young and strong and extremely happy. There had been a bad time, but it was behind him now. Ahead there lay high adventure, and here, beside him in the dusk, was the girl of his heart. She believed in him. Work to do, and a woman who believed in a fellow, that was life. "'Aren't you cold?' he asked, and drew the gaudy sweater tenderly around her shoulders. End of chapter 44。forty five of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。The fact that Audrey Valentine, conspicuous member of a conspicuous social group that she was, had been working in the machine shop of the Spencer Munitions Works at the time of the explosion was in itself sufficient to rouse the greatest interest. When a young reporter, gathering human interest stories about the event from the pitiful wreckage in the hospitals, happened on Clare Gould, he got a feature story for the Sunday edition that made Audrey's own world, reading it in bed or over its exquisite breakfast-tables, gasp with amazement. For following up Clare's story, he found that Audrey had done much more than run toward the telephone. She had reached it, had found the operator gone, and had succeeded, before the roof fell in on her, 
in calling the fire department and in sending in a general alarm to all the hospitals. The reporter found the night operator who had received the message. He got a photograph of her, too, and from the society file, an old one of Audrey, very delicate and audacious, and not greatly resembling the young woman who lay in her bed and read the article aloud, between dismay and laughter, to old Terry Mackenzie. "'Good heavens, Terry,' she said, "'listen. I had heard the explosion, but did not, of course, know what it was, and then I got a signal, and it was the Spencer plant. A sweet southern voice said very calmly, "'Operator, this is important. Listen carefully. There has been an explosion at the Spencer plant, and the ruins are on fire. There will probably be more explosions in a minute. Send in a general fire alarm, and then get all the ambulances and doctors.' Then there was another explosion, and their lines went out of commission. I am glad she is not dead. She certainly had her nerve. "'Fame at last, Audrey,' said old Terry, very gently. "'It's shameless.' But she was a little pleased, nevertheless. Not at the publicity. That was familiar enough. But that, when her big moment came, she had met it squarely. Terry was striding about the room. His visits were always rather cyclonic. He moved from chair to chair, leaving about each one an encircling ring of cigarette ashes, and carefully inspecting each new vase of flowers. He stopped in front of a basket of exquisite small orchids. "'Who sent this?' he demanded. "'Rodney Page. Doesn't it look like him?' He turned and stared at her. "'What's come over Clayton Spencer? Is he blind?' "'Blind?' about rodney he's head over heels in love with natalie spencer god alone knows why i dare say it isn't serious he is always in love with somebody there's a good bit of talk i don't give a hang for either of them but i'm fond of clayton so are you natalie's out in the country now and rodney is there every weekend it's a scandal that's all as for natalie herself she ought to be interned as a dangerous pacifist she's a martyr in her own eyes Thank heaven there aren't many like her. Audrey leaned back against her pillows. I wonder, Terry, she said, if you haven't shown me what to do next. I might be able to reach some of the women like Natalie. There are some of them, and they've got to learn that if they don't stand behind the men, we're lost. Fine, he agreed. Get them to knit less and write more letters, cheerful letters. Tell them to remember that by the time their man gets the letter, the baby's tooth will be through. There are a good many men in the army camps today vicariously cutting teeth. Get after him, Audrey. A worried man is a poor soldier. After he had gone, she had the nurse bring her paper and pencil, and she wrote, rather incoherently, it is true, her first appeal to the women of the country. It was effective, too. Audrey was an effective person. When Clayton came for his daily visit, she had just finished it and was reading it over with considerable complacency. I've become an author, Clay, she said. I think myself I'm terribly good at it. May I read it to you? He listened gravely, but with a little flicker of amusement in his eyes. How like her it was to refuse to allow herself even time to get entirely well. But when she finished, he was thoughtful. She had called it slacker women. That's what Natalie was. He had never put it into words before. Natalie was a slacker. He had never discussed Natalie's attitude toward the war with Audrey. He rather thought she was entirely ignorant of it. But her little article, glowing with patriotism, frank, simple, and convincing, might have been written to Natalie herself. "'It is very fine,' he said. "'I rather think you have found yourself at last. There aren't a lot of such women, and I dare say there will be fewer all the time. But they exist, of course.' She glowed under his approval. There was, in all their meetings, a subcurrent of sadness, that they must be so brief, that before long they must end altogether, that they could not put into words the things that were in their eyes and their hearts. After that first hour of a return to consciousness, there had been no expressed tenderness between them. The nurse sat in the room, eternally knitting, and Clayton sat near Audrey, or read to her, or, like Terry, wandered about the room. But now and then Audrey, enthroned like a princess on her pillows, would find his eyes on her, and such a hungry look in them that she would clench her hands. And after such time she always said, 
Now, tell me about the mill. Or about Washington, where he was being summoned with increasing frequency. Or about Graham. Anything to take that look out of his eyes. He told her all his plans. He even brought the blueprints of the new plant and spread them out on the bed. He was dreaming a great dream those days, and Audrey knew it. He was building again, this time not for himself, but for the nation. After he had gone, looking boyish and reluctant, she would lie for a little while watching the door. Perhaps he had forgotten something and would come back? One day he did, and was surprised to find her suddenly in tears. "'You came back,' she said, half hysterically. "'You came back!' That was the only time in all those weeks that he kissed her. The nurse had gone out, and suddenly he caught her in his arms and held her to him. He put her back very gently, and she saw that he was pale. "'I think I'd better go now and not come back,' he said. And for two long, endless days he did not come. Then, on the third, he came, very stiff and formal, and with himself well in hand. Audrey, leaning back and watching him, felt what a boy he was after all, so determined to do the right thing, so obvious with his blueprints, and so self-conscious. In June she left the hospital and went to the country. She had already made a little market for her work, and she wanted to carry it on. By that time, too, she knew that the break must come between Clayton and herself, if it came at all. "'No letters, no anything, Clay,' she said, and he acquiesced quietly. But the night she left, the butler, coming downstairs to investigate a suspicious sound, found him restlessly pacing the library floor. In August he went abroad, and some time about the middle of the month, while he was in London, he received a cable from Graham. He had been commissioned a first lieutenant in the infantry. Clayton had been seeing war at first hand then, and for a few moments he was fairly terrified. On the 1st of August, the Germans had used liquid fire for the first time, thus adding a new horror. Men in the trenches swept by it had been practically annihilated. Attacks against it were practically suicide. Already the year had seen the last of Kitchener's army practically destroyed, and the British combing the country for new divisions. In the deadly give-and-take of that summer, where gains and losses were measured by yards, the advantage was steadily on the German side, and it would be a year before the small force of American regulars could be augmented to any degree by the great new army. It was the darkest hour. Following on the heels of Graham's cable came a hysterical one from Natalie. Graham probably ordered abroad, implore you use influence with Washington. He resorted to his old remedy when he was in trouble. He walked the streets. He tried to allow for Natalie's lack of exaltation by the nature of her life. If she could have seen what he had seen, surely she would have felt, as he did, that no sacrifice could be too great to end this cancer of the world. But deep in his heart he knew that Natalie was Natalie. Nothing would change her. As it happened, he passed Graham on the Atlantic. There was a letter for him at the office, a boyish, exultant letter. "'Dad, dear, I'm married,' it began. "'Married, and off for France. It is delight, of course. It was always delight, although I know that sounds queer. And now I'm off to kill a hunter, too. More than that, I hope. I want two Germans for every poor devil they got at the works. That's the minimum. The maximum?' "'You'll look after delight, I know. She has been perfectly bully, but it's hard on her.' We were married two days ago, and already I feel as though I've always been married. She's going on with the canteen work, and I shall try not to be jealous. She's popular. And if you'd seen the general when we were married, you'd have thought he was losing a daughter. I wired mother, but she was too cut up about my leaving to come. I wish she had, for it was a strange sort of wedding. The division was about to move, and at the last minute five girls turned up to be married to fellows who were leaving. They came from all over, and believe me, there was some excitement. All day the General and Chaplain Haverford were fussing about licenses, and those girls sat around and waited and looked droopy, but sort of happy. You know what I mean. It was nine o'clock in the evening before everything was ready. Delight had trimmed up the little church which is in the camp, and had a flag over the altar. 
Then we had a multiple wedding. Honestly. The organ played a squeaky wedding march, and we went in, six couples. The church was full of soldiers, and, I don't mind saying, I was ready to shed tears. We lined up, and Dr. Haverford married us. Delight says she is sure we are only one-sixth married. Quiet! You never heard such quiet, except for the general blowing his nose. I think myself he was weeping, and there was a rumour about the camp to that effect. You know, the flag over the altar and all that. I tell you, it made a fellow think. Well, I'm going over now. Quick work, isn't it? And to think that a few months ago I was hanging around the club and generally making a mess of life. That's all over now, thank God. I'm going to make good. Try to buck Mother up. It's pretty hard for her. It's hard for all women just waiting. And while I know I'm coming back safe and sound, I'd like to feel that you are going to keep an eye on Delight. She's the most important thing in the world to me now. And scrawled in a corner, he had added, You've been mighty fine with me always, Dad. I was a good bit of a pup last winter. If I make anything of myself at all, it will be because I want to be like you." Clayton sat for a long time with the letter in his hand. The happiness and hope that fairly radiated from it cheered and warmed him. He was nearly happy. And it came to him then that while every man had the right to happiness, only those achieved it who craved it for others, and having craved it for them, at last saw the realization of their longing. End of chapter 45「Chapter forty six of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Natalie had had a dull spring. With Graham's departure for camp, she moved to the country house, carrying with her vast amounts of luggage, the innumerable things, large and small, which were necessary for her comfort. The installing of herself in her new and luxurious rooms gave her occupation for several days. She liked her new environment. She liked herself in it. The rose-coloured taffetas of her bedroom brought out the delicacy of her skin. The hangings of her bed, small and draped, reflected a faint colour into her face, and the morning inspection with a hand-mirror, which always followed her coffee, showed her at her best instead of her worst. Of her dressing-room she was not so sure. Its ivory-panelled walls, behind whose sliding panels were hung her gowns, her silk and satin chiffon negligees, her wraps and summer furs, all the vast paraphernalia with which she armed herself as a knight with armour, the walls seemed cold. She hated old blue, but old blue Rodney had insisted upon. He had held a bit of the taffeta to her cheek. It is delicious, Natalie, he said. It makes your eyes as blue as the sea. Always a decorator, she had replied, smiling. And standing in her blue room the first day of her arrival, and frowning at her reflection, she remembered his reply. Because I have no right with you to be anything else. He had stopped a moment, and had absently folded and refolded the bit of blue silk. Suddenly he said, what do you think I'm going to do now that our work together is done? Have you ever thought about that, Natalie? You are coming often to enjoy your handiwork." He had made an impulsive gesture. I'm not coming. I've been seeing too much of you as it is. If you want the truth, I'm just wretchedly unhappy, Natalie. You know I'm in love with you, don't you? I believe you think you are. Don't laugh, he almost snarled. I may laugh at my idiocy, but you haven't any right to. I know I'm ridiculous. I've known it for months. But it's pretty serious for me." He had meant it. There could be no doubt of that. It is the curious quality of very selfish women that they inspire a certain sort of love. They are likely to be loved often, even though the devotion they inspire is neither deep nor lasting. Big and single-hearted women are loved by one man and that for ever. Natalie had not laughed, but she had done what was almost as bad. She had patted him on the arm. "'Don't talk like that,' she said gently. "'You are all I have now, Rodney, and I don't want to lose you. I'm suffering horribly these days. You're my greatest comfort.' "'I've heard you say that of a chair.' 
As for loving me, you must not talk like that. Under the circumstances, it's indelicate. Oh, he had said, and looked at her quickly. I can love you, but it's indelicate to tell you about it? I am married, Rodney. Good God, do you think I ever forget it? There was a real change in their relationship, but neither of them understood it. The change was that Rodney was no longer playing. Little by little he dropped his artistic posing for her benefit, his cynical cleverness, his adroit simulation of passion. He no longer dramatized himself, because rather often he forgot himself entirely. His passion had ceased to be spurious, and it was none the less real because he loved not a real woman, but one of his own artistic creation. He saw in Natalie a misunderstood and suffering woman, bearing the burdens he knew of with dignity and a certain beauty. And behind her slightly theatrical silences, he guessed at other griefs, nobly born and only gently intimated. He developed, after a time, a certain suspicion of Clayton, not of his conduct, but of his character. These big men were often hard. It was that quality which made them successful. They married tender, gentle girls, and then repressed and trampled on them. Natalie became, in his mind, a crushed and broken thing, infinitely lonely and pathetic. And without in the least understanding, Natalie instinctively knew it was when she was wistful and dependent that he found her most attractive, and became wistful and dependent to a point that imposed even on herself. "'I've been very selfish with you, Rodney, dear,' she said, lifting sad eyes to his. "'I am going to be better. You must come often this summer, and I'll have some nice girls for you to play with.' "'Thank you,' he said stiffly. "'We'll have to be as gay as we can,' she sighed. "'I'm just a little dreary these days, you know.' It was rather absurd that they were in a shop, and that the clerk should return just then with certain cords, and that the discussion of certain shades of yellow made an anticlimax to it all. But in the car, later, he turned to her, roughly. "'You needn't ask any girls for me,' he said. "'I only want one woman, and if I can't have her, I don't want any one.' At first, the very fact that he could not have her, had been, unconsciously, the secret of her attraction. She was a perfect thing, and unattainable. He could sigh for her with longing and perfect safety. But as time went on, with that incapacity of any human emotion to stand still, but either to go on or to go back, his passion took on a more human and less poetic aspect. She satisfied him less, and he wanted more. For one thing, he dreamed that strange dream of mankind, of making ice burn, of turning snow to fire. The old chimera of turning the cold woman to warmth through his own passion began to obsess him. Sometimes he watched Natalie and had strange fancies. He saw her lit from within by a fire, which was not the reflection of his, but was recklessly her own. How wonderful she would be, he thought and at those times he had wild visions of going away with her into some beautiful wilderness, and there teaching her what she had missed in life. But although now he always wanted her, he was not always thinking of a wilderness. It was in his own world that he wanted her, to fit beautifully into his house, to move, exquisitely dressed, through ballrooms beside him. He wanted her, at those times, as the most perfect of all his treasures. He was still a collector. The summer only served to increase his passion. During the long hot days, when Clayton was abroad or in Washington, or working late at night, as he frequently did now, they were much together. Natalie's plans for gaiety had failed dismally. The city and the country houses near were entirely lacking in men. She found it a real grievance. "'I don't know what we are coming to,' she complained. The country club is like a girl's boarding school. I wish to heaven the war was over and things were sensible again. So during his weekend visits they spent most of the time together. There were always girls there, and now and then a few men, who always explained immediately that they had been turned down for the service or were going in the fall. I'm sure somebody has to stay home and attend to things here, she said to him one August night. But even when they are in America, they are rushing about, pretending to do things. 
One would think to see Clayton that he is the entire government. It's absurd. I wish I could go, he said unexpectedly. Don't be idiotic. You're much too old. Not as old as Clay. Oh, Clay, he's in a class by himself, she laughed lightly. Where is he now? In France, I think, probably telling them how to run the war. When is he coming back? I don't know. What do you mean by wishing you could go? Do you want me to tell you the truth? Not if it's disagreeable. Well, I will, and it's not very agreeable. I can't keep this up, Natalie. I can't keep on coming here, being in Clayton's house and eating his bread, while I'm in love with his wife. It isn't decent. He flung away his cigarette and bent forward. Don't you see that? he asked gently. Not while he is working for the country and Graham is abroad. I don't see why war needs to deprive me of my friends. I've lost everything else. His morals were matters of his private life, and they had been neither better nor worse than the average. But he had breeding and a sure sense of the fitness of things, and this present weekend visit, with the ostentatious care the younger crowd took to allow him time to see Natalie alone, was galling to him. It put him in a false position, what hurt more, perhaps, in an unfavorable light. The war had changed standards, too. Men were being measured, especially by women and those who failed to measure up were being eliminated with cruel swiftness, especially the men who stayed at home. With all this, too, there was a growing admiration for Clayton Spencer in their small circle. His name had been mentioned in connection with an important position in Washington. In the clubs there was considerable praise, and some envy, and Rodney knew that his affair with Natalie was the subject of much invidious comment. "'Do you love him?' he asked suddenly. I, why, of course I do. Do you mean that? I don't see what that has to do with our friendship. Oh, friendship, you know how I feel, and yet you go on bringing up that silly word. If you love him, you don't love me, and yet you've let me hang around all these months, knowing I am mad about you. You don't play the game, Natalie. What do you want to say? If you don't love Clayton, why don't you tell him so? He's honest enough. And I miss my guess if he wants a wife who cares for somebody else. She sat in the dusk, thinking, and he watched her. She looked very lovely in the setting which he himself had designed for her. She hated change, she loathed trouble of any sort, and she was, those days, just a little afraid of that strange, quiet Clayton who seemed eternally engrossed in war and the things of war. She glanced about at the white trellises that gleamed in the garden, at the silvery fleur de lys which was the fountain, at all the lovely things with which Clayton's wealth had allowed her to surround herself. And suddenly she knew she could not give them up. "'I don't see why you have to spoil everything,' she said fretfully. "'It had been so perfect. Of course I'm not going to say anything to Clay. He has enough to worry him now,' she added virtuously. Suddenly Rodney stooped and kissed her, almost savagely. "'Then I'm going,' he said. And to her great surprise he went. Alone in his room upstairs, Rodney had, in his anger, a glimpse of insight. He saw her, her life filled with small emotions, lacking the courage for big ones. He saw her, like a child, clutching one piece of cake and holding out a hand for another. He saw her, taking always, giving never. She's not worth it, he muttered. On the way to the station, he reflected bitterly over the past year. He did not blame her so much as he blamed himself. He had been playing a game, an attractive game. During the first months of it, his interest in Natalie had been subordinate to his interest in her house. He had been creating a beautiful thing, and he had had a very real joy in it. But lately he knew that his work on the house had been that he might build a background for Natalie. He had put into it the best of his ability, and she was not worth it. For some days he neither wrote nor called her up. He was not happy, but he had a sense of relief. He held his head a trifle higher, was his own man again, and began to make tentative inquiries as to whether he could be useful in the national emergency or not. He was half-hearted at first, but he found out something. 
The mere fact that he wanted to work in some capacity brought back some of his old friends. They had seemed to drop away before, but they came back heartily and with hands out. Work, said Terry Mackenzie at the club one day, looking up from the billiard table, where he was knocking balls about, rather at haphazard. Why, of course you can work. What about these new cantonments we're building all over the country? You ought to be useful there. They don't want them pretty, though. And Terry had laughed. But he put down his cue and took Rodney by the arm. Let's ask Nolan about it, he said. He's in the reading room, tearing the British strategy to pieces. He knows everything these days, from the draft law to the month's shipping losses. Come along. It was from Nolan, however, that Rodney first realized how seriously Clayton's friends were taking his affair with Natalie, and that not at first from anything he said. It was an indefinable aloofness of manner, a hostility of tone. Nolan never troubled himself to be agreeable unless it suited his inclination, and apparently Terry found nothing unusual in his attitude. But Rodney did. "'Something he could build,' said Nolan, repeating Terry's question. "'How do I know? There's a lot of building going on, Page, but it's not exactly your sort.' And there was a faint note of contempt in his voice. "'Who would be the man to see in Washington?' Rodney inquired. "'I'll look it up and let you know. You might call me up tomorrow.' Old Terry, having got them together, went back to his billiards and left them. Nolan sat down and picked up his paper with an air of ending the interview but he put it down again as Rodney turned to leave the room. Page? Yes? Do you mind having a few minutes' talk? Rodney braced himself. Not at all. But Nolan was slow to begin. He sat, newspaper on his knees, his deep-set eyes thoughtful. When he began, it was slowly. I am one of Clay Spencer's oldest friends, he said. He's a white man, the whitest man I know. Naturally, anything that touches him touches me in a way. Well? The name stands for a good bit, too. His father and his grandfather were the same sort. It's not often in this town that we have three generations without a breath of scandal against them. Rodney flushed angrily. What has that got to do with me? he demanded. I don't know. I don't want to know. I simply wanted to tell you that there are a good many of us who take a peculiar pride in Clayton Spencer, and who resent anything that reflects on a name we respect rather highly. That sounds like a threat. Not at all. I was merely calling your attention to something I thought perhaps you had forgotten. Then he got up, and his tone changed, became brisk, almost friendly. Now, about this building thing. If you're in earnest, I think it can be managed. You won't get any money to speak of, you know. I don't want any money, sullenly. Fine. You'll probably have to go west somewhere, and you'll be set down in the center of a hundred cornfields and told to make them overnight into a temporary town. I suppose you've thought of all that. I'll go wherever I'm sent. Come along to the telephone, then. Rodney hesitated. He felt cheap and despicable, and his anger was still hot. They wanted to get him out of town. He saw that. They took little enough trouble to hide it. Well, he would go. He wanted to go anyhow, and he would show them something, too, if he got a chance. He would show them that he was as much a man as Clayton Spencer. He eyed Nolan's insolently slouching figure with furious eyes. But he followed him. Had he secured an immediate appointment, things might have been different for him. Like Chris Valentine, he had had one decent impulse, and like Chris, too, there was a woman behind it. But Chris had been able to act on his impulse at once, and Rodney was compelled to wait while the mills of the government ground slowly. Then, on the 14th of August, Natalie telegraphed him, "'I've had bad news about Graham. Can you come?' He thought of Graham ill, possibly dead, and he took the next train late in the evening. It was midweek, and Natalie was alone. He had thought of that possibility in the train, and he was miserably uncomfortable, with all his joy at the prospect of seeing her again. He felt that the emergency must be his justification. Clayton was still abroad, and even his most captious critics would admit that Natalie should have a friend by if she were in trouble. 
Visions of Graham wounded filled his mind. He was anxious, restless, and in a state of the highest nervous tension. And there was no real emergency. He found Natalie in the drawing-room, pacing the floor. She was still in her morning dress, and her eyes were red and swollen. She gave him both her hands, and he was surprised to find them cold as ice. "'I knew you would come,' she said. "'I am so alone, so terrified.' He could hardly articulate. "'What is it?' "'Graham has been ordered abroad.' He stood still, staring at her, and then he dropped her hands. "'Is that all?' he asked dully. "'No.' "'Good heavens, Natalie, tell me. I've been frantic with anxiety about you.' "'He was married tonight to Delight Haverford.' And still he stared at her. "'Then he's not hurt or ill?' "'I didn't say he was. Good gracious, Rodney, isn't that bad enough?' "'But what did you expect? He would have to go abroad some time. You knew that. I'm sorry. But why in God's name didn't you say in your wire what the trouble was?' You sound exactly like Clay." She was entirely incapable of understanding. She stood before him, straight and resentful, and yet strangely wistful and appealing. "'I send you word that my only son is going to France, that he is married without so much as consulting me, that he is going to war and may never come back. I needed you, and you said once that when I needed you, wherever you were, you would come. So I sent for you, and now you act like like clay. Have you anyone here? The servants. Good gracious, Rodney, are you worrying about that? Only for you, Natalie. We resent anything that reflects on a name we respect rather highly. That was what Nolan had said. I'm sorry about Graham, dearest. I'm sorry about any trouble that comes to you. You know that, Natalie. I'm only regretful that you have let me place you in an uncomfortable position. If my being here is known— Look here, Natalie, dear. I hate to bother you, but I'll have to take one of the cars and go back to the city tonight. Aren't you being rather absurd? He hesitated. He could not tell her of that awkward talk with Nolan. There were many things he could not tell her. His own desire to rehabilitate himself among the men he knew, his own new-born feeling that to take advantage of Clayton's absence on business connected with the war was peculiarly indefensible. "'I shall order the car at once,' she said, and touched a bell. When she turned, he was just behind her, but although he held out his arms, she evaded them, her eyes hard and angry. "'I wish you would try to understand,' he said. "'I do, very thoroughly, too thoroughly. You are afraid for yourself, not for me. I am in trouble, but that is a secondary consideration. Don't bother about me, Rodney. I have borne a great deal alone in my life, and I can bear this." She turned, and went with considerable dignity out of the door. "'Natalie!' he called. But he heard her, with the gentle rustle of silks, going up the staircase. It did not add to his comfort that she had left him to order the car. All through the night Rodney rode and thought. He was angry at Natalie, but he was angrier at himself. He felt that he had been brutal, unnecessarily callous. After all, her only son was on his way to war. It was on the cards that he might not come back. And he had let his uneasiness dominate his sympathy. He had lost her, but then he had never had her. He never could have her. Halfway to town, on a back road, the car broke down and after vainly endeavouring to start it, the chauffeur set off on foot to secure help. Rodney slept uncomfortably, and wakened with the movement of the machine to find it broad day. That was awkward, for Natalie's car was conspicuous, marked, too, with her initials. He asked to be set down at a suburban railway station, and was dismayed to find it crowded with early commuters, who stared at the big car with interest. On the platform, eyeing him with unfriendly eyes, was Nolan. Rodney made a movement toward him. The situation was intolerable, absurd. But Nolan turned his back and proceeded to read his newspaper. Perhaps not in years had Rodney Page faced the truth about himself so clearly as he did that morning, 
riding into the city on the train which carried, somewhat ahead, that quietly contemptuous figure that was Dennis Nolan. Faced the truth, saw himself for what he was, and loathed the thing he saw. For a little time, too, it was given him to see Natalie for what she was, for what she would always be, her sole contribution to life, the web of her selfishness, carefully woven, floating apparently aimlessly, and yet snaring and holding relentlessly whatever it touched, killing freedom. He saw Clayton and Graham and himself, feeders for her monstrous complacency and vanity, and he made a definite determination to free himself. I'm through, he reflected savagely. I'll show them something, too. I'll— He hesitated. How lovely she was! And she cared for him. She was small and selfish and unspeakably vain, but she cared for him. The war had done something for Rodney Page. He no longer dreamed the old dream of turning her ice to fire. But he dreamed for a moment something finer. He saw Natalie his, and growing big and fine through love. He saw himself and Natalie, like cards in the game of life, redealt. A new combination, a winning hand. End of chapter 46「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキャスト」「ポッドキ I have an opportunity to go over and see what English women are doing in the way of standing behind their men at war. Then I am to tell our women at home. Not that they need it now, bless them. I believe you will be glad to know that I am to be on the same side of the ocean with Graham. I could get to him, I think, if anything should go wrong. Will you send him the enclosed address? But, my dear, the address is for him, not for you. You must not write to me. I have used up every particle of moral courage I possess as it is, and I am holding this in my mind as you must. Time is a great healer of all wounds. We could have been happy together, oh, my dear, so very happy together. Now that I am going, let me be frank for once. I have given you the finest thing I am capable of. I am better for caring for you as I have, as I do. But those days in the hospital told me we couldn't go on. Things like that don't stand still. Maybe we are only human clay. Maybe if the old days were still here we might have compromised with life. I don't know. But I do know that we never will, now. After all, we have had a great deal, and we still have. It is a wonderful thing to know that somewhere in the world is some person who loves you. To waken up in the morning to it. To go to sleep remembering it, and to have kept that love fine and clean is a wonderful thing, too. I am not always on a pinnacle. There have been plenty of times when the mere human want of you has sent me to the dust. Is it wrong to tell you that? But of course not. You know it. But you and I know this, Clay dear. Love that is hopeless, that cannot end in marriage, does one of two things. Either it degrades or it exalts. It leaves its mark always, but that mark does not need to be a stain. Clayton lived, for a time after that, in a world very empty and very full. The new plant was well under way. Not only was he about to make shells for the government at a nominal profit, but Washington was asking him to assume new and wide responsibilities. He accepted. He wanted so to fill the hours that there would be no time to remember. But more than that he was actuated by a fine and glowing desire to serve. Perhaps underlying it all was the determination to be, in every way, the man Audrey thought him to be. And there was, too, a square-jawed resolution to put behind Graham, and other boys like Graham, all the shells and ammunition they needed. He worked hard, more than hard. Old Terry, meeting him one day in the winter that followed, was shocked at his haggard face. "'Better take a little time off, Clay,' he suggested. 
We're going to Miami next week. How about ten days or so? Fishing is good this year. Can't very well take a holiday just now. Too much to do, Terry. Old Terry went home and told his wife. Looks like the devil, he said. He'll go down sick one of these days. I suppose it's no use telling Natalie. None whatever, said Mrs. Terry. And anyhow, it's a thing I shouldn't care to tell Natalie. What do you mean, not care to tell Natalie? Hard work doesn't make a man forget how to smile. Oh, come now. He's cheerful enough. If you mean because Graham's fighting? That's only part of it, said Mrs. Terry sagely, and relapsed into one of the poignant silences that drove old Terry to a perfect frenzy of curiosity. Then, in January of 1918, a crisis came to Clayton and Natalie Spencer. Graham was wounded. Clayton was at home when the news came. Natalie had been having one of her ill-assorted, meticulously elaborate dinner-parties, and when the guests were gone they were for a moment alone in the drawing-room of their townhouse. Clayton was fighting in himself the sense of irritation Natalie's dinners always left, especially the recent one. She was serving, he knew, too much food. In the midst of the agitation on conservation, her dinners ran their customary seven courses. There was too much wine, too but it occurred to him that only the wine had made the dinner endurable. Then he tried to force himself into better humour. Natalie was as she was, and if in an unhappy, struggling, dying world she found happiness in display, God knew there was little enough happiness. He was not at home very often. He could not spoil her almost childish content in the small things that made up her life. I think it was very successful, she said, surveying herself in one of the corner mirrors. Do you like my gown, Clay? It's very lovely. It's new. I've been getting some clothes, Clay. You'll probably shriek at the bills. But all this talk about not buying clothes is nonsense, you know. The girls who work in the shops have to live. Naturally. Of course there is other work open to them now. In munition plants, I dare say, to be blown up. He winced. The thought of that night the year before, when the plant went, still turned him sick. "'Don't buy too many things, my dear,' he said gently. "'You know how things are.' "'I know it's your fault that they are as they are,' she persisted. "'Oh, I know it was noble of you and all that. The country's crazy about you. But still, I think it was silly. Everyone else is making money out of things, and you—a lot of thanks you'll get when the war's over.' I don't particularly want thanks." Then the doorbell rang in the back of the house, and Buckham answered it. He was conscious at once that Natalie stiffened, and that she was watchful and a trifle pale. Buckham brought in a telegram on a tray. "'Give it to me, Buckham,' Natalie said, in a strained voice, and held out her hand for it. When she saw it was for Clayton, however, she relaxed. As he tore it open, Clayton was thinking. Evidently Natalie had been afraid of his seeing some message for her. Was it possible that Natalie— He opened it. After what seemed a long time, he looked up. Her eyes were on him. "'Don't be alarmed, my dear,' he said. "'It is not very bad. But Graham has been slightly wounded.' "'Sit down,' he said sharply, as he saw her sway. "'You are lying to me,' she said, in a dreadful voice. "'He's dead.' He is not dead, Natalie. He tried to put her into a chair, but she resisted him fiercely. Let me alone. I want to see that telegram. And, very reluctantly, at last he gave it to her. Graham was severely wounded. It was from a man in his own department at Washington who had just seen the official list. The nature of his wounding had not been stated. Natalie looked up from the telegram with a face like a painted mask. This is your doing, she said. You wanted him to go. You sent him into this. He will die, and you will have murdered him. The thought came to him, in that hour of stress, that she was right. Pitifully, damnably right. He had not wanted Graham to go, but he had wanted him to want to go. A thousand thoughts flashed through his mind, of delight sleeping somewhere quietly after her day's work at the camp of Graham himself, of that morning after the explosion, and his frank, pitiful confession. 
and again of Graham, suffering, perhaps dying, and with none of his own about him. And through it all was the feeling that he must try to bring Natalie to reason, that it was incredible that she should call him his own son's murderer. "'We must not think of his dying,' he said. "'We must only think that he is going to live, and to come back to us, Natalie, dear.' She flung off the arm he put around her. And that, he went on, feeling for words out of the dreadful confusion in his mind, if the worst comes that he has done a magnificent thing. There is no greater thing, Natalie. That won't bring him back to us, she said, still in that frozen voice. And suddenly she burst into hard, terrible crying. All that night he sat outside her door, for she would not allow him to come in. He had had Washington on the telephone, but when at last he got the connection, it was to learn that no further details were known. Toward dawn there came the official telegram from the War Department, but it told nothing more. Natalie was hysterical. He had sent for a doctor, and with Madeleine in attendance, the medical man had worked over her for hours. Going out toward morning, he had found Clayton in the hall, and had looked at him sharply. "'Better go to bed, Mr. Spencer,' he advised. "'It may not be as bad as you think, and they're doing fine surgery over there.' And, as Clayton shook his head, "'Mrs. Spencer will come round all right. She's hysterical, naturally. She'll be sending for you before long.' With the dawn, Clayton's thoughts cleared. If he and Natalie were ever to get together at all, it should be now, with this common grief between them. Perhaps, after all, it was not too late to rebuild his house of life. He had failed. Perhaps they had both failed, but the real responsibility was his. Inside the room he could hear her moaning, a low, monotonous, heart-breaking moan. He was terribly sorry for her. She had no exaltation to help her no strength of soul, no strength of any sort. And, as men will under stress, he tried to make a bargain with his God. "'Let him live,' he prayed. "'Bring him back to us, and I will try again. I'll do better. I've been a rotten failure as far as she is concerned. But I'll try.' He felt somewhat better after that, although he felt a certain ignominy, too, that always, until such a time, he had gone on his own, as it were and that now, when he no longer sufficed for himself, he should beseech the Almighty. Natalie had had a sleeping powder, and at last he heard her moaning cease, and the stealthy movements of her maid as she lowered the window-shades. It was dawn. During the next two days Clayton worked as he had never worked before, still perhaps with that unspoken pact in mind. Work, too, to forget. He had sent several cables, but no reply came until the third day. He did not sleep at night. He did not even go to bed. He sat in the low chair in his dressing-room, dozing occasionally, to waken with a start at some sound in the hall. Now and again, as the trained nurse who was watching Natalie at night moved about in the hallways, he would sit up, expecting a summons that did not come. She still refused to see him. It depressed and frightened him for how could he fulfil his part of the compact when she so sullenly shut him out of her life? He was singularly simple in his fundamental beliefs. There was a great power somewhere, call it what one might, and it dealt out justice and mercy as one deserved it. On that, of course, had been built an elaborate edifice of creed and dogma, but curiously enough it all fell away now. He was, in those night hours, again the boy who had prayed for fair weather for circus day, and had promised in return to read his Bible through during the next year, and had done it. In the daytime, however, he was a man suffering terribly, and facing the complexities of his life alone. One thing he knew, this was decisive. Either, under the stress of a common trouble, he and Natalie would come together to make the best they could of the years to come, or they would be hopelessly alienated. But that was secondary to Graham. Everything was secondary to Graham, indeed. He had cabled Audrey, and he drew a long breath when on the third day a cable came from her. She had located Graham at last. He had been shot in the chest, and there were pneumonia symptoms. "'Shall stay with him,' she ended, 
and shall send daily reports. Next to his God he put his faith in Audrey. Almost he prayed to her. Dunbar, now a captain in the Military Intelligence Bureau, visiting him in his office one day, found Clayton's face an interesting study. Old lines of repression, new ones of anxiety, marked him deeply. The boy, of course, he thought, and then reflected that it takes time to carve such lines as were written in the face of the man across the desk from him. Time and a woman, he considered shrewdly. His mind harked back to that dinner in the Spencer house, when diplomatic relations had been broken off with Germany and war seemed imminent. It was the wife, probably. He remembered that she had been opposed to war and to the boys going. There were such women in the country. There were fewer of them all the time, but they existed, women who saw in war only sacrifice. Women who counted no cost too high for peace. If they only hurt themselves it did not matter, but they could and did do incredible damage. Clayton was going through some papers he had brought, and Dunbar had time to consider what to him was an interesting problem. Mrs. Spencer had kept the boy from immediate enlistment. He had wanted to go, Dunbar knew that. If she had allowed him to go, the affair with Anna Klein would have been ended. He knew all that story now. Then, if there had been no affair, Herman would not have blown up the munition works, and a good many lives, valuable to themselves at least, might have been saved. Curious, he reflected. One woman, and she probably sleeps well at nights, and goes to church on Sundays. Clayton passed back his papers, and ran a hand over his heavy hair. They seem to be all right, he said. Dunbar rose. Hope the next news will be better, Mr. Spencer. I hope so. I haven't told you, I think, that we have traced Rudolf Klein. Clayton's face set. He's got away, unfortunately, over the border into Mexico. They have a regular system there, the Germans, an underground railway to Mexico City. They have a paymaster on our side of the line. They even bank in one of our banks. Oh, we'll get them yet, of course, but they're damnably clever. I suppose there is no hope of getting Rudolf Klein. Not while the Germans are running Mexico, Captain Dunbar replied dryly. He's living in a Mexican town just over the border. We're watching him. If he puts a foot on this side, we'll grab him. Clayton sat back after he had gone. He was in his old office at the mill, where Joey had once formed his unofficial partnership with the firm. Outside in the mill yard there was greater activity than ever, but many of the faces were new. The engineer who had once run the yard engine was building bridges in France. Hutchinson had heard the call and was learning to fly in Florida. The service flag over his office door showed hundreds of stars, and more were being added constantly. Joey dead, Graham wounded, his family life on the verge of disruption, and Audrey. Then, out of the chaos, there came an exaltation. He had given himself his son, the wealth he had hoped to have, but thank God he had had something to give. There were men who could give nothing, like old Terry Mackenzie knocking billiard balls around at the club, and profanely wistful that he had had no son to go. His mind ranged over those pathetic, prosperous, sunless men who filed into the club late in the afternoons, and over the last editions and whiskey and sodas fought their futile warfare their battleground a newspaper map, their upraised voices their only weapons. On parade days, when the long lines of boys in khaki went by, they were silent, heavy, inutile. They were too old to fight. The biggest thing in their lives was passing them by, as passed the lines of marching boys, and they had no part in it. They were feeding their hungry spirits on the dregs of war, on committee meetings and public gatherings, and they were being useful. But the great exaltation of offering their best was not for them. He was living a tragedy, but a greater tragedy was that of the childless. And back of that again was the woman who had not wanted children. There were many men today who were feeling the selfishness of a woman at home, men who had lost, somehow, their pride, their feeling of being a part of great things, men who went home at night to comfortable dwellings, with no vacant chair at the table, 
and dined in a peace they had not earned. Natalie had at least given him a son. He took that thought home with him in the evening. He stopped at a florist's and bought a great box of flowers for her, and sent them into her room with a little note. "'Won't you let me come in and try to comfort you?' But Madeleine brought the box out again, and there was pity in her eyes. "'Mrs. Spencer cannot have them in the room, sir. She says the odour of the flowers makes her ill.' He knew Madeleine had invented the excuse, that Natalie had simply rejected his offering. He went downstairs, and made a pretense of dining alone in the great room. It was there that Audrey's daily cable found him. Buckham brought it in, in shaking fingers, and stood by, white and still, while he opened it. Clayton stood up. He was very white, but his voice was full and strong. "'He is better, Buckham, better!' Suddenly Buckham was crying. His austere face was distorted, his lean body trembling. Clayton put his arm around the bowed old shoulders. And in that moment as they stood there, master and man, Clayton Spencer had a flash of revelation. There was love and love, the love of a man for a woman, and of a woman for a man, of a mother for the child at her knee, of that child for its mother but that the great actuating motive of a man's maturity, of the middle span, was vested along with his dreams, his pride and his love, in his son, his man-child. Buckham, carrying his coffee into the library somewhat later, found him with his head down on his desk, and the cablegram clutched in his outstretched hands. He tiptoed out very quietly. End of chapter 47《Chapter Forty Eight of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Clayton's first impulse was to take the cable to Natalie, to brush aside the absurd defences she had erected, and behind which she cowered, terrified but obstinate, to say to her, He is living, he is going to live, but this war is not over yet. If we want him to come through, we must stand together. We must deserve to have him come back to us. But by the time he reached the top of the stairs, he knew he could not do it. She would not understand. She would think he was using Graham to further a reconciliation, and after her first joy was over, he knew that he would see again that cynical smile that always implied that he was dramatizing himself. Nothing could dim his strong inner joy, but something of its outer glow faded. He would go to her later, not now. Nothing must spoil this great thankfulness of his. He gave Madeleine the cable, and went down again to the library. After a time he began to go over the events of the past eighteen months. His return from the continent, and that curious sense of unrest that had followed it, the opening of his eyes to the futility of his life. His failure to Natalie, and her failure to him, Graham, made a man by war, and by the love of a good woman, Chris, ending his sordid life in a blaze of glory, and forever forgiven his tawdry sins because of his one big hour. War took, but it gave also. It had taken Joey, for instance, but Joey had had his great moment. It was better to have one great moment and die than to drag on through useless years. And it was the same with a nation. A nation needed its hour. It was only in a crisis that it could know its own strength. How many of them, who had been at that dinner of Natalie's months before, had met their crisis bravely? Nolan was in France now. Dr. Haverford was at the front. Audrey was nursing Graham. Marion Hayden was in a hospital training school. Rodney Page was still building wooden barracks in a cantonment in Indiana and making good. He himself— they could never go back, none of them, to the old, smug, complacent, luxurious days. They could no more go back than Joey could return to life again. War was the irrevocable step as final as death itself. And he remembered something Nolan had said, just before he sailed. We have had one advantage, Clay, or maybe it is not an advantage after all. Do you realize that you and I have lived through the Golden Age? We have seen it come and seen it go. 
the greatest height of civilization since the world began the greatest achievements the most opulent living and we saw it all crash it will be a thousand years before the world will be ready for another and later i suppose every life has its golden age generally we think it is youth i'm not so sure youth is looking ahead it has its hopes and its disappointments the golden age in a man's life ought to be the age of fulfilment it's nearer the forties than the twenties have you reached it i'm going to on the other side and clayton had smiled you are going to reach it he said we are always going to find it nolan it is always just ahead and nolan had given him one of his quick understanding glances there could be no golden age for him for the golden age for a man meant fulfilment the time came to every man when he must sit at the west window of his house of life and look toward the sunset if he faced that sunset alone he heard madeleine carrying natalie's dinner tray and when she left the pantry she came to the door of the library mrs spencer would like to see you sir thank you madeleine i'll go up very soon suddenly he knew that he did not want to go up to natalie's scented room she had shut him out when she was in trouble she had not cared that he too was in distress she had done her best to invalidate that compact he had made she had always invalidated him to go back to the old way to the tribute she enforced to feed her inordinate vanity to the old hypocrisy of their relationship to live again with the old lie was impossible he got up he would not try to buy himself happiness at the cost of turning her adrift but he must some way buy his self-respect he heard her then on the staircase that soft rustle which it seemed to him had rasped the silk of his nerves all their years together with its insistence on her dainty helplessness her femininity her right to protection the tap of her high heels came closer he drew a long breath and turned, determinedly smiling, to face the door. Almost at once he saw that she was frightened. She had taken pains to look her best, but then she always did that. She was rouged to the eyes, and the floating white chiffon of her negligee gave to her slim body the illusion of youth, that last illusion to which she so desperately clung. But she was frightened. She stood in the doorway, one hand holding aside the heavy velvet curtain, and looked at him with wide, penciled eyes. "'Clay?' "'Yes, come in. Shall I have Buckham light a fire?' She came in slowly. "'Do you suppose that cable is reliable?' "'I should think so.' "'He may have a relapse.' "'We mustn't worry about what may come. He is better now. The chances are that he'll stay better.' probably i suppose because i have been so ill he felt the demand for sympathy but he had none to give and he felt something else natalie was floundering an odd word for her always so sure of herself she was frightened unsure of herself and floundering why are you going to be in to-night yes she gave a curious little gesture then she evidently made up her mind and she faced him defiantly of course, if I had known he was going to be better, I'd— Clay, I wired yesterday for Rodney Page. He arrives to-night. Rodney? Yes. I don't think I quite understand, Natalie. Why did you wire for him? You wouldn't understand, of course. I was in trouble. He has been my best friend. I tried to bear it alone, but I couldn't, I— Alone? You wouldn't see me. I couldn't, Clay why because if graham had died her mouth trembled she put her hand to her throat you would have blamed me for his death yes then even now if yes the sheer cruelty of it sent him pale yet it was not so much deliberate as unconscious she was forcing herself to an unwanted honesty it was her honest conviction that he was responsible for graham's wounding and danger let me get to the bottom of this he said quietly you hold me responsible very well how far does that take us 
How far does that take you? To Rodney? You needn't be brutal. Rodney understands me. He, he cares for me, Clay. I see. And since you sent for him, I take it you care for Rodney. I don't know. I... Isn't it time you do know? For God's sake, Natalie, make up your mind to some course and stick to it. But accustomed as he was to the curious turns of her mind, he was still astounded to have her turn on him and accuse him of trying to get rid of her. It was not until later that he realized, in that attitude of hers, her old instinct of shifting the responsibility from her own shoulders. And then Rodney was announced. The unreality of the situation persisted. Rodney's strained face and uneasy manner, his uniform, the blank pause when he learned that Graham was better, and when the ordinary banalities of greeting were over. Beside Clayton he looked small, dapper, and wretchedly uncomfortable, and yet even Clayton had to acknowledge a sort of dignity in the man. He felt sorry for him, for the disillusion that was to come, and at the same time he felt an angry contempt for him, that he should have forced so theatrical a situation that the night which saw Graham's beginning recovery should be tarnished by the wild clutch after happiness of two people who had done so little to earn it. He saw another totally different scene for a moment. He saw Graham in his narrow bed that night in some dimly lighted hospital ward, and he saw Audrey beside him, watching and waiting and praying. A wild desire to be over there, one of that little group, almost overcame him and instead, "'Natalie has not been well, Rodney,' he said. "'I rather think if you have anything to say to me, we would better talk alone.' Natalie went out, her draperies trailing behind her. Clayton listened as she moved slowly up the stairs. For the last time he heard that soft rustling which had been the accompaniment to so many of the most poignant hours of his life. He listened until it had died away. End of chapter 48《Chapter 49 of Dangerous Days by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For months Rudolf Klein had been living in a little Mexican town on the border. There were really two towns, but they were built together with only a strip of a hundred feet between. Along this strip ran the border itself, with a tent pitched on the American side, and patrols of soldiers guarding it. The American side was bright and clean, orderly and self-respecting, but only a hundred feet away, unkempt, dusty, with adobe buildings and a notorious gambling hell in plain view, was Mexico itself, leisurely, improvident, not over-scrupulous Mexico. At first Rudolph was fairly contented. It amused him. He liked the idleness of it. He liked kicking the innumerable Mexican dogs out of his way. He liked baiting the croupiers in the owl. He liked wandering into that notorious resort and shoving Hindus, Chinamen, and Mexicans out of the way while he flung down a silver dollar and watched the dealers with cunning, avaricious eyes. He liked his own situation, too. It amused him to think that here he was safe, while only a hundred feet away he was a criminal, fugitive from the law. He liked to go to the very border itself and jeer at the men on guard there. "'If I was on that side,' he would say, "'you'd have me in one of those rotten uniforms, wouldn't you? Come on over, fellows. The liquor's fine.' Then, one day, a Chinaman he had insulted gave him an unexpected shove, and he had managed to save himself by a foot from the clutch of a quiet-faced man in plain clothes who spent a certain amount of time lounging on the other side of the border. That had sobered him. He kept away from the border itself after that, although the temptation of it drew him. After a few weeks, when the novelty had worn off, he began to hunger for the clean little American town across the line. He wanted to talk to someone. He wanted to boast, to be candid. These Mexicans only laughed when he bragged to them. But he dared not cross. There was a high fenced enclosure behind the Owl, the segregated district of the town. There, in tiny one-roomed houses, built in rows like barracks, were the girls and women who had drifted to this jumping-off place of the world. 
In the daytime they slept or sat on the narrow ramshackle porches, untidy, noisy, unspeakably wretched. At night, however, they blossomed forth in tawdry finery, in the dancing space behind the gambling tables. Some of them were fixtures. They had drifted there, from New Orleans, perhaps, or Southern California, and they lacked the initiative or the money to get away. But most of them came in, stayed a month or two, found the place a nightmare with its shootings and stabbings, and then disappeared. At first Rudolph was popular in this hell of the underworld. He spent money easily, he danced well, he had audacity and a sort of sardonic humour. They asked no questions, those poor wretches, who had themselves slid over the edge of life. They took what came, grateful for little pleasures, glad even to talk their own tongue. And then, one broiling August day, late in the afternoon, when the compound was usually seething with the first fetid life of the day, Rudolph found it suddenly silent when he entered it, and hostile, contemptuous eyes on him. A girl with Anna Klein's eyes, a girl he had begun to fancy, suddenly said, "'Draft Dodger!' There was a ripple of laughter around the compound. They commenced to bait him, those women he would not have wiped his feet on at home. They literally laughed him out of the compound. He went home to a stifling, windowless adobe room, with its sagging narrow bed, its candle, its broken crockery, and he stood in the centre of the room, and chewed his nails with fury. After a time he sat down and considered what to do next. He would have to move on some time. As well now as ever, he was sick of the place. He began preparations to move on, gathering up the accumulation of months of careless living for destruction. He picked some newspapers, preparatory to throwing them away, and a name caught his attention. Standing there, inside his doorway in the Mexican dusk, he read of Graham's recent wounding, his mending, and the fact that he had won the Croix de Guerre. Supreme bitterness was Rudolph's then. Stage stuff, he muttered. But in the depths of his warped soul there was bitter envy. He knew well with what frightened yet adoring eyes Anna Klein had devoured that news of Graham Spencer while for him there was the girl in the compound back of the owl, with Anna Klein's eyes, filled when she looked at him with that bitterest scorn of all, the contempt of the wholly contemptible. That night he went to the owl. He had shaved and had his hair cut, and he wore his only remaining decent suit of clothes. He passed through the swinging gate in the railing, which separated the dancing floor from the tables, and went up to the line of girls, sitting in that saddest waiting of all the world, along the wall. There was an ominous silence at his approach. He planted himself in front of the girl with eyes like Anna Klein. "'Are you going to dance?' "'Not with you,' she replied evenly, and again the ripple of laughter spread. "'Why not?' "'Because you're a coward,' she said. "'I'd rather dance with a Chinaman.' "'If you think I'm here because I'm afraid to fight, you can think again. Not that I care what you think.' He had meant to boast a little, to intimate that he had pulled off a big thing, but he saw that he was ridiculous. The situation infuriated him. Suddenly he burst into foul-mouthed invective, until one of the girls said, wearily, "'Oh, cut that out, you slacker!' and he knew that no single word he had used against them, out of a vocabulary both extensive and horrible, was to them so degraded as that single one applied to him. Late that night he received a tip from a dealer at one of the vingt-et-un tables. There were inquiries being made for him across the border. That very evening the dealer had gone across for a sack of flour, and he had heard about it. "'You'd better get out,' said the dealer. I'm as safe here as I'd be in Mexico City. Don't be too sure, son. You're not any too popular here. There's such a thing as being held up and carried over the border. It's been done before now. I'm sick of this hole, anyhow, Rudolph muttered, and moved away in the crowd. The mechanical piano was banging in the dance hall as he slipped out into the darkness, under the clear starlight of the Mexican night, and the gate of the compound stood open. He passed it with an oath. Long before he had provided for such a contingency. By the same agency which had got him to the border, he could now be sent further on. 
At something after midnight, clad in old clothes and carrying on his back a rough outfit of a blanket and his remaining wardrobe, he knocked at the door of a small adobe house on the border of the town. An elderly German with a candle admitted him. "'Well, I'm off,' Rudolph said roughly. "'And time enough, too,' said the German gruffly. Rudolph was sullenly silent. He was in this man's power, and he knew it. But the German was ready enough to do his part. For months he had been doing this very thing, starting through the desert toward the south, slackers and fugitives of all descriptions. He gathered together the equipment, a map with water holes marked, a canteen covered with a dirty plaid cloth casing, a small supply of condensed foods and tins mostly, and a letter to certain Germans in Mexico City who would receive hospitably any American fugitives and ask no questions. "'How about money?' Rudolph inquired. The German shrugged his shoulders. "'You will not need money in the desert,' he said. "'And you have spent much money here on the women. You should have saved it.' "'I was told you would give me money.' But the German shook his head. "'You will find money in Mexico City if you get there.' he said cryptically, and Rudolph found neither threats nor entreaties of any avail. He started out of the town, turning toward the south and the west. Before him there stretched days of lonely travelling, through the sand and cactus of the desert, of blistering sun and cold nights, of anxious searches for water-holes. It was because of the water-holes that he headed southwest, for such as they were lay in tiny hidden oases in the canyons. Almost as soon as he left the town, he was in the desert, a detached ranch, a suggestion of a road, a fenced-in cotton field or two, an irrigation ditch, and then sand. He was soft from months of inaction, from the cactus whiskey of Mexico, too, that ate into a man like a corrosive acid. But he went on steadily, putting behind him as rapidly as possible the border, and the girls who had laughed at him. He travelled by a pointed mountain which cut off the stars at the horizon, and as the miles behind him increased, in spite of his growing fatigue, his spirits rose. Before him lay the fullness of life again. Mexico City was a stake worth gambling for. He was gambling, he knew. He had put up his life, and his opponent was thirst. He knew that well enough, too, and the figure rather amused him. "'Playing against that, all right,' he muttered. He paused and turned around. The sun had lifted over the rim of the desert, a red disk which turned the gleaming white alkali patches to rose. By God, he said, that's the ante, is it? A red chip. A caravan of mules was coming up from the head of the Gulf of California. It moved in a cloud of alkali dust and sand, its ore sacks coated white. The animals straggled along, wandering out of the line incessantly, and thrust back into place by muleteers who cracked long whips and addressed them vilely. At a place where a small rock placed on another marked a side trail to water, the caravan turned and moved toward the mountains. Close as they appeared, the outfit was three hours getting to the foothills. There was a low meadow now, covered with pale green grass. Quail scurried away under the mesquite bushes, stealthily whistling, and here and there the two stones still marked the way. With the instinct of desert creatures, the mules hurried their pace. Pack saddles creaked, spurs jingled. Life, insistent, thirsty life, quickened the dead plain. A man rode ahead. He dug his spurs into his horse and cantered, elbows flapping, broad-brimmed hat drawn over his eyes. For hours he had been fighting the demon of thirst. His tongue was dry, his lips cracking. The trail continued to be marked with its double stones, but it did not enter the cool canyon ahead. It turned and skirted the base of the bare mountain slope. The man's eyes sharpened. He knew very definitely what he was looking for, and at last he saw it, a circle of flat stones some twenty feet across, the desert sign for a buried spring. But there was something inside the circle, something which lay still. The man put his horse to the gallop again. There was a canteen lying in the trail, a canteen covered with a dirty plaid casing. The horse's hoof struck it, and it gave out a dry, metallic sound. 
poor devil muttered the rider he dismounted and turned the figure over god he said and water under him all the time then he dragged the quiet figure outside the ring of stones and getting a spade from his saddle fell to digging in the centre a foot below the surface water began to appear clear cold water he lay down flat and drank out of the pool clayton spencer was alone in his house in the month since natalie had gone he had not been there a great deal he had been working very hard he had not been able to shoulder arms but he had nevertheless fought a good fight he was very tired during the day a sort of fierce energy upheld him because in certain things he had failed he was the more determined to succeed in others not for himself ambition of that sort had died of the higher desire to serve his country but because the sense of failure in his private life haunted him the house was very quiet buckham came in to mend the fire issuing from the shadows like a lean old ghost and eyeing him with tender faded old eyes is there anything else sir thanks no buckham yes mr spencer i have not spoken about it but i think you have understood mrs spencer is not coming back yes mr spencer i had meant to close the house but certain things captain spencer's wife expects a child i would rather like to have her come here for the birth after that if the war is over i shall turn the house over to them you would stay on i hope buckham i'll stay sir i his face worked nervously i feel toward the captain as i would to my own son sir i have already thought that perhaps the old nursery has been cleaned and aired for weeks mr spencer clayton felt a thrill of understanding for the old man through all the years he had watched and served them he had reflected their joys and their sorrows he had suffered the family destiny without having shaped it he had lived vicariously their good hours and their bad and now in his old age he was waiting again for the vicarious joy of graham's child but you'll not be leaving the house sir i don't know i shall keep my rooms but i shall probably live at the club the young people ought to be alone for a while there are readjustments you never married buckham no mr spencer i intended to at one time i came to this country to make a home and as i was rather a long time about it she married someone else clayton caught the echo of an old pain in buckham's repressed voice buckham too was there in the life of every man some woman tragedy buckham sitting alone in his west window and looking toward the sunset buckham had his memories she lost her only son at neuve chapelle buckham was saying quietly in a way it was as though i had lost a boy she never cared for the man she married he was a fine boy sir i you may remember the night i was taken ill in the pantry is her husband still living no mr spencer do you ever think of going back and finding her i have sir but i don't know i like to remember her as she used to be i have some beautiful memories and i think sometimes it is better to live on memories they are more real than well than reality sir long after buckham had withdrawn clayton paced the floor of the library was buckham right was the real life of a man his mental life was any love so great as a man's dream of love peace was on the way soon this nightmare of war would be over and in the great awakening love would again take the place of hate love of man for man of nation for nation peace and the things of peace time to live time to hope with the death cloud gone time to work and time to play time to love a woman and cherish her for the rest of life if only his failure with natalie had lost him something she had cost him his belief in himself her last words had crystallized his own sense of failure i admit all your good qualities clay heaven knows they are evident enough but you are the sort people admire they don't love you they never will yet that night he had had a curious sense that old buckham loved him maybe he was the sort men loved and women admired 
He sat down and leaned back in his chair, watching the fire logs. He felt very tired. What was it that Buckham had said about memories? But Buckham was old. He was young, young and strong. There would be many years, and even his most poignant memories would grow dim. Audrey! Audrey! From the wall over the mantel Natalie's portrait still surveyed the room with its delicate complacence. He looked up at it. Yes, Natalie had been right. He was not the sort to make a woman happy. There were plenty of men, young men, men still plastic, men who had not known shipwreck, and some such man Audrey would marry. Perhaps already in France? He got up. His desk was covered with papers, neatly endorsed by his secretary. He turned out all the lights but his desk lamp. Natalie's gleaming flesh tones died into the shadows, and he stood for a moment looking up at it, a dead thing, remote, flat, without significance. Then he sat down at his desk and took up a bundle of government papers. There was still work. Thank God for work. End of chapter 49「Dangerous Days」by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Audrey was in Paris on the 11th of November. Now and then she got back there, and reveled for a day or two in the mere joy of paved streets and great orderly buildings. She liked the streets and the crowds. She liked watching the American boys swaggering along, smoking innumerable cigarettes, and surveying the city with interested, patronizing eyes. And always, walking briskly along the Rue Royale, or the Avenue de l'Opéra, or in the garden of the Tuileries, where the schoolboys played their odd French games, her eyes were searching the faces of the men she met. Any tall man in civilian clothes set her heart beating faster. She was quite honest with herself. She knew that she was watching for Clay, and she had a magnificent shamelessness in her quest. And now at last the Daily Mail had announced his arrival in France, and at first every ring of her telephone had sent her to it, somewhat breathless, but quite confident. He would, she considered, call up the Red Cross at the Hotel Regina, and they would, by her instructions, give her hotel. Then, on that Monday morning, which was the eleventh, she realized that he would not call her up. She knew it suddenly and absolutely. She sat down, when the knowledge came to her, with a sickening feeling that if he did not come to her now, he never would come. Yet even then she did not doubt that he cared. Cared as desperately as she did. The bond still held. She tried very hard, sitting there by her wood fire, in the orderly uniform, which made her so quaintly young and boyish, to understand the twisted mental processes that kept him away from her, now that he was free. And in the end she came rather close to the truth. His sense of failure, his loss of confidence in himself where his love-life was concerned, the strange twisting and warping that were Natalie's sole legacy from their years together. For months she had been tending broken bodies and broken spirits. But the broken pride of a man was a strange and terrible thing. She did not know where he was stopping, and in the congestion of the Paris hotels it would be practically impossible to trace him. And there, too, her own pride stepped in. He must come to her. He knew she cared. She had been honest with him always, with a sort of terrible honesty. Surveying the past months, she wondered, not for the first time, what had held them apart so long, against the urge that had become the strongest thing in life to them both. The strength in her had come from him, she knew that. But where had Clay got his strength? Men were not like that often. Failing final happiness, they so often took what they could get, like Chris. Perhaps for the first and last time, she saw Clayton Spencer that morning with her mind, as well as with her heart. She saw him big and generous and fine, but she saw him also not quite so big as his love, conventional, bound by tradition and early training, somewhat rigid, Calvinistic, and dominated still by a fierce sex pride. At once the weakness of the middle span and its safety, and, woman-fashion, 
she loved him for both his weakness and his strength. A bigger man might have taken her. A smaller man would have let her go. Clay was just Clay, single-hearted, intelligent but not shrewd, blundering, honest Clay. She was one great ache for the shelter of his arms. She had a small sense of shame that on that day of all others she should be obsessed with her own affairs. This was a great day. That morning, if all went well, the war was to cease. The curtain was to fall on the great melodrama, and those who had watched it and those who had played in it would, with the drop of the curtain, turn away from the illusion that is war to the small and quiet things of home. Home, she repeated. She had no home, but it was a great day nevertheless. Only that morning the white-capped femme de chambre had said with exaltation in her great eyes, So, it is finished, madame, or soon will be, in an hour or two. It will be finished, Suzanne. And madame will go back to the life she lived before. Her eyes had turned to where, on the dressing-table, lay the gold fittings of Audrey's dressing-case. She visualized Audrey back in rich, opulent America, surrounded by the luxury the gold trinkets would indicate. Madame must be lovely in the costume for a ball, she said, and sighed. For her, a farm in Brittany, the endless round of small duties, for the American. Sitting there alone, Audrey felt already the reactions of peace. The war had torn up such roots as it held her. She was terribly aware, too, that she had outgrown her old environment. The old days were gone, the old Audrey was gone, and in her place was a quiet woman whose hands had known service and would never again be content to be idle. Yet she knew that, with the war, the world call would be gone. Not again for her, detached, impersonal service. She was not of the great of the earth. What she wanted, quite simply, was the service of love. To have her own and to care for them. She hoped very earnestly that she would be able to look beyond her own four walls, to see distress and to help it. But she knew, as she knew herself, that the real call to her would always be love. She felt a certain impatience at herself. This was to be the greatest day in the history of the world, and while all the earth waited for the signal guns, she waited for a man who had apparently determined not to take her back into his life. She went out onto her small stone balcony on the Rue d'Onou, which looked out to where, on the Rue de la Paix, the city traffic moved with a sort of sporadic expectancy. Men stopped and consulted their watches. A few stood along the curb and talked in low voices. Groups of men in khaki walked by, or stopped a glance into the shop windows. They, too, were waiting. She could see, far below, her valet de chambre in his green felt apron, and the concierge in his blue frock coat and brass buttons, unbending in the new democracy of hope to talk to a cabman. Suddenly Audrey felt the same exaltation that had been in Suzanne's eyes. Those boys below in uniform, they were not tragic now. They were the hope of the world, not its sacrifice. They were going to live. They were going to live. She went into her bedroom and put on her service hat, and as she opened the door Suzanne was standing outside, one hand upraised. Into the quiet hallway there came the distant sound of the signal guns. C'est l'armistice, cried Suzanne and suddenly broke into wild, hysterical sobbing. All the way downstairs Audrey was praying, not articulately, but in her heart, that this was indeed the end, that the grapes of wrath had all been trampled, that the nations of the world might again look forward instead of back. And, because she was not of the great of the earth, but only a loving woman, that somewhere Clay was hearing the guns, as she was, and would find hope in them, and a future. When a great burden is lifted, the relief is not always felt at once. The galled places still ache. The sense of weight persists. And so with Paris. Not at once did the city rejoice openly. It prayed first, and then it counted the sore spots, and they were many. And it was days, too. There had been no time to discount peace in advance. 
The streets filled at once, but at first it was with a chastened people. Audrey herself felt numb and unreal. She moved mechanically with the shifting crowd, looking overhead as a captured German plane flew by, trying to comprehend the incomprehensible. But by midday the sober note of the crowds had risen to a higher pitch. A file of American doughboys, led by a corporal, with a tin trumpet and officered by a sergeant with an enormous American cigar, goose-stepped down the Avenue de l'Opéra, gaining recruits at every step. Its snake danced madly through the crowd, singing that one lyric standby of young America, Hail, hail, the gang's all here. But the gang was not all there, and they knew it. Some of them lay in the Argonne, or at Chateau Thierry, and for them peace had come too late. But the Americans, like the rest of the world, had put the past behind them. Here was the present, the glorious present, and Paris on a sunny Monday. And after that they would be home. Hail, hail, the gang's all here, what the hell do we care, what the hell do we care? Hail, hail, the gang's all here, what the hell do we care now? Gradually the noise became uproarious. There were no bands in Paris, and any schoolboy with a tin horn or a toy drum could start a procession. Bearded little poilu, arm in arm from curb to curb, marched grinning down the centre of the streets, capturing and kissing pretty midinette or surrounding officers and dancing madly. Audrey saw an Algerian, ragged and dirty from the battlefields, kiss on both cheeks a portly British admiral of the fleet, and was herself kissed by a French sailor with extreme robustness and a slight tinge of vin ordinaire. She went on smiling. If only Clay were seeing all this! He had worked so hard, he had a right to this wonderful hour at least. If he had gone to the front to see Graham, but then it must be rather wonderful at the front too. She tried to visualize it, the guns quiet, and the strained look gone from the faces of the men, with the wonderful feeling that as there was to-day, now there would also be to-morrow. She felt a curious shrinking from the people she knew. For this one day she wanted to be alone. This peace was a thing of the soul, and of the soul alone. She knew what it would be with the people she knew best in Paris. Hastily arranged riotous parties, a great deal of champagne and noise, and overlying the real sentiment, much sentimentality. She realized with a faint smile that the old Audrey would have welcomed that very gaiety. She was even rather resentful with herself for her own aloofness. She quite forgot luncheon, and early afternoon found her on the balcony of the Crillon Hotel, looking at the Place de la Concorde. Paris was truly awake by that time, and going mad. The long quiet fountains were playing, poilu and American soldiers had seized Captain German cannon, and were hauling them wildly about. If in the morning the crowd had been largely khaki, now the French blue predominated. Flags and confetti were everywhere, and every motor, as it pushed slowly through the crowd, carried on roof and running board and engine hood crowds of self-invited passengers. A British band was playing near the fountain. A line of helmets above the mass and wild cheers revealed French cavalry riding through, and, heralded by jeeps and much applause, came a procession of the proletariat, of odds and ends, soldiers and shop-girls, mechanics and street-sweepers, and cabmen and students, carrying an effigy of the Kaiser on a gibbet. As the sun went down, the outlines of the rejoicing city took on the faint mist-blue of a dream city. It softened the outlines of the Eiffel Tower to strange and fairy-like beauty, and it gave to the trees in the Tuileries Gardens the lack of definition of an old engraving. And as if to remind the rejoicing of the price of their happiness, there came limping through the crowd a procession of the mutilés. They stumped along on wooden legs or on crutches, they rode in wheeled chairs, they were led who could not see, and they smiled and cheered. None of them was whole, but every one was a full man for all that. Audrey cried, shamelessly like Suzanne, but quietly. And not for the first time that day she thought of Chris. She had never loved him, but it was pitiful that he could not have lived. He had so loved life. 
he would have so relished all this, the pageantry of it, and the gaiety, and the night's revelry that was to follow. Poor Chris! He had thrown everything away, even life. The world, perhaps, was better that these mutilés below had given what they had. But Chris had gone like a pebble thrown into a lake. He had made his tiny ripple, and had vanished. Then she remembered that she was not quite fair. Perhaps she had never been fair to Chris. He had given all he had. He had not lived well, but he had died well. And there was something to be said for death. For the first time in her healthy life she wondered about death, standing here on the Crillon balcony, with the city gone mad with life below her. Death was quiet. It might be rather wonderful. She thought, if Clay did not want her, that perhaps it would be very comforting just to die and forget about everything. From beneath the balcony there came again lustily the shouts of a dozen doughboys hauling a German gun. Hail, hail, the gang's all here, what the hell do we care, what the hell do we care? Hail, hail, the gang's all here, what the hell do we care now? Then, that night, Clay came. The roistering city outside had made of her little sitting-room a sort of sanctuary into which came only faintly the blasts of horns, hoarse strains of the Marseillaise sung by an unvocal people, the shuffling of myriad feet, the occasional semi-hysterical screams of women. "'Mr. Spencer is calling,' said the concierge over the telephone in his slow English. And suddenly a tight band snapped, which had seemed to bind Audrey's head all day. She was calm, she was herself again. Life was very wonderful, peace was very wonderful. The dear old world, the good old world, the kind, loving, tender old world, which separated people that they might know the joy of coming together again. She wanted to sing, she wanted to hang over her balcony, and teach the unvocal French the Marseillaise yet when she had opened the door she could not even speak. And Clay, too, after one long look at her, only held out his arms. It was rather a long time, indeed, before they found any words at all. Audrey was the first, and what she said astounded her. For she said, "'What a dreadful noise outside!' And Clay responded with equal gravity, "'Yes, isn't it?' Then he took off his overcoat and put it down, and placed his hat on the table, and said very simply, "'I couldn't stay away. I tried to.' "'You hadn't a chance in the world, Clay, when I was willing you to come.' Then there was one of those silences which come when words have shown their absolute absurdity. It seemed a long time before he broke it. "'I'm not young, Audrey, and I have failed once.' It takes two to make a failure, she said dauntlessly. I wouldn't let you fail again, Clay. Not if you love me. If I love you. Then he was somehow in that grotesque position that is only absurd to the onlooker, on his knees beside her. His terrible self-consciousness was gone. He only knew that somehow, some way, he must prove to her his humility, his love, his terrible fear of losing her again his hope that together they might make up for the wasted years of their lives. "'I worship you,' he said. The little room was the sanctuary. The war lay behind them. Wasted and troubled years lay behind them. Youth, first youth, was gone, with its illusions and its dreams. But before them lay the years of fulfilment, years of understanding. Youth demanded everything, and was discontented that it secured less than its demands. Now they ask for three things, work and peace and love, and the greatest of these was love. Something like that, he said to her, when the first inarticulateness had passed, and when, as is the way of a man with the woman who loves him, he tried to lay his soul as well as his heart at her feet, the knowledge that the years brought, that love in youth was a plant of easy growth, springing up in many soils but that the love of the middle span of a man's life, whether that love be the early love purified by fire, or a new love sowed in sacrifice and watered with tears, the love that was to carry a man and a woman through to the end, the last love was God's infinitely precious gift. 
a gift to take the place of the things that had gone with youth, of high adventure and the lilt of the singing heart. The Last Gift End of